Digital Document Exchange. Leading the panel as a chairperson, please join me in welcoming Mr. Gevorg Mantashan, the first Deputy Minister of High Tech Industry of the Republic of Armenia. Let's have a round of applause, everybody. His expertise and leadership in the field makes him a perfect choice to guide our discussion today. Yeah, the, yeah to, exactly, to the left of your name. Assisting us as the moderator is Mr. C.V. Madhukar, CEO of CoDevelop, with his extensive experience in governance and citizen engagement investments. Mr. Madhukar brings a wealth of knowledge to the table. Please welcome him with a round of applause. And joining the two gentlemen on the stage are our panelists, starting with Ms. Alka Misra, Deputy Director General at the National Informatics Center. With over three decades of experience in ICT, Ms. Misra will uh, provide valuable insights into the field. We also have with us Mr. Abhishek Singh as our next panelist, President and CEO of NEGD and Mighty India. His 27 years of experience in governance and policy formulation, along with his specialization in technology for improving governance, make him an invaluable panelist. We also have with us uh, Mr. Anir Choudhury, policy advisor on the uh, A2I program, ICT division, government of Bangladesh. Mr. Choudhury's expertise lies in fostering innovative uh, ecosystems through technology deployment. And our final panelist for uh, this session is Mr. B.G. Mahesh, co-founder and CEO of DG Sahmati Foundation. His extensive experience as an internet applications ideator and implementer adds a unique perspective to the discussion. Let's have a collective round of applause for the entire panel on stage. And over to you, Mr. Madhukar, to start. The mics are kept to your right on the table next to you. It's on. You can start. Right. Thank you, yeah. Chaitanya. Um, very good morning to everybody. Um, this is uh, the first panel uh, of the day, and we hope uh, you know the participants and, and, and presenters here will uh, present us with insights that are interesting um, and uh, thought-provoking. Uh, the uh, the session, as you know, is uh, focused on digital document exchange um, for efficient service delivery. Uh, as we've become more digital um, in India and globally, um, we are constantly exploring, all of us, on how we can share documents um, for transactions to do things uh, with, with the relevant counterparties uh, on a range of things, whether it is... Uh, providing my health records to a hospital, whether it's providing my financial documents to a bank for a loan, um, or uh, between government agencies, uh, what kind of a document exchange uh, can and should take place and what should the checks and balances be? Uh, these are very salient and important questions and the issue of consent um, and, and so on. So I think we have an amazing set of panelists uh, with us um, and uh, we will each uh, have them present a very brief presentation, um, hopefully under 10 minutes each. So we'll have some time for question and answer at the end. Uh, but And therefore, I'll, I'll start with um, Alka here. Alka, would you please? Good morning, all of you and welcome to the global summit of DPI. Uh, you are in one of the IT hubs of the country, Pune. Yeah. I think I'm visible now. Yeah, very good morning all of you and welcome. Uh, as uh, the session today is on digital document exchange, change. Uh, I think the name is very, very well understood. It is that the documents no longer have to be carried as hard copies. It's electronically digitized and it helps you to share with authorized people, whether it is government, industry, or individual in a trusted manner. That's the power. 
Now, if I go to India, we all know that it is a very diverse country with more than 22 major languages. And each one of us are at different levels of maturity. To leapfrog the digital initiatives of the country, of the government, technology has to be leveraged and only then the benefit could be reaped by the citizens. I will take few of the case examples which government of India has implemented, be it Aadhaar. We've all heard about it yesterday, about majority of them. So I won't bore you much with the details, but I'll just tell you the benefit. This is the unique identification of each and every citizen, whether it is the unified payment interface, whether it is the digital locker. In true sense, for enabling digital exchange, keeping your documents in a safe manner with all the encryption, everything in place, and exchanging it in a trusted way with the authorized user. Or if I talk of public financial management systems. The other side, I'll talk a few of the sectors and take some use studies. Now, if it is the transport sector, that is the parivahan that we call in Indian language, so this can be the registry of all your vehicles. If I take the health sector, you all are aware that India has a very nice scheme called Ayushman Bharat Health Account. This is a number which is given. Uh, we are enrolling this, that all the citizens have this unique number through which their personal health uh, documents are exchanged in a trusted manner through a consent. Or if we talk of multimodal national plan for the infrastructure, be it road, railways, airways, or cargo travel. So it is all done through a scheme called Kati Shakti. And encompassing all this is exchange of data through open government data platform. Now, I'll just touch about Aadhaar. I'm sure each one of you know what it is. It is a unique identification, a 12-digit number, which is given to each and every citizen. Now, this was a huge task to enroll the most populated country of the world, India, to enroll each and every citizen having this Aadhaar. The enrollment was one huge process. So there is an Aadhaar vault. You have your Aadhaar number, well encrypted, safely secured for identification. Now just see how technology has been used. It has been leveraged in n number of delivery of services in the most efficient way. If we talk of delivery of financial services, if you talk of opening a bank account, all you need to do is establish your authentication, your identity through this Aadhaar number. And then if it is, yes, you're the person, you can avail those government services. So the services were able to be actually rolled out much faster after this Aadhaar was uh, given to each and every citizen and there was an efficient delivery of services to the last mile, the, uh, the individual citizen. I've given you some of the examples where the number Aadhaar, where Aadhaar has been uniquely used, whether it is for opening a bank account, whether it is your gas subsidy, whether it is your pension, if you work hard and then at the end of your life of working, you get pension from the government, 
all this is transferred because you are authenticated by your Aadhaar number. So exchange of your information because of the individual identity has been established in a much faster way. So if you just see the number, we've got around 1.37 billion Aadhaar numbers which have been captured and see the many fold electronic know your citizen it's about 15.28 billion times much more so if i just take upi i heard yesterday even singapore has got something like this called unified payment interface now this is real quick you don't have to carry any card any wallet anything with you instantaneously 24 cross 7 you can transfer money across to any of your purposes that you want to use it is it for financial services pay your bills you're sitting in the room if you're getting bored early in the morning and you remember that today is the last day to pay your utility bill be it electrical bill your electricity or water a click and you can pay it be it for any e-commerce, Amazon.com, Flipkart, go over and buy your stuff. So these are the numbers. In the month of May alone, we have transacted 9.4 billion uh, rupees in terms of rupees, the transaction in May, and this is the value, which is 14.9 trillion INR. So these are, and all the banks are linked. If you can see, around 447 banks are on this platform. Now, all these use cases that I talk of, primarily the main concept is a robust platform, no duplication of efforts, exchanging of documents for your KYC, and authenticating the user, and the benefits are rolled out. Now, if I just talk of digital locker, this is the digi locker. Now, gone are the days when you would get your certificate, be it your class 10 or class 12 certificates, you would carry it, and then you would go to another college for admission, you would show those certificates, it's just not needed. Or you would carry your driving license, everything can be stored in a digi locker, which is, again, a Government of India's initiative, and your documents are secured and stored, your privacy is maintained, and for any of the services, you can automatically use this through consent-based mechanism using the DigiLocker. If you, will, uh, you would have used uh, DigiYatra, again, your Aadhaar is stored in this DigiLocker, you download the app, Digiatra, and your, you have a hassle-free entry in the airport. So this was possible because of a central digital locker, which the government, uh, I mean, the gov it's a government initiative, and it stands in the court of law, and you can exchange documents very effectively. Now, if I just come to public financial management system, this, again, has been done and once again technology has been used all open source technology robust secure interoperable and all finances are done actually on the fly be it the central government be it the treasuries or the financial institutions everything is done electronically now this was something that Mr. Madhukar also talked about. I won't take much time about it. It is our ABA. Now, what is this? This is a unique identity, again, which is being given to all the citizens of India. And you will have your personal health record on consent shared with a number of hospitals, pharmacies, and all your health record would be there. You can track completely a pregnant lady and the child growth with the vaccination, with everything. So this is the power of delivery of services just because of having interoperable systems uh, in place across sectors. 
The same thing I would talk about is the transport. As I said, it is, you can say it is an aadhaar of vehicles. Now, once you buy a transport, your work is not over. You need to get it insured. You will go on the road. You might meet with uh, some unforeseen thing for which there will be a claim. Then you will need to have a pollution check for your transport. The whole ecosystem has been built up because the registry is there called Vahan registry. And the data is shared uh, seamlessly with authorized user, be it an industry, be it government, uh, be it any financial institutions, or it is an insurance company for n number of applications which are built. See the power. It's just because of a click and because of exchange of data for the last mile delivery of services. Now, coming to open government data initiative, we all know government collects a whole lot of data, and this lies in silos, generally in the websites or in the department. Once you exchange it in an open format for anyone to use, be it a researcher, academician, or government, it is used, and it is the power. My last slide, talking about truly in line with the global DPI. This talks about the national planning for multi-sectoral infrastructure. As I said, this is a scheme of Government of India, Gati Shakti, and this really fastens our development, keeps a tap on how the work is going on. No more sectors, no more regions, no more departments, and it bridges all of them. And improves the efficiency, be it the road, rail, waterways, airways, or energy. You can see the numbers. It speaks for it. Thank you. That's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Alka, for this presentation. Uh, I think it, you laid out the spectrum of uh, you know, initiatives that Government of India has initiated uh, with uh, digital document exchange. Um, we have some... Um, amazing work that's gone on in Bangladesh. Uh, I now request Anir Chaudhary to uh, make his presentation. Do I need the platform? No. Just wondering if I need the platform as well to be visible. Uh, Honorable Minister from Armenia, uh, distinguished panelists, Madhukar, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm actually impressed that uh, the first session and that also on the second day and a parallel meeting going on, that ha the room is full. So I think quite, quite impressed. Can you see me? You can see me, right? So I don't need to be on that platform. Yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to thank Alka for uh, s uh, laying the foundation for this discussion today. Uh, actually... I can't see my slides, that's one important thing. Okay, I'll just move here. Uh, so the story from Bangladesh. Uh, our journey started uh, to build digital Bangladesh about 15 years ago, when our Honorable Prime Minister made this clarion call of building a digital nation uh, in a very impoverished country with not much infrastructure. So not even digital public infrastructure we didn't have. We didn't even have physical public infrastructure at that time, with less than 1% internet penetration at that time. But we made some progress, and I'll talk a little bit about, about that progress as well. But if you look at this uh, diagram, uh, a lot of the initiatives in the middle are really accessed by citizens on the demand side and providers on the supply side. On the demand side, there are actually four different types of channels. And if you look at it, uh, web, we have a national portal that has about 52,000 offices of the government under one umbrella, bangladesh.gov.bd. So there is a lot of document exchange that happens uh, in a very consistent manner. It took us several years to build. But all government is in one umbrella. Uh, the mobile, so we launched uh, a couple of years ago our mobile app called MyGov, about 1,700 services under one app right now. And a number is growing. We have a total number of about 2,500 plus services that we will actually bring into this uh, mobile app. Uh, UDC, it's called Digital Center, Union Digital Center. In the co context of India, it would be uh, uh, a panchayat, actually. 
So at the lowest level of local government, we have access, physical access, where people go and pay a small fee and access digital services if they don't have data connectivity or they don't have skills. And then triple three is a uh, national call center where people can actually call, get information, and also recently they can apply for services as well. On the provider side, we have web and mobile access because uh, providers all have internet connectivity. Now if I talk about document exchange, there are actually two different types of documents. One type is documents that are needed for decision making within the government. Citizens don't see these documents. So we have a uh, filing, e-filing system called Nothi. Uh, that's now in about 13,000 offices of the government. It'll grow to about 19,000 within a few months. That covers pretty much the most important offices of the government. Uh, this Nothi system actually connects with about 34 other data exchange systems in different uh, uh, ministries. For instance, if you look at the budgeting system, the public financial management that Alka talked about, so we have a public financial management system within Ministry of Finance, but the NOTI system connects with that. We have in the cabinet minister report management system connecting to hundreds of departments across the government, thousands of offices in local government. It connects with that. So essentially, it's a, it's a whole of government document management system. And just if you look at it, during, during COVID, when our uh, government offices were closed for months, we actually transacted the business of government using this, this system. So we had about uh, 11 million decisions that actually flew through uh, uh, this, this system. So this is a comprehensive whole of government that, uh, system that we have built. Uh, let me talk about the citizen side of document management or document exchange. So this is one that I mentioned, uh, uh, MyGov, and MyGov has something called the MyLocker, inspired by India's DigiLocker that Alka mentioned. So we actually took a lot of the architectural concepts from DigiLocker, so thanks to the team that built DigiLocker uh, from uh, a nonprofit sector that became part of government. So that's a brilliant work. So uh, Alka talked about health uh, records, so shared health records. We, ha we have piloted that. It's not rolled out to the, to the national level. So the health records are actually stored in, in MyLocker. Uh, education records are stored in MyLocker. And it's part of the MyGov system, but it can also be separated out. So this is a standalone system that can be used by anybody within the government, any, any system builder within the government. So there is the issue of issuer and the requester. And uh, I think at the very beginning, Madhuko talked about the the issue of informed consent. So I store my documents, I store my information, data in my locker, and I authorize who has access to it, which document uh, requester. There is a version of my locker that we are now building for the expatriate population. Bangladesh has about uh, 15 million, 15 million people in different countries uh, that actually provide the 20 billion plus remittance that come to Bangladesh, a very important part of our service delivery ecosystem. But we've often ignored them. I think it's only recently that we've started working, working for our expatriate population. For instance, we set up 22 digital centers in Saudi Arabia, closer to the location of the expatriate population so that they don't have to travel to Riyadh or to Jeddah for the, to come to the missions to get services. So now they can go to the local uh, digital center we call expatriate digital center and get services. So there is a lot of document exchange happening for the expatriate population. And this is what the picture looks like, a my locker, specifically targeted to the expatriate population. Then another uh, constituency, very important constituency is our businesses, uh, especially our small businesses. We call them CMSME, cottage, micro, small and medium enterprises, of which we have about 7.9 million in the country. Again, a neglected population from the digital uh, perspective. So we've started working for them recently, especially when we saw during COVID that they were the ones who did not get access to the subsidies that the government intended for them because they actually were not present in the digital space. So we are building a business digital locker specifically for documents that the businesses will keep. There are at least four types of business IDs, as you'll see, trade license, Company ID, SME ID, and the tax and the VAT ID. Now what we're trying to do is to unify that. Just like 
we have unified our several uh, national IDs. We had birth registration, we had national ID, we had education ID for citizens. We also have similar uh, fragmentation of IDs in our business, and we have now just launched uh, with our Ministry of Commerce the concept of a digital business ID, which is a unified ID for all businesses. Again, it will take us a few years to unify across the local government institutions, of which we have about 5,000 across the country, and they all issue these IDs, but in a very fragmented way, so we are unifying that. So this is a bird's eye view. I know that I'm running out of time, but it'll take maybe a couple more minutes. Uh, bird's eye view of all the different core components. So if, if you look at it from a DPI standpoint, we're trying to build a whole of government architecture for document exchange across the board. So finance, transport, health, education. So very similar to what Alka talked about, but we are connecting them together into one unified architecture. Um, I'll just end with uh, this, uh, maybe a couple of slides actually, the idea of a stack. Again, very much inspired by India Stack. So the three layers that you all have heard of uh, yesterday, uh, the identity layer, payments layer, and the data layer. But on top of those, we feel that a services layer and an access layer are also very important. Services layer because that's where the conversation happens with citizens. Citizens don't understand any of the plumbing, the, the payment, ID and the data layers. They understand service delivery. They understand service in transport sector. They understand service in agriculture. They understand service in education, health, and so on and so forth. So that's where the conversation happens. So I think it's important to talk about the service layer, connect to the plumbing, the three layers beneath that. And then the access layer is really what makes the four types of access that I talked about, the internet, the smartphones, the physical centers where citizens go to get services because they don't have direct access to the digital world. And then the call center, which became a lifeline during COVID. They would actually call and they would get telemedicine service, they would get emergency food support. So all the access layer, I think, is very important uh, as we talk about efficient service delivery. And then this access layer, this, these layers are actually then specific incarnation of that in different domains. So health, education, agriculture, so on and so forth. Uh, I won't go into the layers of data, but this is something that we've talked about, uh, some technical issues, but also in, in terms of policy and legal aspect of informed consent, misinformation, disinformation, all those things will actually be addressed in the, in the, in the data layer, the whole thing. Uh, in the last decade or so that we've been building all these different systems, document exchange, public service delivery efficiency, uh, we have seen by delivering about 6 billion services digitally, we have saved citizens about 19 billion work days, $22 billion, and 13 billion visits have been eliminated. So this is a very important metric called TCV, time, cost, and the number of visits that we measure at the end of every year by department by department. And departments are actually held to account to lower their TCV numbers. My last slide. The six lessons that we have learned, non-technical lessons, uh, nothing to do with DPI, but these are important lessons as we transform an old school bureaucracy, old school government from analog to digital. So the first lesson is the services will have to go to citizens. Citizens should not come to service, uh, services. So that's a role reversal. Second is we have seen the big bang approaches did not work. We did a lot of iterative small experiments and built up larger projects based on the successes and addressing failures. The third is breaking silos. The entire presentation that I talked about right now is about breaking silos within government and with private sector as well, uh, and the NGO sector. During COVID, we saw how health data from the private sector, uh, for-profit and non-profit private sector, actually were very, very critical to track the disease. We even used uh, telco data to track the disease because we did not have enough PCR labs in the country, RT-PCR labs in the country. Uh, end of subsidies, a lot of the models that we have is actually revenue generating for the, uh, the small entrepreneurs who run the last mile and the last person access to these services, just like the, uh, the digital centers that I talked about in, across the entire government, uh, entire, entire uh, country. The concept of governors, we're actually trying to see if the government officers can become entrepreneurial by actually looking at a sense of autonomy that we've been able to give, a sense of new types of pride 
in service delivery excellence by reducing TCV. So this is something that we have been nurturing in the last decade. And the last but not least is really the issue of unleashing data and document exchange. So I think that's another, this, that is the heart of today's discussion, this session's discussion. And that's been at the heart of uh, the lessons that we have learned in the last decade or so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anir. Um, it's, um, it's always inspiring to learn about the lessons and, and the progress that Bangladesh has made um, over these years. Uh, the business digital locker idea is, is something that I think India is beginning to work on as well. And I think recognizing small businesses is an important engine for growth um, is, is so critical for all of our economies. I think the, uh, um, the, uh, the discussion so far, the first two presentations have focused on uh, government ex uh, document exchange within governments, with citizens and government and so on. Uh, we now have uh, Mahesh, who will talk about Sahamati, where the focus is on citizens engaging, using, sharing documents with businesses to get services. And uh, it's a unique experiment in India, which is an important, uh, has important lessons for all of us. Mahesh. Respected, so you can hear me, I hope, respected minister, your distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to present to you the status, you know, of India's financial document exchange so framework, you know, what we call it, uh, what we call it as uh, uh, the account aggregator. Uh, as you see in the title, we say it is open finance, you know, simply because you know, with uh, the account aggregator framework, a yeah, customer or a business is able to share, you know, all kinds of yeah, f uh, of his or her yeah, financial data and not only the banking data. If it was only the banking, uh, banking data, it would have been known as, uh, you know, the open banking. Instead, it is the open finance. So now how about we ha have a, you know, a very quick look at the India's, you know, uh, your financial landscape. Uh, like any other country, you know, we have the four yeah, regulators, you know, for the banking, insurance, uh, you know, SEBI for investment, you know, and the pension fund. You know, as you can actually see that under each of the pillars, you do have the penetration, but at the same time, you have a huge gap. The reason you have the gap is because the institutions uh, have to uh, undergo a huge operational cost to actually serve the customer, especially if it is a small ticket size, uh, your product, you, you know, it won't work out. So uh, how can we actually, you know, solve this gap or so fill this gap, you know, to be precise? So the account aggregator is the foundational, your cross-sectoral, a digital public infrastructure by which you are able to fill this gap. So foundational because it is a you know, framework on which every financial institution is able to build a use case, number one. And from the very first day, the, the, the account aggregator framework has been okay, cross-sectoral. It is not only banking, but for insurance, investment, your pension fund, and your recently, uh, I mean, you'll see in other a week or two, uh, even your GST data or tax information also is shareable, you know, on this framework. Your digital public infra, as you would all agree that it is, you know, very important when we build it, we need to ensure we, we don't leave anybody behind. We need to focus on financial inclusion. No, like only because it is digital, it is not that... Uh, this uh, framework should be used by all those who have the smartphones. I, you know, for us, you know, actually at Samati, uh, the entire team of, of NPCI who, who built the UPI is an inspiration because the entire UPI is uh, there on the feature phone and even uh, those who are not having a phone can use UPI. So uh, I, I hope within a year, account aggregator will also so follow suit. So. Yeah, this is the actual diagram of 
uh, you know, the account aggregator, your data flow, or the okay, document exchange flow. So the ones who can participate in this ecosystem, you know, like if you are a data provider, what we call FIP, or a data user, they all have to be regulated entities. Only the ones who are uh, who are re uh, regulated under any one of the four financial regulators are the ones who can yeah, participate. And the account aggregator is actually a, a consent a manager. Like how in UPI is a, a consent manager for your, your payments, the account aggregator is a consent manager for your data exchange. And uh, in India, as of now, you have, you know, you have 17 account aggregators and all the 17, or each account aggregator rather, is a regulated entity and you know they get their your, uh, your license you know from the reserve bank of india so why exactly is this uh, account aggregator or you know you know framework extremely safe because you know when the data exchange happens from the fip to the fiu you know it is only the fiu which is able to decrypt the data so even the account aggregator which is actually there in between is not able to actually see the data it is only a pipe you know which actually delivers so the the your customers information is extremely safe and the other reason why you know this framework is extremely restrictive in its use is the FIU has to declare well in advance what is the purpose for which it is requesting the data of the customer say for example it's a loan application it has to tell in advance for what period of your time it is uh, it is going to process the data so we uh, we actually call data life after which it is not allowed you know to use the data and all the data which you know flows through this is a yeah, machine readable and it will have a, a digital signature of the fip so so when the fiu uh, receives the data it knows the data has not been tampered with so like all the FIUs or the banks or something, they, you know, they face almost up to 4% of fraud, you know, from the bank statement. And we have already uh, uh, heard, you know, from the banks, uh, okay, that the fraud rate has actually gone down to zero after they've used the account aggregator. Yeah, this is a snapshot of the current ecosystem. So we have about, about 200 and odd, you know, financial entities which have already gone uh, you know, live on the account aggregator ecosystem. And we have 17 uh, account aggregators, but the important one which you have to see there, which is all the way at the top, is the technology service pr your providers who have played a very, very important role in okay, taking this ecosystem live. You know, for example, if you want to implement uh, you know, something like in this in your country, you'll be able to speak uh, with these your yeah, technology is service providers yeah lastly you know yeah this is the snapshot of the current your yeah, performance uh, about oh, 1.13 billion your yeah, bank accounts are already live on the account aggregator new ecosystem about 12 your yeah, million yet yeah, uh, you know your yeah, concerns uh, have been delivered on aa you know already and which is growing every month your yeah, 40 percent you know, you know, for FI23, you can say for last year, uh, the, the amount of loans which were given out, uh, you know, using AA was almost $900 million, uh, you, you know, were, you know, you're given out because it was real time. It was very easy uh, for the bank to receive uh, the thing. And of all the loans given, more than 50% was for small businesses you know, which is extremely important because the gap, you know, of credit for the small businesses in India is extremely, extremely huge. And the account aggregator is not meant only for lending. I think we'll be, uh, like, actually speaking about all the, uh, all the other use cases where the account aggregator can be used. So, the, okay, thank you. Thank you, Mahesh. I think the... The idea that this technology um, can be placed uh, with regulated entities, which 
enable uh, the reduction of transaction costs, uh, both for businesses and individuals and small businesses and banks, lenders, etc., cetera, um, is an important innovation uh, going beyond the, the, the confines of what government does and what government exchanges with itself and so on. So uh, this is a really useful development in India and this is something that um, I think we'll all um, see the journey through over the next two or three years as it, as it uh, matures. Um, I now request uh, Abhishek uh, Singh uh, to come on stage and uh, talk about his experience uh, through NEGD and otherwise on the overall vision of this digital document exchange for India as they've been conceptualizing inside the government. Thank you, Abhishek. Thank you. Thank you, His Excellency, the Honorable Minister from Armenia, Madhukar, my fellow panelists, and distinguished uh, guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, for this uh, event. So as uh, the, the background and the context for this session with regard to how document exchange facilitates governance, enables ease of living, enables ease of governance, ease of doing business, has already been set. And most of the things that I'm planning to say has already been said by Alka and by Anir and uh, by Mahesh. But I'll just give you an overview of how the use case of DigiLocker is helping achieve many of these objectives by enabling seamless information exchange, seamless data exchange, while ensuring that the consent of the user is kept at the core of whatever we are doing. So like, for example, most of us, like uh, very often when I go to conferences, I find that people from India have stopped carrying wallets in their, uh, with them. Why? Because our UPI enables cash transactions. We don't need credit cards. We don't need debit cards. We don't need currency. And the document wallet which has been set up as a DigiLocker enables it all my documents, whether my identity documents, whether my tax documents, whether my uh, uh, health records, academic records, all are available in digital format on my wallet. So what is DigiLocker? DigiLocker is a digital wallet for keeping documents. And as we know, throughout the life cycle of a citizen, right from the birth, he will need a birth certificate till his death when he would need a death certificate. We keep on going to multiple public offices to get multiple documents, whether it's a mark sheet, academic certificate, or the voter card, or a driving license, or a property record, or an income tax record. So we get these documents at various stages of our lives. And what we do, we go to a public office, either queue up or, or apply online, get a document, and then again queue up or go to a portal and upload those documents. So in a way, the various documents which the government authorities are issuing Government authorities are only asking for it. But we as citizens end up being couriers between various systems and keep on taking documents and submitting them, either offline or online. So instead of that, the idea is that can these documents be available in a digital format? And can these public systems talk to each other, exchange documents seamlessly? So that's what DigiLocker does. And it ensures that throughout the life cycle of a citizen, these documents are easily accessible to him and also to any verifier who is doing this. How it works? There are three key entities in this. One is the issuer of the document, like a transport office will issue a driving license, or an income tax office will issue the income tax records, or the election office will issue the voter ID card, or academic institution will issue the academic certificates, or a health facility will issue the health records. So issuer is the one who issues the documents. Citizen is the one who, citizen or now business entities, as Bangladesh has done it, are the ones who own the documents, so he will have access to that. And with his consent, anyone who is wanting to verify the document can also do that. So for example, if I have to apply for college admissions, and the criteria for getting college admissions is my school mark sheets, then the school mark sheets will be accessed by the college system through the uh, API gateway that's provided, and not the citizen requiring to upload these systems So with the consent framework. So that's what it enables, seamless data exchange, seamless document exchange, without requiring multiple hardships or multiple uploads or getting documents attested, notarized, and submitted to a public authority. That's how DigiLocker works. It's enabling paperless governance in India. In the last few years, it has gone very rapidly. Like, uh, we started in 2015, in the last eight years, today we have more than 170 million users. And we are adding almost 300,000 users every day. And there are several government orders which says that any document which is available in DigiLocker, so whether it's for travel purposes or whether it's for uh, academic purposes or whether it's for financial purposes required is considered equivalent to a paper document. So that's the enabling environment that's done. And we have a lot of issuers, more than 5.62 billion documents are available and accessible, accessible through the system. Then uh, what it's also doing is that it's connecting the dots across the ecosystem. As I said, that like 
various public authorities who require these documents are able to access that. So whether it's vaccination records, or whether it's health records, like during COVID, when we issued the health the vaccination certificates to the COVID ecosystem, there are a lot of other stakeholders who were wanting to access this document. So through APIs, DigiLocker allowed these documents to be accessed, verified, and shared. So again, this whole system enables that across the school education system or across the across the health systems all documents can be easily shared and today what is happening is that is that it is also leading to proactive delivery of services for example if anybody is studying in a school or a college and is entitled for a scholarship and there is a system which says that he is he is belonging to a particular community or a caste or a religion or a group which is which is supposed to get a scholarship then the system will ensure that he will get a scholarship without he actually applying for it. So that's what it enables when we allow API-based document sharing, API-based sharing of information amongst various systems, that's it enables. So DigiLocker is connecting all the various disparate government systems into one organic whole. And then the very core point is that the document, the who controls this entire data, citizen is at the core of it. Without his consent, no data is shared. And another more important thing is that in DigiLocker, there is no centralization of any data. Data remains with the issuer. So for, for if a school board is issuing academic certificates, the, the data with regard to the academic certificate remains with the school. If the hospital is issuing electronic health records, which is part of the health locker or DigiLocker, the electronic health records reside in the premises of the data center of the hospital or the entity. The citizen is able to only pull it when he wants to access it by through APIs. And if he wants to share it with a third party with a consent, then this, through these APIs, this information is shared. So it's a seamless document exchange without centralizing any data. So that's the value of it, because of which we are getting more and more users on it. And with the, with the initiatives like account aggregator, it is further facilitating financial inclusion. Because once you're able to verify your financial documents, whether bank statements or tax statements, then with that, you can ac get access to credit, microfinance, that can empower people. So, and so what it is doing, it's enabling digital service transformation. Aadhaar, we know, has uh, enabled faceless transactions. UPI has enabled cashless. And what DigiLocker is doing, that is enabling paperless kind of uh, governance in the entire ecosystem. So that's the value, and that's the important value thing that comes in digital service translation. It's a presenceless, cashless, faceless, paperless governance that we are moving towards. And uh, this, this is a schema of the entire thing, like we have the the data publishers and the data consumers and through the api layer through the consent layer which we call it api setu it's equivalent to the x roads initiative of estonia what it does is that it ensures that the citizens have access it ensures a verifier has access authentication is based through apis consent is a very important uh, issue here so whether it's the identity or kyc or academic documents or health documents or financial documents this entire information from the data publishers goes to data consumers through this api layer with the consent framework built in and citizens have the access to digi locker data and verifiers also have so this is the entire ecosystem which is ensuring uh, service transformation as we see it so that's all i wanted to share today and we're happy to take any questions thank you so much um, for a very crisp intervention uh, it's exciting to see all of the progress that we're all making in these different uh, areas. Um, I want to ask one question to all of the panelists and then open it up for um, questions from the floor. My question is the same for all panelists. Um, it seems like we, we all, when we look at hear all this, we won the gold medal already. I wanted you to maybe spend a couple of minutes uh, describing the journey, the struggle that went into getting the 100 meter race gold, right? Um, there's been, this is not an easy journey, and each of us have gone through this in our own ways. Um, and and th these, these um, war stories can be long and painful uh, and lessons, lots of, with lots of lessons, but if you can maybe take two or three minutes to talk about the struggles and lessons, you, you, you ended the, your presentation with lessons, Anir, but maybe talk about some of the struggles you had to go through because that it bring, makes all this a lot more real. Um, I'll start with you and then just go all the way to Mahesh. Um, Mr. Mantishan, if you at some point, before we open up for the floor, if you wanted to make a comment, I'd love to invite you, if it's okay with you. 
soon after these questions. Uh, okay, all right, please go ahead. Thank you, Matikor. Uh, very, very important question. I mean, as we look at architectures, look at uh, all the different integration, talk about DPIs, I think the human element of a, of a complex government uh, bureaucracy, uh, sometimes mired in uh, colonial past, I think really haunted us to this. And I think Abhishek will also talk about that from Indian standpoint. Uh, <clears throat> there is no gold medal. However, I, I want to point that out <laughs> because it's a, it's a, it's a uh, it's a it's not a destination. It's really a journey because we want to continuously improve, want to continuously simplify, and digitization is just a tool to simplify and improve the lives of citizens. Uh, so, I mean, maybe I'll talk about two or three important things. When we started out, the first bottleneck was that the relationship between government and citizens. For decades, maybe centuries, citizens have been seen to come to government offices. Government is at the center of service delivery. Why won't citizens come there? So the question of faceless, cashless, paperless was really not intuitive. Citizens will come and will provide services. So that, that, that mindset we had to actually transcend or overcome. I think that was the first big challenge. And uh, we uh, went through this uh, phase for about six years. We introduced something called empathy training. We trained about 35,000 uh, uh, government officers on empathy training. And they became champions. In the empathy training, what we did was we actually took curriculum from Stanford Design School, from UK, this uh, innovation organization called Nesta. And we saw that looking at the problem from citizens' perspective, reducing the government officers to the level of citizens by actually sending a doctor to a land office and a land officer to a school and a teacher to a hospital actually really worked miracles because there they are reduced to the level of citizens without any administrative privileges. And we said that don't call your friends. You just go get services as if a normal citizen would. And that actually worked like magic. There were so many emotional moments. They broke down in tears when they came back and said that this is what my citizens go through. And this is peer-to-peer -peer criticism in a session, peer-to-peer -peer critique, and that really worked well because it's not criticism from the citizens, it's criticism from a peer, which was taken a lot more openly and with a lot more acceptance. Uh, second was this issue of turf control. Right? I don't want to give control of my data. My data means it's agriculture data. It's not farmer's data. It's the data of the agriculture ministry. That's how it's seen. So why would I give it to farmers? Because my data. Why would I give it to health? Why would I give it to finance? So these turf controls are also were difficult. But again, through a lot of collaboration, a lot of uh, we have an open data platform that really helped. Uh, sometimes, without really fully understanding, this data transfer already happens because we've set up all these bridges, all these API connections. Uh, I think that's, that's also, it's, it's a work in progress, work in progress. Third issue is the issue of informed consent. That's still a very complicated issue. So what is informed consent? When we actually s accept all the defaults in a browser, are we informed about the consent that we're providing as we're installing a new browser as a, as a sort of a digitally literate person? Uh, that's a debatable thing. And would apply that to the concept of a, very uh, ordinary citizen who may not have digital skills, and we're expecting digital informed consent for payments, for uh, a lot of certificates, for a lot of documents, and what does that mean? And when we are mired with disinformation and misinformation around all this, what does it all that mean? When we're mired with cybersecurity issues, what does all that mean? So that's something that we're still grappling with. Thank you. That's great. Uh, Abhishek? Yeah, I endorse and agree to what Anir has said. So I would not repeat what he's already mentioned. But I would say that uh, two biggest uh, impediments or two biggest obstacles that we see whenever we talk of good governance is that uh, the tendency of most government departments and most government officials to, to keep control of information that they have or data that we have and not share uh, with the people with who to, for whom it matters, and number two, to exercise discretion. So whenever we take an initiative like this, when we say that 
all document data relating to a citizen is accessible to him or through an app or through a device and with his consent shareable. So we are eliminating this whole control part and we are eliminating the discretion that we exist and that's very, very important for good governance. So obviously there will be resistance uh, in the initial phase. So in almost every project we have faced that initial resistance but over a, what, with the larger objective of good governance, with the training, with the capacity building, with change management for changing attitudes of people, we have been able to transcend that uh, that uh, challenge. And if you look at even the journey of, say, for example, DigiLocker, like we launched in 2015, and in the first five years, we reached uh, uh, around 30 million users. But in the next three years, in the last three years, we moved from 30 million users to 170 million users, a five-fold growth. So once people start seeing value in something, once departments know that it reduces their hardship, it improves their image, it improves their reputation among citizens, and it ensures good governance, there is a greater demand for that. And that's how we have seen. Today I have got more and more departments asking for it, more and more states asking for it, that we want to get onboarded onto the DigiLocker ecosystem because they know that they can also do API-based verification of services. Like for example, issuing passports. Earlier, people used to require to submit their date of birth certificate and uh, address proof certificate in an electronic format, even for the online system. But with the DigiLocker integration, if a citizen who is applying for a passport gives a consent to pull that date of birth data or from the address data into the passport application, then that verification becomes seamless. So, so, they, so the passport system also has become more efficient and they take pride in that they are able to issue passports in a faster, uh, faster uh, in a lesser time. So that improves their performance. So once people start seeing value in this kind of system, adoption becomes easier. So we need to always think of, ki, what is it in for me? And once we are able to do that, it helps, so whether it's citizens or the government departments. And that's how we have been able to transcend this journey. And of course, the administrative will and the issuing of notifications, as I mentioned, almost every government department, whether it's railways allowing a digital document to be verified, to be regarded as an identity document, or transport department issuing an order that a driving license on the DigiLocker is as good as the, uh, as the PVC car driving license, or SEBI and RBI saying that these are regarded equivalent to KYC documents, Ministry of Health saying that electronic health records is possible and these can be stored on a digital document. So these enabling notifications of government departments also ensure easier and faster adoption. So that has been the kind of main learnings in the last few years as we have gone ahead in the, in the journey of ensuring seamless document data exchange between various government departments. Thank you. Alka? I would also not repeat what Abhishek has said what Abhishek has said, uh, really there is, there has been a lot of challenges and the main challenge I would say is in advocacy. Till we do not educate and change the mindset of the citizens and make them aware that it is really for their benefit, it was a big hurdle. And uh, with the trust from the government, as he said, with notification backed up, it was definitely easier. So, and the numbers, India is a big country, so the numbers really matter. Yeah. Mahesh? So, so it's uh, uh, hard to uh, share all of our challenges in two minutes, but uh, you know, I will try to share. But uh, I will start off actually with the lessons, you know, what Sahamati has actually learned. You know, you need to have a you know, lot of patience, you know, when it, uh, it comes to implementing actually, actually a DPI in a country and uh, and uh, if you see our framework the account aggregator uh, framework it, it is a cross sectoral which means you need to interact with entities under all the four regulators which is almost uh, like uh, about uh, like about 10000 entities okay and you have the four regulators and the government ministries S you know samati is about 4 years old and it's only after uh, like uh, about three years of operation, like you are seeing that, uh, like it, it has been good results. Now, and for the first year, two years, it was almost uh, only me actually in the company. Okay, but it was it was not me alone who did all the work. We had almost uh, you know almost uh, so 32 and odd uh, volunteers, you know who were um, who were working for Sarmati. So what I want to tell 
is that when you are working on it, actually on a DPI, you mm -hmm. will be able to find a lot of volunteers, okay, to help you in the mission. And, uh, and when you are the implementing something like this, you know, we got lucky because, you know, all the public sector banks and all the large private banks, you know, uh, you know the, they came on board. So once the large entities actually come on board, it becomes actually, f you know, more easy to, for you to go and convince the balance of 7,000 and odd entities. Yes. Um, thank you, Mahesh. Um, Anir, do you wanted to have a quick intervention and then I'll go to Dr. Mantasha. Sure. I mean, just listening to uh, Abhishek just reminded me the one of the things that transformed mindset, rewired thinking was COVID. Because during COVID, uh, officers did not want the citizens to come to the offices. The doctors did not want the patients to come to the hospitals. So it actually helped rewiring that, that mindset. Just wanted to mention that. Sometimes those unfortunate things create a fortunate uh, serendipitous uh, uh, outcome as well. Just wanted I to agree 100%. In fact, COVID has been the single biggest digital transformation enablers. Even though it was a big challenge, but when you look at digital adoption, every sector we have seen huge digital adoption, whether it was government departments using platforms like e-office, or whether it's a video conference meetings, travel was totally eliminated, but the world didn't stop. So COVID has been a big digital enabler. Our um, justice sector, if I just take 10, 10 more seconds, sorry. Our justice sector resisted, Supreme Court and the court system resisted digitization for many years, even when we went for the prime minister's office, it was completely resisted. COVID made it happen in 12 days. They said that, okay, you have this noti thing, the e-filing, our overcrowding in prison is uh, uh, going up because we can't do bail hearing. So give us a virtual bail hearing system. And that created the appetite for a $250 million e-courts project now so that we will uh, digitize in the next few years all 2,000 courts in the country. So, it, it, I mean, it, sometimes you can't predict these things. Now, this is very useful. Um, I, before I come to you, sir, uh, Dr. Mantashan, did you want to maybe make some comments and then we can... Hey, can you hear me? Hey, can you hear me? Hopefully. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. I was in an interesting and in a, in a honorable position to be privileged to listen. I think generally the, uh, the governments uh, nowadays need to listen more to make the decisions more carefully and with a huge responsibility. This is what we call part of the responsible leadership. Uh, I'm very pleased that anything which, uh, which was mentioned uh, with a 98%, I definitely also agree. The experience was very similar as well. And fascinating to see the solutions which uh, what, 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 what's implemented in India. Uh, we discussed the uh, what, we discussed how, uh, and we discussed less why we are doing this. And. Um, I'm echoing what was also said that um, sometimes the tragic situations and the critical situations are creating the opportunity as well. And uh, the COVID pandemic was the one of them of accelerating the change which we were expecting to have. But uh, I want to add a few, 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 few things, then I want to open up for the opportunity for the questions. Um, the most important here, the digitalization is going on. And we know the why in a lot of institutions, around the world, by the way, they don't want to give the access to the data because you're losing your influence. Partially, you're losing your power, which means you need to share the, some part of monopoly of owning the specific data, which is becoming quite accessible to others as well. Elephant is in the room. Let's talk about that why it is that much people are afraid because later it's easy to track, easy to see what was going on. So we are looking and personally in my working, I'm looking to this as a balancing of the general public administration, which is direct, has a linkage to the future of the governance. This is a direct linkage to the democracy. And uh, Without the giving the compliments, we see the, how the democracy perfectly working in India with the biggest population, and there is no complaint about the elections. So this is a 
example of how you, put, you use the digitalization to strengthen the state. So this is the important, not only philosophical part, this is a direct implementation and the impact of the technology on our social life, on building the social fabrics. But what's coming next? I try to answer why. <laughs> this was the why. But what's coming next? The next will be more uh, unclear. And that's why the dialogue is important to identify where we are going, with whom we are going, and based on which values and which ethical standards. And it's clear that um, in the next decade, Decade. I learned this word yesterday. Um, the, the the cloud computing will have their own role. This will accelerate later on the on the quantum computing. The the process is to be more fast, and will be questioned. We're talking right now about the digital documents. Later, will be questioned: Do we need the document at all? If we already identify, so why these documents is generally needed if you have the all set there? Why I need to share any document? What services are there? So everything will be transformed. I was listening about um, uh, digital, dig digitalized services in Bangladesh. And we have a similar situation as well. Uh, numbers are quite close, by the way. It's very interesting. In a lot of words, our services are, doesn't matter the size of the country, but the services are very similar. Um, but the, we are rethinking of the methodology of identifying which is a public service at all. If we, are, if we create the what is a service, then we can talk that we need to have it in a digit. Or it can be already merged and become the, just an operation. It's not just a part of the, uh, the, the, the bigger picture. I will try to be short by this sentence. Thank you. Uh, I know uh, if you had more time, we could have discussed uh, and learned a lot more about what you're doing in your country. Uh, we have just a few minutes left uh, for questions. So you, want, you wanted to start. Um, can somebody hand a mic here, please? Thank you. Yes, uh, good day. This is our Minister Melford Nicholas from Antigua and Barbuda. Uh, I wanted to pose a question to the uh, gentleman from Bangladesh in respect of your own experience. Uh, where you're looking at uh, your own uh, data and document sharing environment. Is there an overall uh, governing regulatory authority that uh, pulls all of this together, inclusive of the private sector? And what about the underpinning legislative framework? Would you care to comment on that? Um, could we take maybe one or two more questions and then address these questions together? Anyone else has a question? Yeah, yes, sir. Abhishek, I have a small question to you. Uh, most of the services are delivered by the state government. And uh, you will agree that these certificates have to be digested electronically by the consumers, by the person who is requesting. And therefore, the XMLs will have to be, the formats will have to be standardized. An income certificate in one state is different. So what have you done on that? Uh, just giving a physical certificate has no meaning. Because again, although it's electronically going, it will be physically checked. So I would like to know about it. One last question uh, before we get responses here. Anyone else? All right. Maybe you start on it and then Abhishek. Thank you, Honorable Minister, for that important question. Uh, legislation comes in various forms. So we have an ICT Act, which gives us the uh, the e-signature, so digital signature. So a lot of the documents that we talked about, document exchange, it's actually digitally signed. Uh, we also have the Right to Information Act, which uh, mandates the government to publish information in a proactive manner. And that's where the national portal that we have, which has uh, uh, about 50 million pieces of uh, information there, publicly produced. We also have the, uh, the open government data. Uh, platform that also publishes a lot of lot of information. So that was not a legislation, but a policy that we developed. Uh, also, the Privacy Act, in terms of what data will be published, uh, by whom, who owns the data, informed consent. So the Privacy Act that we are actually working on that right now, and that should be coming out uh, sometime this year. So these are the some of the data protection and uh, publishing that we are actually uh, that 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 is covered by legislation. Thank you. 
Yeah, so very pertinent question, sir. And that's at the core of ensuring that uh, seamless exchange of data and information happens in various systems. So to answer the specific question, whenever it comes to like a, like a document which is issued by the central government, like whether it's for the Aadhaar or whether it's for the income tax record or whether it's for uh, you know, academic certificates issued by boards, the formats, the data standards, metadata standards are clearly defined. When it comes to documents which are under the purview of the state governments, for example, whether the birth certificates or whether the state university mark sheets or any other document, there we do need to come up with a common framework or common minimum standards. So what we have been doing for academic certificate, National Academic Depository, we face the same solution, same challenge, because universities wanted to retain the format of their certificates. So what we have done with UGC and AICT and Ministry of Department of Higher Education is to define the minimum number of fields that has to be a part of the digital document. So that for those data fields in an XML format can be pulled out for any for any useful purpose. So that's the minimum level of uh, data standards for every document has to be defined. Similarly, for any service which is in the domain of the state governments, we need to work with the state governments to come them to, to ensure that they come together to agree to that minimum level of data format, and then, then it will be possible. So while the technology for ensuring availability and accessibility of documents and data in a DigiLocker, that's the easier part of it. The real bigger challenge is to, of course, getting various uh, states and various entities onboarded and getting them to agree to the common formats and, and then sharing information. That's the hard work that is that I must say are some has been done in some 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 documents like driving licenses and others, but a lot can be done, especially when it comes to documents which are issued by the state governments. And the same thing will be required, like whenever any country adopts this framework, there also you'll have to customize it. Okay? Like it's not that one size will fit all. Every country will have their own local laws, local regulations, requirements, their own uh, central and the federal, uh, federal and the uh, and the state governments. So there also this commonality will have to be done. So that's uh, but the technology and the architecture is such that it can be it can be adapted to meet every such requirement. Now, with um, as with all good discussions, uh, stimulating, we are out of time. Um, so I'm going to uh, maybe just mention a couple of things before I hand it over to Chaitanya here. Uh, the first is, I, I, uh, you know, in all of the document sharing work that has been done and is being done, verifiable credentials are an extremely important component. Um, how do I know this is an authentic document issued by the agency that this person is claiming it is from? And those verifiable credentials are an increasingly important part of what needs to happen in this ecosystem. The second bit, I think that uh, you know we've all touched upon somewhat briefly, is this idea of privacy and consent, and how do we manage that on an ongoing basis in a meaningful way that it doesn't become a burden on the citizen to be able to actually do all of this, and and how do we do this even more seamlessly than we have figured out so far, and and the third, and, and you know, the, the, you know the the something that's almost obvious here, there's a technology element and there is a legal element that need to progress together. Uh, you know, if technology progresses and legal doesn't progress, and legal environment doesn't uh, progress and technology doesn't progress, we don't make, we can't make the progress we're all trying to make. So this uh, combination of technology plus legal approaches are necessary for all of us to make progress in this. There's a lot of wisdom in this room. Um, thank you very much for uh, joining us, and a big round of applause to the, to the panelists here. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much. I have one question, if you don't mind. So. Mr. Abhishek Singh, especially. I have been a user of DigiLocker, and DigiYatra has made life so much easier. And Pune Airport is one of the eight airports, I think, in India that uh, allows DigiYatra. So how has that integration happened, or how have we integrated DigiLocker and DigiYatra? It's a, the demo is also being shown outside in the exhibition. It's a very simple thing, like Aadhaar. Your Aadhaar has got your photographs, and your boarding pass has got your name. Yeah. So the name is picked up from the boarding pass when you scan, when you add your boarding pass.
Panelists, starting with the chairperson, Mr. Moses Kunkuyu Kalongashawa, Minister of Information from Malawi, requested to please come up and chair this session. A round of applause, everybody, for our chair. Our moderator for this session is Mr. Vijay Kumar Manjunath, Senior Vice President of eMudra and a member of the Asia, Asia PKI Consortium. We are honored to have with us Mr. Arvind Kumar, Chief Controller of Accounts from the Government of India, joining us as a speaker, bringing his expertise in licensing and regulation of certifying authorities. We'd also like to welcome Dr. Satoru Tezuka, Chair, Digital Trust Working Group Japan. He is a professor in uh, Kyo University, Japan, and drives the Digital Trust Working Group of Japan along with the Digital Ministry of Government of Japan. Uh, Mr. Nick Pope, Vice Chair, ETSI Technical Committee, ESI Europe, uh, the prominent body in setting standards for digital signatures and use of trust services. He will be joining us uh, virtually through video. And we also have the privilege of welcoming Ms. Anne Waveru, Director of ICT at Kentrade, Kenya. She brings with her a wealth of experience as a transformational business technology leader. Let's have a collective round of applause for the entire panel on stage in front of you. And over to you, Mr. Manjunath, for moderating the session. 
ಎಲ್ರಿಗೂ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಗುಡ್ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಸೊ ಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟೇಷನ್ ಪ್ಲೀಸ್ ಸೊ ಎ ಕ್ವಿಕ್ ಇಂಟ್ರೊಡಕ್ಷನ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಐ ಬಿನ್ ಟಾಕಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಪೀಪಲ್ ಸಿನ್ಸ್ ಎಸ್ಟರ್ಡೇ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಐ ಫೌಂಡ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ಮೆನಿ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಡು ನಾಟ್ ನೋ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಪಿ ಕೆ ಐ ಪಬ್ಲಿಕ್ ಕಿ ಇನ್ಫ್ರಾಸ್ಟ್ರಕ್ಚರ್ ಸೊ ದಟ್ಸ್ ದ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಕ್ವಶನ್ ಐ ಗೆಟ್ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಪಿ ಕೆ ಐ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಟಾಕಿಂಗ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಡಿ ಪಿ ಐ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದೇರ್ ಇಸ್ ಎ ಯು ಪಿ ಐ ಇನ್ ದ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ರೌಂಡ್ ಸೊ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಪಿ ಕೆ ಐ so uh, before i moderate this session i want to take uh, a few minutes to introduce this whole topic what are we talking about in this session but this is a very important session when we see from dpi angle so i will take the opportunity to introduce this topic before i go on to panelists so i also represent from asia pk consortium chaired by india e mudra uh, mr shrinivasan uh, he chairs this uh, consortium we are a group of about 11 countries now and uh, these countries work together to uh, make a pk adoption successful in the region so you can see in the uh, uh, image india digitized lot of things setting up example to the globe on that is what it depicts there do you have a change okay a quick intro so what is this session all about so we have uh, we'll have some understanding on the role of pki what it is and also we'll examine indian dpi initiatives and pk integration we'll also explore pk in other countries and digital initiatives so we have the co-panelists from uh, several countries so they'll be talking about it and also emphasizing the importance of global mutual recognition which is a topic uh, uh, mr arvind kumar will also inter- introduce much in detail and uh, there is also a launch what uh, an initiative taken by office of cca so that launch program also be will be held at the end of this panel okay so answer to the question pki very simple it's public key infrastructure but today if you see public key infrastructure has become an integral part of digital transformation and in india it has played a massive role we'll get into that in detail in next slide but if you see the world in way back in 2004 global reports said that pk will pk will die but it didn't happen so pk has evolved over time because that time user experience was a challenge but eventually i think hardware and the systems upgraded and things also became simple and it has evolved over time and today with any new development happening pk has become a de facto standard in it so we'll get into detail of it but the main advantage what india has also seen is pki is a cryptographic identity provider so in a technical world cryptography plays a very important role of binding the data so pki relies on providing secure mechanism to build trust using cryptography pki provides identity backing to create digital trust in a digital transaction so you need a digital trust in a presenceless and paperless world it provides the essential remote secure trust because it's a remote world so there should be a trust what should happen which we'll also go in detail with some examples so that the transaction can be conducted remotely with strong technology layer allowing to execute it instantaneously so it has to happen instantaneously what are the purposes of pki for identification authenticity non repudiation or the integrity of data and also used in encryption technologies india has been pioneer because there is also one more reason there is a legal validity to pki in the country the legal framework for example in india it is indian information technology act this provides necessary legal backing for pki back cryptographic operation and hence can be used for almost all purposes where identity authenticity authenticity and non repudiation is required so it's a binding what people do when they digitally sign a transaction so we'll go through a little more details what are the fundamental layers i think we heard it several times fundamental layers of digital transformation what india has enjoyed is presenceless paperless and cashless these are the three fundamental layers the role of pki comes in paperless layer where digital signatures and e sign are playing a crucial role so in india today 1.35 billion population who have aadhar are enabled with e signing ability so they can just use the aadhar along with the authentication and perform electronic signature this is a very seamless user experience there are more than 450 million e signatures what are made in the country so and there is more unique user rate so definitely these are in hundreds of millions the user base is also quite huge this is more than the populations of the uh, countries 
who may be here. Thousands of governance and business applications rely on digital signature as well as e-sign. We'll go through uh, this particular diagram, thanks to India Stack. So the growth has been enormous. India ha has been setting up example to the world, what we saw over yesterday's panel as well as the previous panel. So India, what has happened is we have technology which is tried and tested to the scale, right? Today, any country can rely on this technology because it is tested to the scale, what India can do. So if you see a lot of initiatives mm -hmm. under uh, DPI, so there is identity layer, Aadhaar, EKYC, and eSign. Then there is payments layer, data layer. And nowadays, the new thing happening is the app, apps rails. So the credit network and health stack is coming there. Then for uh, the e-commerce, there is ONDC coming up. Then uh, education, architecture. So these are happening. So what is the role of PKI? So on the right-hand side, if you see, there are several use cases happening. I, I will take very basic use cases so that we can understand it easily. I will not get into much detail. So firstly, if we see Aadhaar, it's digital identity of India. But Aadhaar is also unique because it's a cardless identity. This is the unique example for every word. That's why the, the, the cost of Aadhaar is very low. The implementation cost is very low. Now when we say it is cardless, what is it then? Then, then what is the authenticity of Aadhaar? So today as a user, how I can get Aadhaar? Primarily it is digital Aadhaar what I can get. I can go to Aadhaar website and download the Aadhaar card in PDF format. This PDF format is digitally signed by UIDI. So the PK is playing a very crucial role here telling that this particular document is signed by UIDI so that you can be sure that UID is the real entity which has signed that Aadhaar card. It's not a fraudulent Aadhaar card. This is just a very simple example I am talking about because it's just like a PDF, digitally signed PDF. But this digital signature goes back to uh, yesterday what uh, Dr. R. S. Sharma mentioned about like the principles, right? So there are principles behind developing this PK and over the last two decades, India has developed this public key infrastructure uh, uh, with framing several laws, several technologies behind that, several operators. They, uh, I think uh, Mr. Arvind Kumar will cover up on the operators as well. But that is how the industry has developed. And today, any organization or an individual in India can be identified by PKI. And they can digitally sign the document. So is our Aadhaar cards are digitally signed by UIDAI. Nobody will deny if it is signed by UIDAI. Then there was a case of e-sign. India in 2015, we launched eSign, which is an electronic signature system, on the fly electronic signature. And this is again massive in scale, and that's where we got large population using eSign. Thanks to the initiatives of uh, India Stack, uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Pramod Orma, Sanjay Jain. I think we worked all together to make it happen. A unique concept that nobody in the world had uh, thought about this. Short lived key pairs and then doing the signature based on other identity is a massive program. And today, that's where we were able to scale this PK to millions of people. Then, documents via DigiLocker. I think in the previous uh, presentation, uh, uh, Abhishek sir has already shown about DigiLocker. But today, documents from DigiLocker are digitally signed. So, when people get, so even you take your driving license from uh, uh, DigiLocker, you get it digitally signed from Transport Authority so that it is a reliable one. Similarly, there is ENACH payments. It's for auto debits. You can give the uh, transaction, PAN, EPF, social welfare applications. These are digitized. So a lot of use cases, this is for public. But PK is playing a very important role behind the scene. So PK is used for entity to entity transaction. Today, Aadhaar ecosystem is not just the PDF Aadhaar cards. It is more than that. Today, if I sign, go for a banking onboarding, I do EKYC. Bank will ask. Aadhaar department whether this identity is valid. And there's a digitally signed transaction happening between the bank and the UIDI. So this is where there is a authenticity and non-repudiation to the data what is flowing between these entity, where bank will digitally sign that XML. It goes to UIDA, UIDA verifies, digitally signs it, and gives back that particular attestation back to the bank. So there is a digital signature happening behind the scene, which will build the layer of trust to enter transaction so that it can be immediately settled. Then UPI transaction. UPI is a very beautiful ex example because UPI, you would have seen, I think most of the Indians who are here would have already used UPI. You may see it happening in like one or two seconds, right? 
But behind the scene, there is a lot of intelligence built by NPCI and all the teams around that, kudos to them, so no doubt about that. But there is also a PKI layer which makes it to happen instantaneously. How? Because this UPI transaction has about five entities involved. You do with an app, example, for example, I'll quote PhonePay, which is a third party app, what is called in ecosystem. And then there is a remitters PSP, then there is a beneficiary PSP, the payment service providers, which is the UPI handle. And then there are two banks, which is remitters bank and the beneficiary bank. Five entities are involved for a settlement which happens within one second. And this is all with power of PKI. So what PKI does is every hop will digitally sign the transaction so that the other entity can believe that transaction. So when we are talking to the countries of this UPI example, this is one challenge what we see in other countries. So I personally interact with a lot of governments in several parts of the world the challenge what they do not have is the trust framework or the trust layer in their ecosystem. Today, if one bank signs the data, why should other banks believe? What is the authenticity of the digital signature? And that is the framework what India has already built, and that is available as form of national PK framework. Then there is DigiLocker. Again, DigiLocker is not just the documents you download. In the previous panel, we saw that there is a diagram. There are a lot of entities involved. So all those users PK, account aggregator we saw. So that is also using PK for consents, health records, e-invoicing, so a lot of things happening. So what is PK doing? He is forming a secure layer of trust. So it forms a secure layer of trust. Can you please remove that times up thing? Sorry. So secure layer of trust happening because India has made it a seamless experience. Earlier times, you should have hardware tokens, you should have some big, big hardware, the drivers, et cetera, to make this happen, but today it has become a very seamless exercise. So if somebody wants a demo, I can show it later, but we just enter like other number, then maybe a fingerprint, iris, or even OTP or face authentication, we use and we are able to perform e-sign. PK has been playing the invisible role in most of the backend process of digitization program. So we do not see, what I quoted, like say UPI, we do not see really the PK being involved, but it is happening, it is doing the big job. If you see on the right hand side, the yellow highlighted one, banking transaction account to more than 100 million transactions per day which are digitally signed. And these are like the uh, numbers last year, but this year I heard it has doubled. It has already reached about 200 million transactions per day. The large scale financial inclusion program is seamless with fully digitalized onboarding because it is powered by e-sign again. Else always we, should, we would have gone back to the people for digital signature for the paper. Instantaneous digital payments were possible with every layer I mentioned about this. All the layers are doing this. Other authentication, KYC process scaled to 100 million transactions per day. Again, the highlighted numbers, more than 100 million transactions per day with PK enabled signatures and encryption. So today, any digital initiative happening in India is putting PK as a de facto trust layer in it. So this is not the identity. This is the security and trust layer for any digital initiative. So before I head to the panel, very important topic is globalization via mutual recognition. And this is where I think uh, Mr. Arvind Kumar will also run through and there is a uh, launch after this panel. So we were very happy to hear the G20 presidency team of Vasudeva Kutumbakam or one world, one family. It is necessary that we make this digital transaction borderless, right? As we saw paperless, presenceless, cashless, we have to move borderless. That's when Assume a UPI transaction should be accepted by other countries, there should be the security layer, the trust layer established between the countries. And that's where this mutual recognition will come into picture. We'll take three examples. The first example, what uh, Mr. Abhishek Singh mentioned in the previous slide, how in India, driving licenses were made to accept in digital form, right? PVC cards were there. But today, can these driver's license or maybe educational documents, can these be produced in other countries as it is in digital form? We have very good, fantastic DigiLocker ecosystem, but we cannot use it in other countries because they don't trust our PKI. That's where the mutual recognition will come into play, and that's where Mr. Arvind Kumar is driving a lot of initiatives to make it globally recognizable. So today, if education documents has to be produced in another country, they will send to the embassy asking it to apostolize, right? So you should get it registered, apostolized, and then only it's accepted. It's not just believed because it is in DigiLocker. So we have to create a framework where this PKI layer is trusted by other countries. And that's where 
mutual recognition proposal is a very interesting proposal. Similarly, there is a business example where businesses has to trust each other because the legal obligation, the jurisdictions are different, so that's where mutual recognition will play a role. Similarly, trade is a very interesting example with the, which our Kenyan uh, panelist will talk about. The transaction made via digital public infrastructure should be recognizable by another country. This will create a foundational layer for easier recognition of payments, identity, educational docs, or any other docs ac across the border. So the idea is going paperless. Hence, it is important to move towards mutual recognition of digital signature and PKI with other countries. So we as Asia PK Consortium will be happy to engage with uh, this particular initiative. We are very happy India is leading this kind of initiative and we'll like to be part of it. With that, I would summarize with digital identity, which empowers the digitization in ecosystem. Digital public infrastructure is built for open access. This is very important for inclusive growth. Paperless revolution is taking place in a very large scale, and PK-based trust layer is helping build a trusted digital ecosystem. This is a very, very important thing. With that, I will again reintroduce our panelists. We have Mr. Arvind Kumar, who is the PK regulator of the country, controller of certifying authorities with us. We also have Professor Satoru Tezuka, who is chair of Digital Trust Working Group, closely working with Digital Ministry of Japan. We also have Nick Pope, who is uh, remotely there, and we have a pre-recorded uh, uh, video from him. We have Miss Anne from Kenya, who is also a specialist in uh, uh, international trade. So we have a variety of speakers. So we have the regulator, we have on mutual recognition experts from Japan, we have international trade experts, and we are happy to have the chair, His Excellency Minister from Malawi, to be with us, and uh, we look forward to hear from him later during the panel. So with that, I invite uh, Dr. Tezuka to take over from here and go ahead with your talk. Thank you. Uh, okay. uh, thank you very much. Uh, for inviting me to this wonderful uh, G uh, Global GPI Summit. And I'm Sato Tezuka from Ken University in Japan. Uh, today, uh, I would like to report the demonstration which was held at the G7 Digital Ministerial Meeting held in Japan. Uh, it was conducted by joint team uh, of the EU Commission and Japan to demonstrate the importance of international mutual recognition. Repeatedly, international mutual recognition is the most important word, as uh, Vijay-san said to us. And the demonstration was held at the G7 digital ministerial meeting on April 28, 29, and 30. Uh, first, uh, I would like to explain about the declaration of Japanese DFFT, Data Free Flow with Trust. Uh, as many of you may know, Japan's late former Prime Minister, Abe, announced Japan's idea of DFFT for the first time in the world at the 2019 World Economic Forum in Davos. Uh, this photo shows the late Prime Minister Abe at the time. The main idea in his speech was to start a forum for discussion focused on data governance under the roof of the World Trade Organization. And second is establish a system to implement the FFT which will be the most important issue for the new economy uh, driving the fourth industrial revolution and society 5.0, the Japanese idea. The third, the create a forum for discussion among the US, Europe, Japan, India, and the African countries, and all over the world that are making great uh, developments and share their successes along with the efforts of other countries. 
Uh, these were the idea of announced to promote uh, BFFT. Uh, I believe that achieving the T in DFFT, which stands for trust, repeated trust, it's the most important. Second words, uh, the most important uh, strategy for our country. It is a belief that in Society 5.0 and digital transformation, which is called short DX, a good, up-to-date, accurate, and abundant real data will be the most important source of value. And the distribution of these data with trust on a global scale is essential for achieving a digital trade. For data to be distributed with trust, a trust service infrastructure such as electronic authentication and electronic signature is necessary to prevent tampering of data and spoofing of senders and receivers. I believe that the trust service infrastructure based on international mutual recognition is exactly what need to realize digital trade on a global scale. Uh, this page shows activities that we have been done to conduct a demonstration made in Japan and the EU Commission for the G7 Digital Minister meeting. At the end of November last year, I visited the EU Commission to discuss about the demonstration of international mutual recognition uh, of achieving BFFT as a G7 uh, Digital Minister meeting. I asked them if they would be willing to cooperate with Japan, and they have fully agreed. Since then, we have held weekly online meeting and created a scoping document of demonstration. Okay. Uh, this page is image of demonstration based on the scoping document. The activity is to establish international mutual recognition on a global scale and to understand international mutual recognition. It is very important to know what trust application services using the trust service infrastructure will be used. So we decided to showcase application related uh, carbon neutral CO2 emissions management, uh, which is the most widely discussed area of GX, uh, which stands for green transformation, and which we believe many people will focus on. Uh, when the data of this CO2 emission is distributed on global scale and as a global supply chain, it is important for a trust perspective to show how to prevent tampering of data and spoofing of senders and receivers. Uh, that is uh, what the realization of the T in DFFT is about. This becomes possible on only when electric signature and electric authentication are used. Now, I will show you the actual demonstration which was presented at the G7 demo, uh, Digital Minister meeting, just short version. How do you Value. I cannot 
narration. That includes narration. a very important video because uh, it shows how the trust services infrastructure, which is the public infrastructure, playing a foundational role mm -hmm. in this particular program of uh, mutual recognition. Do we have does challenges? Does not work? Does work? Uh, please repeat again. Okay. Oh, could you work on page? Oh, no. And I cannot. No. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. Good. It is necessary to first establish bilateral linkage among countries and eventually expand it to multilateral linkage. We believe that this international collaboration of trust service infrastructure is the most important thing to realize DFFT. DFFT can also contribute to solving environmental problems. For example, CFD calculation for carbon neutrality. Product manufacturers will be able to verify that CO2 emissions they have received from component suppliers in other countries are not tainted or spoofed. In addition, the reliability of the data can be mechanically verified, enabling efficient CFP calculation even for products with a large number of parts. Okay, so uh, this was how the demonstration went. The demonstration had a great effect in establishing a new international framework for the achieving DFFT at G7. Uh, it, it was established at the G7 Digital Administration Meeting and this organization is called Institutional Agreement for Partnership. IAP for short. Uh, it is not too much to say that uh, without conducting our demonstration, the establishment of IAP may not have happened. IAP is organized by G7 countries, but its discussion 
is open to other countries, G20 countries, and more bigger, the worldwide levels, to discuss that IAP uh, style. To achieve BFFT, the government, private sector, and academia will work together and discuss these items on going basis. Uh, we are examining possible study items and the subject of international mutual recognition is raised as one of the C to be studied. Now, India, as a host country of G20, has requested G20 members to discuss international mutual recognition as a theme for a G20 digital race meeting. Uh, India has requested Japan to join this discussion. And Japan, as a host country of G7, will cooperate with India with establishing international mutual recognition as a major strategy of G7 and G20, and make efforts to achieve the global expansion as fast as possible. I believe it was quite epoch-making that we have conducted demonstration in joint uh, project with the EU Commission, and sincerely hope it will be jump-start for the global expansion of international mutual recognition. IAP is fully committed to this object and we would very much appreciate your cooperation and support. And the current situation is India, EU Commission, and Japan is the three uh, countries and the regions uh, to have that the next step discussion. And uh, we want to have that uh, next uh, demonstration for this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tezuka. That was a wonderful demo of how mutual recognition can work technically. We would be eager to look forward. Thank you. Uh, next panelist, we have uh, Mr. Nick Pope, uh, who is not able to be here physically, but uh, he has uh, shared a pre-recorded video. Can we have the video, please? Good day, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to join you at this uh, workshop looking at PKI and DPI. And uh, I want to present to you the work we've done in SE uh, on standards in support of both European and international use of uh, trust services supporting data infrastructures. We are international in organizations. We've got 900 members worldwide covering 60 countries and five continents and have partnership relationships with a number of PKI uh, schemes across the world. And at a recent interoperability event, we uh, had over 100 organizations demonstrating interoperability between their solutions both inside and outside Europe. So the aim of, of VIDAS uh, st standards uh, is to support the VIDAS regulation as well as support inter international working, supporting a range of trust services, including supporting public key infrastructures, signing services, registered e-delivery, archival, website authentication, and most recently, attribute attestations for um, digital identities. And all this underpins a range of digital in, in initiatives supporting different inter infrastructures between governments and industry. And just one example is the EU wallets, which we are playing a, an important part in supporting the trust infrastructure. We have a range of standards agreed. Uh, if you want to get a copy of these, they're available through our search machine at uh, 
the website I'll give at the end of this presentation. So PKI provides an important core element managing the keys for a range of services. In some services, electronic signatures and website authentication, we support the keys used by the end users. In other cases, we support the authority issuing keys and authenticating identities and providing time stamping and providing services such as registered electronic delivery and signed archival. When looking at uh, the use of our PKI related services across the world, we went to visit a number of countries in Asia, uh, North and South America and uh, the Arab African region. And we identified as a result four important areas for trust. First of all, looking at equivalent legal basis for the trust between the different countries so that there's the same basis, legal, whether it's regulatory or contractual, and the, the same services and expect, legal expectations are covered. And then there is a need for a, an authority which oversees the operation of the uh, trust service and ensures that the uh, of service operates in line with requirements and you, based on a, an audit. All these trust services need to ensure they conform to best practice and ensure that there's a common level of trust and support interoperability. And then finally, having made a trust decision, a supervisory body must produce signed representation of that trust and there needs to be cross recognition between the trust schemes between two different countries to ensure there is a trust representation. And if you want to get more details of this study, this is available either by clicking on the slides, which I'll make available, and also the uh, a search machine, which I'll identify at the end of this presentation. So there is ongoing at the moment a European pilot project to ensure mutual recognition for electronic signatures and ensuring compatibility of all the areas that I mentioned just now through a uh, mutual recognition agreement. And if a country is recognized as meeting the uh, equivalent requirements of European requirements, then they are put in a list of um, third country lists, which then point to the national representation. So when a EU country wants to access a trust service in a third country or make use of information coming from a trust service in a third country, then they can look at the secondary uh, third country list of lists, which then point to the national representation. And further details, again, are available by clicking on this link in the slides, which will be distributed later. An important aspect of this interoperation is to have common standards, both covering the best practices and also providing the interoperability so there's assurance of the same trust level and interoperability between countries. As an example of how this is being applied internationally with the web browsers, we have established agreements to adopt common standards for audit in the standard 319403 and also best practices. And these best practices are aligned with the CA browser forum policies, uh, which ensure that they fit the requirements of the web browsers. And then there are two trust lists. There is a trust list in the browser root store, which establishes that it meets the browser requirements. 
And then there's a European trust list that means it meets the European requirements. And through links from the browser root store into the EU trusted list, they can show that it meets not only the EU, the browser requirements, but also the EU. And there is again the document describing how this is planned to operate, which you can download from our website. I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Uh, information on mm, the available standards are available through these links. You can also download copies of these standards. And if you want to register, you can maintain an update through our email list. And any questions, please feel free to contact me. Thank you very much for your attention and have a good meeting. Thank you, Nick. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation from Europe. Uh, I'm sure you're watching live on YouTube. Uh, thanks for this uh, uh, pre-recorded video. Next speaker, we have uh, Ms. Anne from Kenya. Uh, may I please welcome you to uh, present. Good morning. You can use that as it is, so it's on. It's on. It's on. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Um, yep. My name is Anne Wawero. I'm the Director, IT Infrastructure, Innovations, and Information Security in an organization in Kenya called the Kenya Trade Network Agency. Um, in short, we call it Kentrade. Um, it is my first time to be in India here. And I must say this is a, a great learning path for me, um, understanding the technologies that are around in India, what is powering the governments and what the government is doing across in India. I think it's one of the most exciting thing for me from Kenya and I believe for all the other Kenyans who've come a very good time for Kenya when we are um, in the first lane of the digitizing the government services. And um, I believe we'll come out of here with great lessons. Why is this thing so quickly operating? The green one. The green one. So let me, t I'm, I'm here to talk briefly about Kentred in regards to our mandate and in regard to what we have been able to do so far and as one of the DPA in Kenya, the digital inf uh, public infrastructure in Kenya. Uh, Kentred was, is a state corporation that was established in 2011 um, through a legal notice and has since been uh, given uh, its authority fully by the National Electronic Single Window Act of 2022. Uh, Kentred was established with two main objectives um, to facilitate international trade in Kenya and to implement, uh, to establish, implement, and manage the electronic single window system. The, the agency is under the National Treasury, or what is uh, in other countries called the fin Ministry of Finance. For a little background, um, what was happening in Kenya in regards to trade uh, before the establishment of uh, the single window system, uh, to Kenya is heavily uh, an agricultural economy, like probably you will know. A lot of our exports are around agricultural products. So, and then we import a lot of goods for our manufacturing and other uses into Kenya. So. For you to have done a transaction for either export or import, you needed or you still need a permit, you need a license, you need a lot of approvals for those documents. And those documents do not just come from one uh, government agency. So before one had to visit two or more government agencies with a set of papers, and you would go, probably you would be told so and so is not in, the next thing you'll be told is, uh, even if he's in, uh, every stage before you reach the final guy or the final approver or whoever will issue the permit, 
you had to pass through so many people with paperwork or with just being allowed to see the next person. So we had lengthy and very costly processes. Uh, if you imagine the size of Kenya, it's not as big as India, but we consider it to be big. You are coming from the western side of Kenya to get a license to import um, sugar or to import maize, which you have to come in Nairobi. And it requires you to come with money for accommodation, money to deal with a certain chain of people so that you could get through to that. So the process was quite lengthy and uh, very expensive. Uh, we had poor controls and uh, the regulatory agency's requirements were easily circumvented because these people you had to meet, some of them did not bother trying to meet the regulations or as they are depicted in the constitution. We had lack of transparency. No, no agency knew what the other agency was doing. Documents were provided to you. You didn't know exactly whether they are legit or not legit. And the other thing is that there were so many uncoordinated interventions from different people, even security guards could act as uh, key men to, to deal with the, the same documents. So as a result, we had inefficient cargo processing. Uh, processing of documentation was very inefficient. There were delays at the port of entry. And most of the time, for people to go through those processes, some of them ended up even getting their cargo not going to the destinations uh, in time or even get, getting damaged. So um, the other people did not even have any systems. So that's why Kentrade was um, established to try and uh, digitize trade processes in Kenya and ensure that we are providing, um, we are able to provide the faceless and the cashless and paperless operating system for the trade in Kenya. The whole objective of that system that we now call the trade net system or the single window, it is improving the surface delivery uh, to the exporters and importers and reducing the cargo processing time. The other objective is facilitating electronic transaction of all, of all stakeholders uh, for import and exports and reducing the paperwork, like we have said, making it paperless, adopting modern and open transaction processing system that is capable of interfacing with internal and external systems. So, a lot of what we do uh, regarding trade facilitation is guided by UN CEFACT, uh, that is the United Nations Center for Trade Facilitation and Electronic Business. We also are guided by the World Trade Organizations, the standards they'll come in with, the agreements. And one of the things they agree is how countries will operate in terms of trade. So, in coming up with our single window system, of course, we were guided by that and the whatever else came from the legal notice that we had to put in place. And what we have in place now since um, 2012 is a system where, which sits between the traders, the clearing and forwarding agents, and on the other side we have the partner government agencies. Example of them being the Kenya Revenue Government, uh, the Kenya Revenue Authority. Uh, we have the Kenya Ports Authority, we have the uh, Kenya Plants uh, uh, CAFIS, the Tea Directorate, and the Port Health, among others. We also have the banks and the insurance companies and many others which are seated on the other side. And then in, in between, we have what we are calling the electronic single window system that now allows all parties to interact and get the necessary documentation approvals if you are supposed to start with, say, the carefies to get your farm uh, certified for production, say, for, for growing of um, avocados before you get the permit to export, then all that interaction is done from within the single window system. So it became the single entry point for all government documents that are required for export and import. And all the approvals, rejections are all done from within the same system. In summary, uh, within that system today, we have more than 17,000 users. Um, we have over 40 partner government agencies that are able to use the system. 
Some of those government, a majority of those government systems actually just rely on this system. Uh, they do not have their own system. So the transactions which are required are end to end from the single window system. We have over five complete uh, partner government integrations in place. And uh, we are also integrating other, other functions from especially uh, within the KERA with this digitization which is currently on the first lane. Everybody is supposed to ensure the processes they are doing are paperless. So again, we are looking to see is there anything that has been left outside the system that needs to come on board so that uh, things become completely paperless. And we are also dealing with the National Treasury uh, for donor funding projects, exemptions. Uh, those integrations are already taking place within the single window system. We have processed over 1 million permits in the year 2011. And in the year 2022, we did offer 1.5 million permits. And on average, we do about 700 uh, transactions annually. Behind the single window system, we have other technologies like the business intelligence, which again, we have given the various uh, government agencies uh, a dashboard where they can track what they have been doing they can be able to tell um, the permits they have authorized within either a day, a week, a year. And we have provided a dashboard where even the, all the stakeholders, including the government, when need be, they can tell what kind of commodities are we, say, exporting to Europe, what type of commodities are we exporting to various destinations, and what, uh, so, so that they're able to make better decisions about the economy of Kenya. Um, alongside that, we have also integrated a trade finance uh, module that allows traders to be able to, to, to get uh, credit facilities using the documents that are coming from the single window system. So that is a single window system from Kenya. So um, the discussion of the public key infrastructure is very critical in Kenya, given the kind of uh, documentations that are coming from uh, the single window system. And uh, the interactions we are having even with other governments and um, the, where our export is going and where our import is coming from, and even in establishing trade within Africa. So it's a, it's a critical time to discuss the public key infrastructure for not just for, for, for Kentred, but also for the entire government of Kenya. And for this reason, there have been discussions in place uh, where our communication authority, we have an organization called the Communication Authority of Kenya, has been identified as the Root Certification Authority to guide, also to guide the process of how we'll undertake the whole of this um, public infrastructure. And for Kentred, we think it's very critical. Sorry, I had forgotten that one slide where we needed uh, to say- Can we make it a little quick because we are running short of time. Okay, so. we needed to indicate that from the time we implemented the system, the Kenya, Windows, Kenya single window system, there has been a lot of improvement in document processing uh, that are related to trade. We have moved from 14% in the year 2014 to about 95% automation of all documentation. And hence, when we talk about PKI, we are not just talking about Kentrade in itself or the single window system, we are talking about incorporating everybody, the 40 PGAs, the banks, the insurance companies, and even the third parties who are involved in different uh, side of the game plan, if we have exporters and uh, the provision of services from other countries. So that is why the public key infrastructure is a big discussion in Kenya. And it is at its uh, formation stage, and that's why we have uh, the, root, the root certification authority in place. And we have identified about four certification authority, Emutra being one of them. And then we are supposed to be discussing as a country on an ongoing basis the best way to take up this and move forward with it. So um, I think in regards to our presentation as a country, uh, that is where we have reached with the PKI. And as a country, it is an ongoing process we have to deliberate and agree, but so far, Kentred, KRA, the key government, partner government agencies in the trade perspective have been identified as key players in that ground. 
So thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. San. Thank you for that wonderful coverage. Now we move on to Mr. Arvind Kumar, CCA India, to give a presentation. Good afternoon, Namaskar, distinguished chairman, minister from country of Mawabi, distinguished panelist, security mighty, distinguished guest available here, friends and colleagues. We have seen through the presentations in the morning that in the increasing use of digital technologies is definitely leading us to have digital trust built into that. But while we look at the e-commerce growth in the last few years, we find that we should definitely have a trusted framework which can work in taking the e-commerce or the digital trade and business across boundaries. If you look at the kind of implementation of PKI, which has been done in various countries, as we see through the presentations here, which was given by the Asia PKI Forum, Japan, Kenya, and the kind of frameworks which are available, providing the common, frame, uh, common standards which can be used by European Union, like ETSI or any other equivalent, they provide a very strong base for taking the PKI implementation forward. We have seen through the presentation also that DPI implementation in India, the population scale implementations, there is a background foundation of PKI, which is creating, which is giving the trust to all these major PKI, DPI implementation. If you want to take the DPI across the globe, taking to the different countries, then we are supposed to have a common framework for PKI implementation across the, all the countries. So uh, we have already looked at the kind of preparedness that the other countries are having. Uh, as controller of certifying authorities in India, I would like to present you about the present status of the India system of providing digital trust. If you see that we have a very strong backbone of trust which has been provided in India and we have IT Act which is enabling the trust, digital trust which can be provided through the controller of certifying authorities under the Ministry of Electronics and IT which is the national regulatory body for PKI. If you look at the numbers, the trust services which PKI is provided, we are operated by more than 20 plus trust service providers under the national PKI framework. And if you look at the e-sign transactions which are is happening today, it's more than 10 million active long-lived certificates which are enabling billions of transactions on everyday basis. The e-sign, which is a short-lived certificate, around 400 million e-signs has already been taken where we implemented in various digital India program. So we can say we have in India a valid digital signature which is admissible under the court of law by the Indian IT Act 2000. In India we conform to the international best practice of public key infrastructure and we are at par for reliance with the other major countries for exchange of information. If you look at the adoption of PKI in India, we can look at that India has a vast implementation of e-signatures and digital public infrastructure is highly relying on the e-signature infrastructure provided by the controller of certifying authorities under the, under the act. There is a remote trust being provided which is, which is the basis for organization to trust a digital transaction with, without any human interventions. The transactions between the entities which are digitally signed and making such transaction without the moderation at the back end 
without any manual process at the back end being implemented through use of digital signatures. If you look at the tax filing, the e-procurement, the banking operations, you find the e-signature is implemented seamlessly. Therefore, the new age use case of UPI, Aadhaar authentication, and other public digital infrastructure initiatives, they perform transactions within seconds due to the remote trust being enabled and by the digital signature at each stage of transactions. The uniform recognition of acceptance of digital signature, e-signature, under the national PKI framework, which is regulated under the IT Act, this has been achieved by way of self setting up the uniform regulations and standards and policies. We have created a number of regulations and policies under the PKI framework, which gets implemented and regulated by the Office of CCA. You look at this, this kind of PKI-based digital certificate that they're being widely adopted by not only government, but also in the business across the various sectors. The legal admissibility of the legal signature make it more reliable for public and private applications and voluntary adoption of PKI and use it for e-authentication and e-signature requirements. Under the IT Act, we have a regulations. We have a regulation which provides us for having the foreign CAs operating under Indian PKI system. And we also have a system of public foreign certifying authority which are not operating under the PKI regulatory bodies. If you look at the CAs which are operating under the regulatory body, the government of India is works under the, we have a central regulator called CCA and there are certifying authorities working under them and they are providing sig digital signatures to the subscriber at the end for use in DPI or any other applications. So such countries where they have a system of regulation, the hierarchical systems, we can always do a kind of MOU which is enabled under the regulations and we can have exchange of digital signatures under that. And the countries where they don't have a central regulator, we have system of acceptance of certifying authorities operating under those countries to come and get themselves registered and regulated under the CCA system of regulation as we do our practices in India. So we have seen through the whole process that there's a, there's a dire need for mutual recognition the moment we want to take various digital public infrastructure across boundaries. So we have seen that there's a need for a mutual recognition which should be done with various member countries, interested countries, which can take part in this. So we have one mutual recognition agreement framework which we, have, we are working out with the G20 countries and the other, other interested countries. And we also have a interaction with the G7 countries in the past, recent past. So India is proposing to create a framework which is reciprocal in nature and we will give a way for mutual recognition of e-signed documents signed under the national PKI system. This gives the uses of personal documents like IDs, licenses, driver license, educational certificates, financial documents outside the home country and they are electronically signed by the issuer organization. So any hassle of verification of the documents in the other, mem other participating country of getting verified through embassies or other things can always be avoided if we have a kind of mutual recognition, mutual acceptance, which is for a help to the general citizen. Mutual signature of the business contracts, that can also be found acceptable if we have a mutual cooperation between the countries through a framework and it's all major problem of doing business and it is the ease of business in doing from the outside countries. In import and export, a lot of documentation is supposed to be exchanged and in case we have the such kind of mutual corporations, mutual agreements, then this can always be avoided, have the whole document getting checked again by sending back to the embassies or elsewhere. So we in India, we are proposing a mutual recognition framework for the participation of different member countries in G20 and other countries. And we want to promote the trust and security, which is reducing completely the cost and increasing interoperability. So if we look at the kind of framework which we are trying to propose to the countries, which will definitely help in increasing the trade, increasing the business, increasing the exchange of documentation, enhancing that overall transactions, and at the end, giving 
boost to the digital economy. So a draft agreement we have already worked out and shared with the panelists here and the Asia PK forum members who have already gone through the documentation. And we will propose that this documentation can be seen and accepted by all other member countries if we can have a similar framework in place. The framework implementation would definitely require the common standards, regulations, and practices which are internationally acceptable. So if you look at that, the, this document will have the country shall publish their root trust anchor or trusted CA trust list. That is one of the requirement for signing the agreement. The country shall ensure that they have an active and compliant national PKI framework reciprocal to the India. The country shall demonstrate their compliance via globally accepted practices like ETSI, the European practices or the web trust practices which are uh, given by Canada and US, technical and operational framework for recognition shall be established by their countries. So we look at the minimum principle on which we can have, we can initiate a kind of framework and that agreement can be worked out based on that. So if you look at in, in brief, this cross border recognition of digital transaction will make the way in globalization of the digital public infrastructure. With proven model of secure remote trust, public key infrastructure plays a crucial role to move towards the global mutual recognition. We appreciate the idea of Japan of DFFT, which is demonstrated in the presentation. We will be happy to work with the countries who progress towards the proposed mutual recognition framework. We also invite countries to take part in the initiative so that we can work towards a safe and secure information exchange and build a secure digital world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, sir. It was a wonderful presentation covering how India has done and the need for the mutual recognition framework. Uh, for want of time, maybe we will skip Q&A for now, and maybe we have a couple of uh, other things to happen now. So uh, before we move to closing remarks of this panel, may I request His Excellency, Minister from Malawi, to give uh, the views from chair. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, the beauty of uh, chairing a panel is that you have the opportunity to take notes, so you learn a lot, but the ugly side of it is that you don't get to share the full length of your own story, because uh, we do have our own story as Malawi, and by extension as Africa, which... Uh, in the interest of time, we may not have the full opportunity to do that. The session has ably covered the role of uh, PKI in DPI, and uh, it has been uh, very informative and educative. Uh, the role of PKI in digital initiatives are enormous, and we cannot overemphasize on the same. The invisible role of um, digital signatures through the National PKIs is quite huge. Uh, we talk of ensuring integrity and uh, authenticity and then repudiation of uh, e-documents and e-transactions. Quite uh, impressive, I must say. And uh, I'm excited at the mention of uh, the thought of going borderless. Um, we, we have been engulfed or rather fragmented by these borders, these physical borders, which sometimes become mental borders as well. And it is my hope that, uh, and I believe the hope of many, that digitalization will help us to break uh, those borders. The launch of um, PKI Mutual Recognition Initiative by India is fantastic, and I must congratulate you for that. Congratulations. Thank you. And also the strides that are being made by other countries. Japan is making its own strides, and uh, my sister from Kenya did talk of some success stories as well, which are worth uh, commending. And it is um, also very interesting to see how India has also provided the e-sign facility to hundreds of millions of people. Uh, I believe... Uh, this should not be a difficult task to, uh, to uh, uh, replicate in other countries uh, like uh, Malawi and other countries that are still in the 
least developed uh, countries. The layer of security and trust is very important for any nation's digital ambitions. There is a high rise of uh, cyber security issues and this affects the uptake levels for digitalization, especially in countries where there are lower literacy levels, but also in cases where most of the people are in the remote areas. And it, in the case of Malawi, for example, we have a unique case where our 80% of the population is rural-based and the uptake of technology is quite low. And it is these people that are in the rural areas that are falling victims to cyber uh, crime issues. So this layer of security would really enhance the uptake of technology for people like those in these unre unreachable areas. What India has done, uh, uh, achieving a large scale success in all these uh, areas is something that we would want really to emulate in uh, many countries. In uh, closing, since I didn't have time to share our own story, although we're making strides also in Malawi, we have implemented the, digital, the national uh, ID system. We are making strides in the digital payment system. Uh, the data sharing issues remain a very big challenge. But allow me to say I am excited at the theme or the taglines of this uh, summit, which are one earth, one family, and uh, one future. The discussion here did not very much touch on the challenges that would affect us from becoming one family and attaining one future. Uh, the role of PKI in digital initiatives, they have an underlying challenge. And uh, if we do not share those challenges, then we may not all move into one family and one future. The assumption here is that we are all well connected. We all have connectivity. We all have access because there is uh, a, a platform where all these uh, digitalization elements will have to lie on. If we do not have stable connectivity, affordable connectivity, then all these initiatives will not have a takeoff uh, uh, part. So while we are discussing all these at such a global fora, I would uh, request that we must, at all times, talk of the challenges that other countries are being choked with. Mainly countries in Africa, when you talk of uh, uh, digital payment systems, all the people from India, they are Indians everywhere, many of them in Malawi, others born in Malawi and doing business between India and Malawi. They are people from all parts of the world. You come to Malawi, you come to Kenya, you come to Uganda to do business, you'll be affected by the poor digital payment system in those countries. So whether you are at a bigger speed here, getting to Malawi, you'll still be negatively affected because we are still rushing from one office to the other with those physical documents. We cannot afford a future that we are talking of one future, a future where when catastrophes hit, like COVID, a child in Mumbai, a child in, in Delhi will be able to go to school online and a child in Malawi will not be able to go to school online. That's not being one family, that's not one future. We can't afford a future where you will be able to process orders for my tobacco in my country and I cannot be able to accept the, I mean, to receive the payment from you because my payment systems are still archaic. So I would request that we move towards that one family, to move, to move towards that one future while addressing the challenges that other members of that would be one family are facing today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Very insightful views and uh, definitely we look forward for that. Uh, our Honorable PM has already mentioned about the inclusive growth, what we are looking into and that's where the motto of G20 forum in India is happening. Yesterday, even our Honorable Secretary, when he mentioned, he spoke about this, how uh, we have to work together with the countries and that's the same view. Uh, uh, and uh, yes, uh, Mr. Arvind Kumar, uh, uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much. and. Uh, 
uh, we move on to the closing presentation with uh, uh, a launch of mutual recognition uh, framework and initiative what uh, 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 Mr. Arvind Kumar mentioned about. Uh, can we get the closing presentation, please? Yeah. It would take another few minutes uh, to conclude this. Uh, Mr. Arvind Kumar, you want to do this? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, after going through the whole panel discussions and participation with the various forums and countries, in particular uh, the panelists over here, uh, we, uh, we, we have realized the need for a common framework or a common kind of agreement which needs to be worked out. So we really thankful to the chairman of the panel, Honorable Minister from Ministry of Information, Malawi, thanks to the speakers from Japan, Kenya. Uh, we have we had a presentation from um, uh, ETSI, the Europe Asia PK Forum, uh, Vijay, and uh, it was really uh, very enriching and uh, we're giving a lot of uh, thought-provoking ideas on how to take further move further in this direction. Asia Pekia Forum has members from different countries and economies, which includes Bangladesh, India, Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, Saudi Arabia, Thailand, Iran, and Malaysia. We also had a consultation with them regarding uh, the kind of uh, framework which uh, we would like to propose. Uh, this platform also has a participation of dignitaries from G20 countries as well as other invited countries, including Malawi, Armenia, Sierra Leone, Suriname, Antigua, Barbua, Kenya, and among many countries. The platform also has a participation of delegates from international and regional organizations, including UNDP, Digital Public Good Charter, World Bank, UNESCO, among many other. So this has been, we have found this is an exceptional platform graced by the presence of esteemed dignitaries from across the globe. This has enriched our discussion, elevated the significance of our deliberations on the important topic of building trust secure trust along the globe using PKI. The invaluable insights and contribution have undoubtedly enhanced the quality and impact of the session. We would like to declare a PKI mutual recognition framework. Deliberation of the subject shows that there is a need for this. In this August forum, we, would, we are glad to witness that a small agreement has been arrived on the necessity to have a common framework the framework is to establish mutual recognition for public key infrastructure and digital signatures with the aim of enhancing cooperation, facing trade, promoting trust and among the nations, and for implementation and adoption of DPI across border, along with seamless integration with national system of participating countries enabled by PKI and based on a common framework. Recognizing the importance of harmonizing standards and conformity ass assessment procedures we have come together to foster a more efficient and seamless system of recognition of PKI. India hereby takes the lead in this subject and publishes a draft framework, a draft framework which is a proposed PKI regulate, regu uh, recognition framework. We are giving a detailed background note and draft agreement of PKI amongst the participating country. India also invites the other members of G20 and other participating countries to come around the world and have a discussion and will let us work out a global framework acceptable to all that will make this DPI which can move across the border which has a global, global acceptance, the global scale of DPI implementation is possible with such kind of framework in place and implemented effectively. For future meeting and discussion, we will take this discussion forward with the same draft, and for any, inf any information, we can be contacted on the email ID of Com Controller of Certifying Authority Office, as given here. Thank you very much. I would like to request this uh, framework document can be yeah. shared with the panelists. May I please panelists. request uh, panelists to please join for uh, release of this uh, uh, framework. So this is a draft framework. Please, sir. Yeah. Uh, please join. May I request all the panelists to please come forward.
and hold the framework in your hands. Let's have a photo op. Thank you. And before we end, uh, may I request our moderator, Mr. Vijay Kumar Manjunath, to please present a token of our appreciation to our chairperson for this session, Mr. Moses Kunkoyu Kalongashawa, Minister of Information from Malawi. Thank you very much for chairing this session. May I also request Mr. Vijay Kumar Manjunath to present a token of our appreciation to Mr. Arvind Kumar, Chief Controller of Accounts from the Government of India. <laughs> to Professor Dr. Satoru Tezuka, Chair of the Digital Trust Working Group, Japan. And to Ms. Anne Waweru, Director of ICT at Kentrade, Kenya. And may I request Mr. Arvind Kumar to please present a token of our appreciation to our moderator, Mr. Vijay Kumar Manjunath, for moderating that session on public key infrastructure. May I request the panel to please come forward for a group photograph before we conclude. And we get ready for our next panel discussion immediately. Thank you to our panel for a fruitful discussion on public key infrastructure for DPI. Special thanks to our chairperson and our moderator. And thank you to our audience. We're moving immediately into our next panel discussion post which we will break for lunch. The next uh, panel discussion coming up is on digital education and skilling. We're going to take a minute to quickly change over to our next panel. address the critical aspects of universal access to quality education and leveraging technology for an inclusive and equitable education system. I will start introducing our panel and then they can join as soon as we're ready with the setup. Uh, we have our esteemed speakers and experts who will share their valuable insights on this topic. Starting with our chairperson for this session, Ms. Parvashi Maharajay, Assistant Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Information, Technology and Communication, Mauritius. Everybody, a round of applause for our chairperson. May I now invite our moderator for the session, Mr. Shankar Maruwada, co founder and CEO of XTEP Foundation. He'll be guiding this session as the moderator. We also have our distinguished panelists with us, including Ms. Yonsong Kim. Head of Unit and Program Specialist, Social and Human Science Unit at UNESCO. Please welcome Dr. Buddha Chandrasekhar, 
Chief Coordinating Officer, AICTE, Department of Higher Education, and Ms. L.S. Changsan, Additional Secretary, Digital, Department of School Education and Literacy, Government of India. Let's have a round of applause for this uh, panel on stage. Their insights and experiences will shed light on digital literacy, inclusive education, and the use of technology in transforming our education system. So without any further ado, over to you for the session. Good morning, everyone. So the mic I is kept next to you. Yeah, we'll start with yeah. Stop. So, good evening. Uh, good morning, everyone. Myself, as you know, Parvashi Maharaj. I'm from Mauritius. Well, uh, today it's a pleasure for me to declare this session open on uh, technology enabling uh, education and lifelong learning. So we have our experts in the education sector. We'll be sharing with you valuable and giving you valuable insights on education. As you know, um, post COVID-19, how uh, technology has become very important uh, in the education sector. And education sector is a prime sector. Without this sector, you know, uh, the world wouldn't be easy. So integrating a, uh, technology with education is, uh, is the biggest thing that we can do uh, in this 21st century. So now I will leave the floor to my colleague. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairperson. I'm excited and honored to be moderating this panel with the esteemed panelists, each of whom brings in a diverse and deep array of expertise. Uh, Ms. Changson from Government of India, who brings in the perspective of school education and deep administrative uh, expertise of having rolled out mass scale programs, which she'll talk about. Then we also have Ms. Yoon Song Kim from the UN talking about, from a multilateral perspective, how do you approach programmatically, policy-wise, how responsible use of technology, and she'll cover skilling. And then we have Dr. Buddha Chandrasekhar talking about higher education, a bit of scaling, how does one think strategically and operationalize technology, including cutting edge technology. Put together is going to be a fascinating discussion. Before I hand it over, I was listening carefully to yesterday's conversations, especially the first panel. As I reflect on my own journey in the digital public infrastructure from the starting days of Aadhaar now, more than a decade ago, since then a lot of water has flown. But listening to yesterday's conversation, where Ms. Kezom, UNDP head of digital programs, called it an extraordinary moment and opportunity for collective action. She called it the boldest of human experiments, this idea of digital public infrastructure for development. Dr. Ram Sevak Sharma advised us that DPI is not just about technology, but about fundamental principles like equity, impact, data, ecosystem activation, and interoperability. As I was listening to many of the other comments from yesterday, the discussions. I was reminded of an old Indian parable of the six blind men and the elephant. Except here, it's not six blind men. It's people who are looking at this massive sculpture with open eyes, which is so big that everybody can only see one part of the sculpture. And therefore, rightly, there are different perspectives. What I find invaluable about these two days, and especially in education from our experts, is bringing these diverse perspectives, which allows each of us to see what is the big picture happening. What are some of the opportunities and challenges in education? How does one take advantage of the emerging technologies? What can one country learn from the other? The chairperson of the previous panel said that, as countries, we all have different characteristics. 
We may be part of the same family, but each of us is different. In such a case, what can we learn from each other? What are some things we need to be careful about? These are the kind of questions the panel will be talking about. And in the end, if we do have time, I will throw the floor for questions from the audience. But I am aware that we stand between you and lunch. So depending upon time, uh, we might have to skip that, but I would maybe take a question or two at most. So without further ado, I'll hand it to Ms. Changson to share uh, her perspectives on the topic. Thank you. Uh, a very good afternoon to everyone. Um, chairperson of today's uh, panel discussion and all the esteemed uh, Comaico panelists and the excellencies, representatives from different countries who have come to join in this uh, summit on digital public infrastructure and colleagues from different government uh, and non-government sectors, and my dear friends. Since uh, the beginning of this summit, we have been uh, talking about how critical and uh, how uh, novel is this concept of digital public infrastructure. Uh, today, we uh, would like to talk about how important DPI, how critical it is for ensuring universal quality education, access to it uh, uh, by all, and a diverse uh, sets of learners and stakeholders. But before this, I would just like to take you across uh, the sheer scale of the diversity and complexity in India, the perspective and challenges. As you can see, uh, we have 1.48 million schools, 265 million students uh, from different socioeconomic backgrounds. We have 9.5 million teachers, 62 educational boards of instruction across di the different parts of the country, states and at national level, and uh, mediums of instruction in 22 constitutional languages, uh, English, and a number of regional languages. So this shows that we need diverse solutions and capabilities, which is ensured, or which is enabled by a unifying DPI. Before I share what India has done for DPI in the education sector, I would like to emphasize here that the policy framework in India uh, makes a strong case for digital public infrastructure. It recommends that we need to invest in open digital public infrastructure. The national education policy launched in 2020, it's a visionary document of the government in the Ministry of Education, uh, Government of India. It has multiple provisions for inculcating and promoting digital interventions, innovations for education. These are through content creation, uh, digital repository, then addressing digital divide and equity through use of different formats, and uh, making sure that we overcome language barriers and then we are reach, able to reach out to the differently abled students too. This also includes not only students, but it looks after the training of teachers and overall promoting digital learning through effective models of blended learning. 
So in short, India wanted a digital innovation that can work at our scale, our diversity, and our complexity. So what we really needed was something that's flexible, something that's evolvable, federated, keeping in mind that India has 36 states and union territories, and so many other non-government uh, stakeholders too in the education system, and uh, a, a, a framework that is extensible or scalable. In other words, we need to use technology for accessibility, inclusion, and equity. This, uh, uh, we, India's digital education program is called PME Vidya. So through this PME Vidya, in fact, Vidya means sharing uh, knowledge in, in, in Hindi and in Sanskrit, basically. And it, this program ensures inclusiveness, equitable access, and education for all. This uses offline resources like TV, radio, podcasts, and uh, physical learning resources. It uses offline resources, interactive online resources, uh, courses and ebooks, online live and recorded uh, sessions. These are available to the various states and education boards to use, and they can also create uh, as per their own context. There is coherent access to all. What you get in one format, you can also access in another. Uh, so in this, through in the, in the course of use of technology, infusing technology into education, India has come up with this uh, DPI, which we call the PM Evidya. In fact, this is the world's, one of the world's largest, most diverse school education platforms. It offers more than 9,000 courses, more than 307,000 diverse pieces of content. It is, we have over 11,000 contributors, teachers, experts, practitioners, and a whole lot of professionals have come together to create this. Uh, and the PME Vidya Diksha, which actually is an acronym for Digital Infrastructure for Knowledge Sharing, uh, the pandemic gave a lot of impetus to it. Though it was existing before that, with the uh, advent of the national education policy and then the pandemic, the lockdown, the uh, Diksha platform saw a spurt in growth. And you can see the figures. In a course of five years, you know, um, it saw the uh, unparalleled usage. The figures speak for themselves. Uh, 5.16 billion learning sessions, 60 billion learning minutes, and this was being offered in 33 languages. This led to ease of access to relevant digital content across the nation, and what we talked about from yesterday, lifelong learning, continuing learning. I think this is not just only about something in school education per se, but all across in the uh, comfort of whatever environment you are, you can have access to these learning resources. And the most important, I would like to just mention about uh, one of the most important uh, learning resources available on the Diksha platform was the energized textbooks, e-textbooks. These have QR code, just you can see on the left side, the, this is a regular textbook we have in the digital format and in physical. So you just uh, focus on the uh, QR code and it gives you a variety of uh, explanatory content, audio, uh, video files and uh, virtual labs, practicals and things like that. And, and in, it's not limited, as I mentioned, not just for students. There are teacher-focused resources also. We've conducted massive online teacher training programs covering uh, 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 um, you know, all, we have all our teachers all across the country um, through a program called Nishtha. But having said that, I would like to emphasize that what we need when we talk about a digital physical infrastructure in education, or for that matter, in any sector, what we need is a framework or an architecture. In school education, uh, we came up with this National Digital Education Architecture, NDR it's also called. This was launched by our prime minister uh, to create a unifying 
national digital infrastructure to en energize and catalyze the education ecosystem. This policy framework, it lays down the building blocks for D DPI in education to, for anyone who is interested to contribute through leveraging the API. It gives an opportunity to develop innovations which are localized, but again can be hosted centrally and can be accessed by all catering to variety of diverse learning needs. So now, this, uh, to take this further, the government of India, the school education department, has come up with the NDR policy stack. This covers metadata and data standards for school education, open standards and specification for NDR, and API policy integration of third-party application. So we, are, we have this uh, uh, policy framework. We have uh, the national education policy. We have the NDR, which will enable uh, a framework to set up all these capabilities and uh, all the um, applications which are lying out. Uh, Diksha infrastructure now has been uh, recognized as a digital global good by the government of India. In fact, it is, uh, it, India became the first country in the world to provide QR-coded textbooks to elementary school children through this platform. And now, uh, Diksha has been recognized as a model in other countries. World Bank and UNESCO has said that it has potential for uh, being used in other countries. So here we are, uh, India in the school education sector. We are keen and ready to offer PME Vidya Diksha as a digital global good. Uh, in this, we can uh, share the NDR technology framework and operations, the software code programs, then the content of Diksha, the standard operating procedures and artifacts of large scale nationwide program. Now this can be uh, in uh, different forms. Uh, it can be uh, through a DIY model in which interested countries can leverage the starter pack of uh, Diksha of the government of India. And uh, otherwise through an advisory mode, through an MOU, or through our technology partners and uh, partners like World Bank and UN. So in conclusion, I would just like to uh, say that, you know, this is just, uh, it just, in pictures and images, just captures what we we're trying to say, that uh, we have so many applications, so many uh, standalone silos, but uh, it's like a one-man band trying to do it all. But let us come together on a common uh, platform, and uh, this is the DPI Diksha that we are offering. So thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Changson. It was very insightful that way back in 2017 when Diksha was launched, it was thought of as infrastructure inbuilt right into the name, digital infrastructure for knowledge sharing. The other thing I wanted to point out is Diksha as digital public infrastructure is providing a service to the students of India. But Diksha as digital public good is what other countries can take including the code, including the policy stack, et cetera. So the difference between a digital public good, which I can take to create my own platform, I being other countries, versus in India, it is a digital public infrastructure which is being operated on, which is being continuously evolved to provide services to the students and uh, uh, teachers of India. So one of the things that you talked about was the accompanying policy frameworks, the context, and therefore uh, how infrastructure was thought of to be used by different states in their own way. Using that, I would like to invite Ms. Yusong Kim to talk about, from her perspective, a multilateral perspective, how should we be thinking about policy frameworks? How should we be thinking about this programmatically in the context of skilling? and especially with the emergence of AI, what are some things we should be watching out? So, Ms. Kim. Makes me a bit 
too tall, but uh, I'll start. Thank you, um, everyone, and thank you, the Indian government, especially the G20 presidency, for inviting UNESCO to speak on this panel discussion. Like uh, Mr. Shankar has mentioned, UNESCO would like to bring in more of the perspective of multilateral organizations, how we support our member states in, in providing guidance, policy, programmatic support in digital skills and education. So as the UN, we try to provide normative frameworks that individual member states can take upon and guide their own policy making in their countries. Among many, many global normative frameworks that UNESCO has, today I would like to touch upon two specific ones on digital skills and education. So the first one is a global framework of reference on digital liter literacy skills for indicator 4.4.2. It's a bit technical, but SDG 4 is on quality education. And this specific um, indicator is on the percentage of youth who have achieved at least a minimum level of proficiency in digital liter literacy skills. So to feed into this indicator, we've built on the European Commission's Digital Competency Framework for Citizens, Digicomp 2.0, which many of you might know. And we've done a deeper dive on existing global, regional, subnational frameworks with a group of experts and created a framework on defining the digital literacy competen competencies. Now the comp contribution of this framework is that it allows member states to understand what we're talking about when we say digi digital literacy. And in terms of the proficiency levels, it creates a detailed paradigm on the scale of zero to five on each indicator. The second one is specifically on OER, Open Educational Resources. And we're very proud that this is the first international normative instrument to embrace the field of openly licensed educational materials and technical technologies in education. So based on this uh, framework, UNESCO has created an OER dynamic coalition that provides knowledge sharing and technical support to its member states in creation, distribution, and adaptation of different OERs ac across the world. So I've shared a brief cover of the report, but you can see both at full length online. They're both available. Now, both of these resources and frameworks fly very well into the DPI that we're talking about in terms of education and digital skills. DPI has immense benefits because it's data driven and it gives us insights based on data of students and teachers to enhance the access to edu education as well as the quality of education and also lies more customized approaches and effective solutions to individual students. That's why we do agree with the Indian government and the amazing work that it has done, but also that it has potential to be replicated in other places, and in some cases it's already being done, so it's not necessarily something only India can do. Specifically focusing on the policy um, upstream support that UNESCO provides, I would like to touch upon the G20 because it's the Digital Economy Working Group is happening right next to us. And so UNESCO is a proud knowledge partner of the Digital Economy Working Group. It's uh, on the priority area of digital skilling. Now, we've undertaken multiple workshops and stakeholder group meetings, and specifically last time in the second working group, there was a big uh, request from the member states saying we need to understand digital skills and education from a multi-stakeholder perspective, not just from the governments, but from the industries, the businesses, the educational institutions on understanding what the needs are. So a common problem and issue that arise from this multi-stakeholder forum was that there's a clear mismatch between skills and jobs. So then how do we address this? It's not just an issue of India. We had many, many different stakeholders from other countries, and this was a recurring theme. So now, through the platform of G20, and specifically the DEWG, what we're trying to look into is first explore good practices on upskilling and reskilling in terms of digital skills, what exists out there, and hopefully create a strategy for countries that do not yet have these programs that they can take it on into their own countries. So it's still a work in progress. This is the third DWG meeting, so hopefully by the 
end of um, the G20 in their presidency, we'll have something a little bit more concrete. But there's definitely um, a recognition that this is required. Secondly is in the previous um, session we heard a lot about mu mutual recognition framework. Now that is something that is required also in the digital skills and education area because there's different standards and skill sets that each country has. When you try to match the skills and jobs across borders, there's always a mismatch. And one policy solution that the G20 is considering is creating a reference framework that different countries can all refer to when it comes to digital, digital skills and literacy so that a candidate or a profession in a certain country can be uh, find the labor sources in another country across G20. But that's, again, something very complex, and we're in the very initial stages of exploring what exists, what can be done. And a concrete deliverable of the G20 that we're also trying to create is not just have this in the mechanism, mechanism of G20, but create an open repository of information where all the countries can, yes, upload information on what they have, but also access and take references to different examples across countries, including taxonomy on different skills and different jobs, and hopefully that can lead to more awareness and the need on a similar mutual recognition framework in terms of digital skills. So I think that um, puts us in a good segue to, for me to talk about a little bit beyond digital skills, another emerging and frontier technology that UNESCO is working in because we tried to be forward looking is the emergence of AI. Now in November 2021, UNESCO through its, the agreement and adoption of 193 member states was able to adopt the UNESCO recommendation on the ethics of AI. And this was before ChatGP and generative AI. So at the time we were trying to raise awareness among our member states countries that there is a need for us to work on such a framework on a normative, normative po policy. And we're happy to per, um, claim that this is the first one ever existing that has agreed, been agreed globally. So that we're very proud to say that. Another, I think, unique contribution of this recommendation is that it didn't just stay at a high level principle. You know, especially recently with generative AI and all these discussions coming up, it's important that we give member states actionable policies and not just talk about high level principles. And you see there we have 11 policy areas where we specifically have policy recommendations on each of the policy areas, which today I won't go into every one of them, but you can easily access them online. And um, one of the areas I would like to talk to is the policy recommendations on education and research. So in, there's, let's say 10, about 10 policy recommendations, but a big contribution that UNESCO sees in the policy recommendations on education and research is to first identify that when we talk about education skills, it's not just the tech skills, but actually it's talking about a lot more than the technical skills. It's talking about um, critical and uh, creativity, team building of social emotional learning and AI ethics skills that all need to be considered when member states makes policies on AI, um, AI uh, education and skills. The second one I would like to talk about is the contribution of this framework in the economy and labor. So we will know, we do know that the rise of AI will have inevitable impacts on our economy and especially economies that are labor intensive, such as India. So when it comes for member states in developing these policy, we need to recognize the impacts and also create possible solutions such as upskilling and reskilling programs so that those fall behind or are impacted due to the introduction of AR, have a mechanism to be reintroduced into the economy. And there, again, we emphasize six um, concrete policy recommendations that member states can take up in implementing uh, their UNESCO recommendations of, on the ethics of AI. So I think I'll stop here and leave it open to discussion or any other questions in the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kim. That was uh, very insightful, especially the frameworks around AI, which are so timely and uh, actionable. 
So we have heard the perspective of a country implementing a large scale program. We have heard a multilateral perspective on framework. How does this apply in higher education? How should, how is India dealing with incorporating the latest emergence technologies? I would like to invite one of India's top practitioners in this area, Dr. Buddha Chandrasekhar, to share his perspectives. Good afternoon all. Uh, on behalf of uh, Ministry of Education, I welcome all of you for this uh, wonderful event because every day is a learning day. You know, I learned a lot from today morning. And I would like to focus, you know, a few of the initiatives which Government of India with respect to higher education. Because, you know, now the higher education ministry become a more technological house because we understood technology plays a major role. And as we all experienced at the time of corona, right, so we all switched all our students towards the digital platforms. And one very important thing, the lesson what we learned is that every student is unique. Every student learning patterns are unique. Every student, the way they learn is unique. So don't you think we need to create an interactive, customized, and adoptive and personalized learning management systems. So that's where we started thinking about the digital ecosystem. Next slide, please. So the digital ecosystem, next slide. So that's where we started uh, looking into the digital uh, ecosystems. So as you all know that you know, India is a, as the youngest population in the world. So we want to not only bridge the gap between the education system and the uh, skilling system, but there is a, a couple of other ecosystems like, uh, techno uh, like research, innovation, startup ecosystem. So for that, you know, we need an ecosystem which basically connects, interconnects all this, and a system which can interact with each other. So that's where the role of the technology is going to be very important. And you know, we worked on a couple of ecosystems. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. So I would like to present a couple of various digital initiatives from higher education point of view. Next slide. So one of the important uh, ecosystem what we created is a national uh, uh, educational technology forum. Basically, this forum is nothing but an ecosystem which basically talks about uh, you know, establishing a blueprint between the digital public infrastructure in education and skilling. So when I say education, you know, it covers the innovation, research, and all. So, so that's where you know, we started, and you know, we started creating so many uh, uh, you know, technologies on top of it. Next slide, please. So one of the technologies is like SSN in US. Right? See, as of now, what's happening is the student is learning, but we are not tracking it. So we have created something called Educational Eco -Regi Ecosystem Registry. Basically, this registry uh, is, is nothing but it tracks all the learning patterns or the learnings or, or you know, kind of a credit-based system. And it, it basically tracks the innovation. If they have done any kind of a skill-based initiatives, you know, it try to cover all that together. And we are giving one unique ID to the student. So this unique ID basically connects all these dots of the student uh, uh, you know, uh, life cycle. The next slide, please. So this is more federated in nature and decentralized hosted student as well as the teacher registry with a common minimum data fields. And it's an open API. I mean, why we are creating this open API, as I said, mentioned earlier, you know, we have so many systems and ecosystems in place. So we want each and every system to talk with each other and share the common data. So that's the beauty of this. And you know, it is interoperable. And, uh, and we have a standardized registries. And you know, the, there is a user consent for data sharing. So which is basically adhered to India 2.0 and NDR architecture. Next slide, please. So this is, again, another very interesting platform called uh, One Nation, One Data Portal. Basically, in our country, we do on our higher education, we do a regulation, assessment, and accreditation. So basically, the institutes, we have like more than 56,000 higher education institutes in India. 
So all are filling the information on various systems. You know, so there are a lot of duplicacy, you know, and a waste of time. So what we did, we now created something called One Nation, One Data Portal, where it's a single source of truth. You know, so we are collecting all the information in one place, and it's a unified view, and we are utilizing the artificial intelligence and business intelligence on top of it to create a business decisions on top of it. So that, that's a kind of a portal what we have created on the One Nation, One Data. And the objectives, next slide, please. So, I mean, these are the couple of uh, objectives. Basically, it has a real-time data collaboration. So, so that, you know, I can take the real-time data and instantly I can act on it. And as I, as I already mentioned, you know, it's a purely technology-based and we are even creating the past, current and future kind of a reporting system on top of it so that we can understand what we need to do and seasonal-based reporting. We are doing uh, uh, academic-based reporting, innovation-based reporting, startup-based reporting, you know, so, so DIY-based reporting, so that we can understand, you know, which side the student is going, and we have adopted the industry requirements to it and, and map, map the industry requirements with our uh, educational progress so that we can understand you know where the world is going and how we can map the requirements of the world with the with the current uh, learnings of the students next slide so that's where i see there is a need of a bridge between academy and industry so we have created a wonderful portal the minute you do like this right it loads it's a super fast based application next slide it's called the National Internship Portal, where we have more than 17 million registered and verified. I mean, I have uh, 42 million registered students, but we have verified each and every student. The profile we have in the portal is verified, and they are, they are verified by the institute. And it has all kind of a, you know, uh, ingredients of a, of a student not only from the education point of view, from the, from the innovation point of view, from the languages point of view, from the research point of view. So we have created a very advanced profile and with a more than 10,000 plus registered institutes and we have more than 70,000 plus industries connected. And I'm so happy to share that we have given more than 3 million internship opportunities in last two years. So what it really means is that, you know, every student, whether he's a first year or a second year or a final year student, they are going through the internship opportunity. They are working with the industry on the real time when they're in college. And the minute they come out, you know, they are coming out with the experience, the skill-based real-time experience along with their degree. So wonderful platform and we are happy to show it's a multilingual platform and it's an API based and it has a very well advanced, I mean, if you, any one of the technologies here, they understand that it loads 56,000 records in a nick of a second like this. You know, so that kind of an extraordinary platform what we have created. Next slide. So that, this is another biggest problem, as uh, ma'am also mentioned. You know, we have, uh, it's a beautiful vernacular languages we have in, in our country. So English, 80% uh, Indians speak non-English. You know, so they speak a lot of various local languages. So I'm so happy to share that we have created a artificial intelligence deep learning based tools, which not only translate the text from Indian to Indian languages, from any foreign language to Indian language, any Indian language to foreign language, and it is getting used by multiple people. But the beauty of this is, can you go to the next slide? Next slide. So it has one very extraordinary ingredient is that you know, in, in India, if you see most of the web applications, you know, there the form is in English format, so you need to either type so that, you know, they, it gets submits. But we have created a voice-based form. Imagine an uneducated person, you know, who wants to come back to the system. So we have created a voice-based form where they speak in any Indian language. It automatically types and it gets submitted. And at the same time, the administrator can see in any Indian or foreign language. So the data which got submitted in Indian language will auto-translate into any Indian or foreign languages. So that's a one kind of a voice input recognition as well as text dictation. 
So we have a lot of text dictation based applications. We have online extraordinary online text editor with a word glossary. We have a speech messenger. Instantly it changes the one video from one language to another language. We have a domain specific dictionaries. We have any dictionary, you name it in the world. 1700 is what we have identified. We have more than 700 plus was dictionaries was defined and you know all are fine tuned and the data models are created. And we have a multilingual voice search. We have a voice-based multilingual forms, and we have integrated the chat GPT because you know that generative AI is very, very important as technology is playing a major role. We want our student, but he's asking questions in Indian languages, and chat GPT responds back, and we have created a voice wrapper, which basically captures the voice up to 45 minutes. And the student can listen, and you know they can listen as well as they can question back to the system. So we have created a wonderful system using advanced technologies, and all government of India scams was, uh, schemes was integrated with the you know with the artificial intelligence. And any YouTube video you take it, we can we have a capability of translating and putting back and stitching the entire uh, timeline to the back to the same uh, YouTube video. So these are the couple of uh, initiatives what we have created. This next slide, last slide. So these are the couple of digital skilling platforms. I just take one more minute uh, because this is very important. What we did, we created a robot, you know, the AI tool, which basically gone through every country GDP and their economic status, what kind of projects they are working on. And we have identified 56 skill, uh, you know, uh, uh, areas. And we have created a digital skilling platform where we have given opportunity to every student to learn it for free of cost. And I thank all the, all the uh, people coming here. And we are happy to share all this because our Honorable Prime Minister as well as Indians, we all feel and you know, strongly believe that our world is one. And we all, Vasudeva Kutumbam, we all are one family. We are happy to share uh, all these digital platforms with you. And uh, I, I request, you know, we, uh, if given opportunity, we will demonstrate our Anuvadini tool which we will just, it is a mind-blowing tool which translates any kind of a document with any formatting as it is like a Xerox copy in any language. So I thank everyone for giving this opportunity. And one last slide, where's my uh, name as well as, can you go to the last slide, please? Last slide, next slide. So my name is Buddha Chandrasekhar. I'm a CCO for uh, ACT Minister of Education. This is my contact number. So feel free to contact and let's be in touch and uh, we are happy to help. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chandrasekhar. The range of tools and technology being used is truly mind-boggling, which therefore presents the challenge of how does one keep pace with all the changing technologies? Not an easy task. So thank you to all the panelists for finishing on time. I, we might have time for one or two questions from the audience, if any. Does anyone? Yeah, please. Hey, hi, my name is Kiran. I'm from Emudra Limited. Uh, this is on the education field, but this is a thought running for some time in me. Now that everything is going digital, so my question is the certificates that is being given to award it to students, can that also move into digital mode? That's my question. Yeah. Because currently it's all in physical form, whether it is degree, diploma, or any professional qualification. Yeah, I, I will answer this question, sir. Sir, uh, now we are using blockchain-based technology and, you know, and made all the certificates digital. And on the other side, I mean, I give my own experience. I, did, I finished 56 certifications, you know, other than my education. And there is no value for it as of now. So we have created now the academic bank of credit. What happens, any, any uh, certificate you do out of your education or within your education system or any skill ecosystem or any ecosystem, you can upload that to this repository and all you need to do is just give this uh, you know, QR code to anyone for cross verification. All your certificates are digital in nature, you don't need to carry. So that's kind of a thing. And another thing what we did on the skilling side, because see one is education which is academic based. The second one is skill based. So what we do on the skill based, so there we come up with a universal bank of credit. So one is for the academic purpose and one is for a universal bank of credit and we equated this with the universal credit systems because there are various very well-known credit systems in the world. We have analyzed all that and you know we have an extraordinary officer called Kalsiji. So he analyzed and you know we all churned all the data 
and we come up with a framework and equating our Indian education system, credit system, with the international uh, credit system. So that's where we are bridging the gap. So, uh, I mean, in short, you know, we are digitized all this and uh, it has 18 encryptions on top of it. 18 encryptions so that, you know, we want to make sure it is not only digitized, it's a secured also. Thank you very much. I hope you, I Thank answered Thank you, Dr. Chandrasekhar. Ms. Changsen. Would you like to? I'd just like to add about uh, the school education part. Uh, so, so Boards, many of the boards, especially led by national boards like Central Board of Secondary Education, that is uh, under the government of India. So they have uh, the system of uh, putting up all the marks in a digital format, and uh, it is available. And even uh, further, uh, under the DigiLocker, so CBSC and some education boards have come on. It is, of course, uh, yet to be, I think, some, it's, it's a concurrent subject, so states will have to determine whether they would like to come on board to have this uh, digital certification. Thank you. I think that is an important point. When you think of something as a digital solution, it can be rolled out to a segment. But when you create it as an infrastructure, it can be rolled out to multiple segments by multiple ecosystem actors. So as an example, uh, Nishtha from NCRT has resulted in digital training and verifiable digital credentials issued to possibly some five or six million teachers and a total of 130 million credentials issued, verifiable, each one of them, right? Like the COVID uh, digital vaccination ver uh, verifiability. But the same infrastructure can also be used by students. But for that, you need policy. And that's where Dr. Chandrasekhar talked about EER, which provides a policy framework. You need to think about data privacy protection, right? Especially when you're thinking at the scale of a country. But that is an example of how to think as digital infrastructure and not just as a digital solution. I think this is a very exciting space. A lot of action will happen in the next three to four years. And uh, that will really uh, allow India to leapfrog in understanding learning outcomes. Uh, Anil, you had a question. Thank you, Shankar. Uh, fascinating conversation. Uh, in Bangladesh, uh, actually, I want to ask two questions, if possible. In Bangladesh, uh, we developed, as you know, Shankar, a teacher's portal. So this has been in the making for about 13 years. Started from 23 teachers, now 600,000 teachers. One of the things that we've been doing is allowing teachers to create content and share amongst each other in the form of peer learning. So I wanted to hear experience on that and whether the school boards allow that kind of, because it's not vetted in a sense, it's teacher for teacher kind of a thing. So that's one. And the second is the use of artificial intelligence that we have started in the last uh, year or so for formative assessment in schools. It's a pilot right now. We want to grow that to all schools, 100,000 plus schools. And then the issue of uh, career guidance for skills. So we have a skills platform where we have brought in the skills providers, 13,000 of them, the ministries that provide skills training, and the chambers of commerce that are actually on the demand side. And then obviously the youth seeking jobs. So one of the things that we have seen is if we can actually provide career guidance, even enabled by AI, it would be a big leap for a lot of uh, students and uh, young graduates to find where they need to go. Otherwise they get distracted and it, it doesn't work very well. So again, AI-based career guidance. Actually three questions then, thank you. So we'll take the first question. Any experiences of teachers sharing content uh, any of the panelists? Uh, yeah, I'll like to come on this, uh, the first part of the question. Uh, peer learning, as you said, learning amongst the teachers. Uh, yes, uh, actually, Diksha, this what we have just shared, it is not just for students, it is for teachers as well. In fact, it was conceptualized as a learning platform for teachers. And a lot of the content that is there on the platform is... Uh, on the app itself is contributed by teachers. Um, during the pandemic, in fact, it was a huge movement, like a very voluntary from our central schools like Yendra Vidyales and uh, Nabodeyas. And many of the CBSC school teachers, they came forward and gave their 
the content in the areas in which they specialize. And teachers from who were accessing this platform learned a lot from it. Then this was one kind of sharing. Secondly, uh, we have this, what we call the Vidya Samiksha Kendras. You know, so uh, we have this center in NCERT, and in states, we have uh, uh, identified areas which need improvement. We have what we call micro improvements, small areas. So what teachers are doing in the best practices at the actual ground level, it's not some theoretical thinking that in pedagogical experts are doing, sitting um, in, in the center. It's what teachers at the ground level are doing, the little changes that they have been able to bring about. There's a platform for sharing that in the Vidya Samiksha Kendras, and that is also accessible to all states. So I can just cite at least these two examples of hand. I think thank you so much. It's very interesting to learn about uh, the Bangladesh. We looked into that too. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Angson. Dr. Uh, thank you. I mean, I really appreciate the kind of initiative you are taking. I think it's very important to first understand what student wants. I think, you know, which we are missing in last few decades. I think we are just dumping the content. You know, I think now the world is changed. The attention span of the student is less than seven seconds. I think immediately we need to grab it, right? So from the higher education side, what we are doing, we have two programs, sir. One is the student development program. The second one is faculty development program. On the faculty development program, we have a peer-to-peer -peer learning as well as we have, as I mentioned, 56 uh, technologies, uh, what we identified. And we started training uh, the 6 lakh plus uh, higher education uh, faculty. And I'm happy to share that. I mean, there is a resistance of change, you know, which I completely understand and accept. But slowly, they're also understanding. They're also started learning. They started visiting the industries. You know, we have opened up, you know, for them. And, you know, I think that that's one, one area which I would like to cover. But the, another one very interesting is, the role of AI, you know, in this entire uh, learning uh, uh, ecosystem, I think it plays a major role. Because every minute is a learning pattern. If you see, it is not only that the student is learning only from the book. He is learning from the nature. He is even learning from his, you know, uh, his fellow students. He is learning when he goes outside of the classroom. I think there are different learning methodologies. So what we started doing on the higher education side, we recently started this as a placement portal. But in this placement portal, we started capturing every interest area of the student and trying to suggest, oh, are you interested on in this? You know, some, some students are interested on, on, the, on the working on the uh, roads, but they are a computer science uh, students. So we said, it's really good. You know, why don't you get in touch with the officer in National Highway Authority? And we started connecting them with them. And some wants to move towards medicine. You know, we said, well, fine, you know, this is good. And multidisciplinary, right? NEP access multidisciplinary. We said, why not? You know, why don't you go and, you know, meet them? So we are creating an ecosystem where we are not only just giving the content to them, we are giving them an opportunity to be, get a mentorship. We are giving them opportunity to connect with the industry, with the innovators, with the researchers. I think we need to have this 360 degree angle, you know, so that let them choose what they want. I think this is kind of a platform what we are creating and we are happy to learn from you and with others also. I mean, you know, uh, we, we want to give the best to our students. So we are happy to learn any best models you have. Please share with us. We are happy to learn and if we have any best models, we are happy to share with you. Building off what Ms. Yun Sung Kim said about the need for framework, one of the things that India is doing is it's revamping its curriculum framework. And as part of that, how should we look at assessment is itself being thought of. So in early years, the fact that assessment should be based on observation by the teacher and not necessarily what the child can answer or, or like exam. So this creates a lot of opportunities for the latest AI to kind of make it easier for the teacher to record observations right, and reduce her administrative load. So the, again, the point about technology has to be in tune with policy. Uh, I want to re-emphasize that. So uh, uh, I'm sure we could have gone on, but uh, all of this would have given a lot of food for thought, which means it's time for lunch. So before, to, uh, I would like to hand it back to the chairperson.
for her closing thoughts. Uh, well, uh, it was a very fruitful, this conversation. So we would like to thank you, all our panelists, uh, for providing us all uh, this uh, clarification on Diksha, a very innovative platform. And uh, we look forward and, uh, to have a collab collaboration with you, with India. I, we already have, Mauritius already has a collaboration with India. So we'll be collaborating and make sure that we implement all the, um, what we have in the MOU to benefit from this innovative platform. And of course, uh, with uh, UNESCO, the part of AI ethics is uh, very important because uh, we know with uh, artificial intelligence, we need the right uh, framework, the legal uh, framework in place, because without it, uh, it will be quite difficult for AI. So we look forward with UNESCO, with uh, other panelists as well. Thank you as well for sharing all this information with your higher level education, how you involve different stakeholders. So for me, for in, uh, we see that India is very well advanced in terms of technology and education. Thank you. Thank you very much. Check. Thank you. Like Dr. Chandrasekhar said, uh, the seven second attention span is becoming quite a concern now. Like apps like Instagram are promoting seven second reels. They also advise their users, don't make reels beyond seven seconds. So then it becomes a norm when such heavy apps or influential apps come up with those rules. So thank you very much for that discussion. Let's have a round of applause, everybody. And uh, may I request our moderator, Mr. Shankar Marwada, to please present a token of our appreciation to our chairperson for this session, Ms. Parvashi Maharajay. It's a Himru shawl that we have for our chairperson, along with a token of our gratitude and appreciation. And we'd also like to thank our panelists. May I request our moderator to please present a token of our appreciation to Ms. Yon Song Kim, head of uh, unit and program specialist, Social and Human Science Unit, UNESCO. We'd also like to present a token of our appreciation to Ms. L.S. Changsan, Additional Secretary, Digital Department of School Education and Literacy, Government of India. And to Dr. Buddha Chandrasekhar, Chief Coordinating Officer, AICTE, Department of Higher Education. And may I request our chairperson, Ms. Parvashi Maharaje, to please present a token of appreciation to our moderator, Mr. Shankar Marwada. Thank you very much. May I request the panel to please step forward for a group picture before we conclude. And for everybody else, we break for lunch. We'll see you back at 2.15. Uh, we'll see you back at 2.15. There's a Diksha stall outside as well as the Global DPI Summit exhibition going on. So please make sure you visit that too uh, in your free time. And right now we break for lunch. Please be back in time as we get ready for our post-lunch session, which will be on DPI for digital healthcare and climate action. All right, thank you. And we will see you on the other side of the break. <laughs>
which is uh, really the main topic for all Norwegians. What is the weather like? So, and Norwegians also like to travel a lot, so EIR started providing uh, weather data for the whole world. And uh, today, these uh, data and these models for the weather forecast, they are open, and they are used, for example, by farmers in Africa to decide when to seed and when to harvest. And FAO, UN, FAO, uses this data from EIR uh, in their climate mitigation efforts. And similarly, uh, Norway shares large quantities of high-resolution satellite images that are used, for example, by the UN to monitor climate change, document deforestation, and to map extreme weather and natural disasters. So those were three examples where do digital public goods and digital public infrastructure is you know, being used in the space of climate change, climate adaptation, and climate mitigation. You also asked about health, and uh, I want to highlight the DHIS2, which I think that most people are familiar with, most of you are familiar with. It is the world's largest health information management system. It is a global public good used for collection, validation, analysis, and presentation of data. It is approved as a global public good. And it was developed uh, through a collaboration between a Norwegian university and a an university in South Africa, and it was funded by the Norwegian government. And today this system is being used in 76 countries as part of these countries' national health management information system. And during COVID, for example, the DHIS2 was used for delivery, deciding on delivery of COVID vaccines and in, 40, in 42 countries, and in 44 countries, including my own, Norway, it was used to surveil the spreading of the virus. So one of the success criteria for this um, DHIS2 has really been a local capacity building in combination with the fact that it, has an open, that it is an open system. So the local capacity building has really been crucial for this world's largest health info system management. Uh, and an emerging, emerging priority that we see with this DHIS2 is to prepare for and respond to climate change and health consequences, both through health surveillance and also by integrating climate and health data. So finally, Norway is already heavily supporting digital public goods and digital public infrastructure for common goods. We are partnering with many of the G20 countries as well as the organizations present here today. And since 2022, Norway has allocated at least 50 million US dollars till the year 2025 for this agenda. So yeah, that was a little bit about what we are doing from Norway's side. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin. An amazing examples uh, from Norway coming out. One of them, we as World Economic Forum were also involved in the Ocean uh, Initiative. Uh, but then certainly uh, your focus on getting the inclusivity for the, even the smaller countries possibly leveraging the digital public infrastructure would be great. Uh, let me move to uh, Vikalp. Uh, Vikalp, you lead uh, a startup, uh, Eka Care, and which was started and founded in 2020. Now, uh, can you help us understand, like, how did uh, a young startup just in over two and a half, three years scale up, leveraging public, uh, digital public infrastructure? And then what were the learnings also as, as you kind of really scale up? Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, and thanks for inviting me here. Uh, maybe our uh, post-lunch session, uh, I'm going to go uh, the other side, where I would like to ask a question to all the audience, uh, maybe just raise hands. Uh, how many of you have actually seen your medical records or your vitals, maybe if you are healthy, your parents' vitals or your kids' vaccination records, in the way you follow the GDP of countries in a graphical, digital manner? Uh, raise of hands. OK, none. Uh, I expected a couple of them. But, uh, but that's, that's what uh, Eka Care uh, is here. That's my startup to solve for. And we believe that 
uh, when it is about health, uh, nothing else matters. And uh, incidentally, uh, some of the stories that uh, has happened in my family as well has led to uh, what we are trying to do. And uh, I think, uh, as uh, we can see from these audience itself, the healthcare provider, which is the doctors, uh, eventually you cannot give yourself uh, uh, care, but the doctors uh, should read that data pretty carefully. Now, coming to uh, uh, the question uh, how the DPI is helping us uh, achieve this. Uh, so, uh, a small uh, presentation uh, just uh, here. What we believe at ACA Care today is we are hitting a moment of UPI in healthcare, right? All of you uh, know that UPI has actually taken uh, leaps and bounds uh, on the financial uh, ecosystem. And that is what the digital public infrastructure today uh, is, is uh, gearing up to transform the healthcare. So look at this slide. The left side is how uh, the UPI apps today operates in our country, where there is an NPCI rails, and then they connect to uh, the banking systems, as well as there are front-facing applications. A similar experience now is built using the digital public infrastructure called UHI, uh, ABDM, is Ayushman Bharat Digital Mission, where the healthcare service providers, such as uh, the ones mentioned here, are connected uh, to the rails. And hence, the delivery of the documents, the delivery of teleconsultation, the delivery of all kind of health services would be driven leveraging the PHR, which is personal health record applications uh, on the various stores as well as on the web. And I think that is transforming the way we are uh, building ACA Care. Can we go to the next? The architecture is pretty uh, federated. Uh, if you look at it, uh, all kinds of privacy-related use cases have been uh, looked up uh, while building this. Uh, there is an individual ID that we spoke about uh, in the earlier sessions as well, called ABHA, which is Ayushman Bharat Health Account. Now, this. ID is something that will make sure that the interaction and the integration happens for that specific individual. What eventually this means is the control of the health data would remain with us as an individual who are taking care of their health, and they are all free to share this data with whoever they wish to. Uh, and again, the architecture is such that the ownership is either uh, with the user or with a healthcare provider who has generated the data. The intermediaries uh, are uh, somebody who cannot uh, get through this information. So this is a fundamental shift in the way healthcare is getting delivered, at least uh, in India. This is the initiative that we are uh, super bullish about. Uh, Eka Care as a platform is uh, one of the largest PHR app. Our innovation is to bring these medical information in the hands of the user so that they can share that uh, necessarily with all the parties that they wish to. How it is uh, helping the sh to shape the startup ecosystem is, uh, think about like 2015, 16, when UPI was in the nascent stage uh, in our country. Uh, suddenly, you see that two sides of the network, one is the provider network, which is banks, is coming up on a level playing field, and then on the other side, consumers are also now getting access to these services right from their mobile phone. This is what is happening with this architecture as well. Uh, health is a far more complex subject. It's, uh, it's far more fragmented than what we see uh, in uh, FinTech. Uh, FinTech, we have got, say, 400 uh, banks. But here, there are 70,000 plus uh, healthcare services and 1.4 million doctors and so on and so forth. So pretty complex. Uh, because of this uh, infrastructure, all of these fragmented healthcare providers are coming onto the network, and us innovators are able to leverage uh, uh, use cases and are innovating use cases for users by uh, ensuring that we are part of this network. So that's a, that's a big fundamental shift in the way uh, healthcare uh, startups are now uh, building innovations on. And I think that's, uh, I believe, is all possible because of this digital public infrastructure. Again, uh, in the nascent stages right now, when we compare it with uh, 
Aadhaar or UPI or many other uh, large digital public infrastructures. But I am super confident that this would change the way healthcare services are delivered, and we would like to be uh, a big uh, innovator uh, in this journey to solve for this use case. So the next time, maybe when I'm meeting with you, you all should raise hands that, OK, now we can see our medical data and vitals electronically in a graphical fashion, because eventually health is what matters the most. Uh, rest everything is later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vikal. Thank you for sharing the whole platform approach. Um, let me come over to Sohail. Sohail, you represent uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And you have been pretty much actively involved, uh, for sure, I know, in India around uh, enabling DPI, enabling, enabling impact through uh, DPI, and people-focused DPI. So if you can also talk through uh, maybe uh, if we are really seeing some impact on the ground uh, through your experiences, and uh, what could be the health ecosystem without a DPI uh, approach? Sure. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Thanks, Puru. Uh, so first of all, I want to highlight that some of these societal problems that we are talking about, uh, they take time to uh, solve, right? I think the important questions in my mind are, are we moving in the right direction and at the right pace? Uh, in my view, the direction is right. Could we accelerate some of the progress that has been made till now? The answer is yes. Uh, definitely something more that we could do. I'll just take uh, an example from a healthcare perspective, and I'm going to zoom out a little bit from uh, what Vikalp was sharing, uh, more at a macro country level. Uh, now, many of us are aware that uh, one of the key indicators from a health perspective are things like maternal mortality rate, infant mortality rate. Uh, if you look at India's progress from 2010 to now, in 2010, I believe, our infant mortality rate was somewhere around 45, brought down to 37 in 2015. We should be somewhere in the 27, 26 mark per 1,000 lives, 1,000 uh, life births. Um, but we all know that if we have to achieve our SDG goals, uh, we ought to be less than five in less than seven years from now. Now, that's an uphill task. And Martin talked about SDGs important for all of us to uh, take a note because 2023 this year is the midpoint. And unfortunately, at least on the health indicators, we are not on track. Uh, globally, in India, and it's also the variance that we see within India. Right? It's not that th we, have, we have all states which are doing pretty bad in terms of these indicators. Um, there are clearly states like Kerala, Goa, which today have uh, brought down their IMR to single digits to less than five in certain cases. Um, we just need to also look at equity. And I'm glad that there are a lot of conversation and dialogue going around equity, uh, not just within the country. It's also within the region and globally as well. It's extremely important that we don't ignore what happens in a LMIC context because while we are able to leverage digital public infrastructure in a significant manner in the developed countries and possibly in some of the middle-income countries, there's a fairly long list of countries which uh, are today unable to leverage that digital public infrastructure which is being put in place. Um, I don't want this to be a sad story at all. So there are positives clearly, uh, whether this is the progress being made on some of these key indicators. Uh, but the acceleration that we're looking at, and I think Vikalp is a shared the Eka Care story. Uh, Eka Care, among many others, is today uh, also an example of what happens uh, within the innovation ecosystem when you have a strong DPI layer deployed in the country. Uh, we talked about ABDM or Aishwam Bharat Digital Mission. Almost every fundamental component of Aishwam Bharat Digital Mission today rides on some of the existing uh, DPI layers that India managed to deploy over the last decade and a half, whether it's uh, Aadhaar or the consent architecture for sharing of health data information. 
I think these are important milestones and will definitely help uh, accelerate some of this progress. Uh, but just as a concluding remark, I, I want to reiterate that this is a long journey. Uh, it requires a lot of uh, investment that has to go in, the effort that is required, commitment levels from not just the government, but also the providers, uh, the healthcare uh, ecosystem that we talk about, and also, very importantly, we as uh, consumers of healthcare services, patients or beneficiaries, I think uh, Vikal's question and the response is a clear indicator of uh, what we need to change at our end as well. Uh, I would have loved to follow up with the question on how many people have created their own ABHA ID as well, uh, but don't wish to do that. Uh, I, I, I just feel that it's important that we all realize that each one of us as individuals, uh, as organizations that we represent, uh, have a role to play. We can't just leave it to the governments to take care of our own health. Right? Uh, but thank you. I think hopefully the optimism will flow and we should be able to achieve uh, the goals, but equally. Thank you, Sohail. No, rightfully said, direction is right. Pace could be better, but long way to go. Sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Sohail. Let me, Martin, let me come back to you. Uh, and uh, the question now possibly is that what should be next in terms of uh, Norway's work in uh, nature, climate, uh, energy? And how do you look at international cooperation among governments, uh, among the digital public good communities around the world? Yes, thank you so much. I think that uh, when it comes to digital public infrastructure and digital public goods, then health is the domain where a lot of work has already been done. And Norway does now believe that it is time that we take this approach to the climate and nature uh, data further. So um, we believe that we should you know, stop investing in closed proprietary solutions with narrow use and start investing in robust and openly accessible infrastructure. And this infrastructure should be designed based on digital public goods standard and best practice for digital public infrastructure. And uh, Norway has uh, recently taken the first step towards a digital public infrastructure approach to climate and nature data with a recently announced call for proposals for the pilot and pro prototype phase of an initiative that we have called Open Earth Platform Initiative. And the, objectives, the objective of this initiative is to establish a robust and open accessible infrastructure across sectors related to climate adaptation and nature. And that call can be found on the webpage of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Norway. And I hope it will be of interest to, to some of you. And the call will be open till 20th of June. So uh, please go and visit that website and, and join in and uh, help create that uh, digital public infrastructure for, for climate change and nature. And I will be happy to share more uh, information uh, to any of you after this uh, session. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you so much. Um, Okay, Vikalp, let me come back to you on uh, this. Uh, like, okay, so, so so far you have really led the whole path for how can platform uh, take the uh, DPI and then deliver services to the masses. Uh, now looking ahead, how do you see the cooperation uh, with non-state actors in the space, in the nature, climate, energy uh, space? Uh, do you have a view on that? So. Thank you. Um, health has consumed so much of my mind space that I might not end up giving the best of the answer. But uh, fortunately, uh, I'm part of uh, one of my friends' uh, endeavor on climate uh, tech innovation to solve for climate. So uh, what I fundamentally believe is for a startup and a business ecosystem, uh, a business model is fundamentally very important because that's how you eventually would uh, drive uh, the overall uh, fuel for the innovation. I think that's where uh, I believe that on climate, uh, there are still uh, lots of areas where the business models uh, needs to be proven at scale. 
so that's where uh, a state's help uh, can definitely uh, be required, uh, like Martini also mentioned, uh, and in many other ways, be it financial, non-financial. But from a uh, pure play innovation uh, perspective, um, I think I, I remember uh, the time when uh, AI, machine learning, data science was uh, a jargon, and people used to uh, talk about this, but not a very fundamental uh, technologies we had seen. At that point in time, uh, in our organization, we realized that it's very important uh, for all of us to be educated. Uh, be it you a programmer or a product manager or a business analyst or a salesperson, it was very important uh, to get educated on how AI can change uh, the way you work and the way you provide solutions. So we started calling this more as an AI translators who can actually translate their problems uh, from uh, the current way that they are doing uh, by AI. And there's a lot of education that is needed uh, to do that. On climate as well, I feel that uh, a big uh, innovation uh, specifically can happen where there's a large scale education because climate is it, a lot about behavior change as well. It's not everything is a behavior change, but climate uh, needs that uh, far more. Uh, and that's where uh, one of the uh, startups that I'm associated with is working on in educating uh, people in the corporation. Uh, that is where, uh, and people uh, like all kinds of organization are sponsoring. Uh, their colleagues, employees, to actually go ahead and learn about what climate change can do. Because that eventually would build pathways for these maybe 100,000 new entrepreneurs uh, who will come in and start innovating on, uh, on climate. So I feel that's, uh, that's a need of the hour and very fundamental uh, before even we end up into uh, deploying for uh, climate services. Uh, that would be my views, uh, Puru, on the uh, on the whole climate uh, innovation and how non-state actors can uh, take the way forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think great uh, lesson: being educated, being aware, and how do you use technologies to really take the take the responsibility as well in our own for climate change. Uh, so, Hill, let me come back to you. Uh, so, BMGF has been a leader in championing DPI globally. Uh, what are the lessons that you have learned uh, through or as an BMGF along the way to drive impact? Yeah, I mean, we, we continue to be strong believers in DPI, uh, predominantly because of the tangible benefits that we have seen countries achieve over a period of time. Uh, there, are, there are multiple factors that lead to uh, some of these core challenges that we talk about in the context of DPI, and I'll include DPGs also in the same uh, dialogue or discussion right now. Um, I'll just focus on two or three of them uh, in the interest of time. First of all, we, we definitely need better collaboration. Uh, and let me explain this. Uh, I'll take a sub-Saharan Africa example around digital health solutions. Last year, there was a mapping that we carried out for our work, and we came across close to 800 plus digital health applications that were active in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, less than 50% of them scaled up in any form, forget nationally. Uh, and most of these applications, roughly about 70%, were being funded by the donor agencies, multilaterals, multi bilaterals, uh, I think clearly there's a need for us to start collaborating much better in order to maximize the gains from some of these investments. Uh, I have to acknowledge uh, the Norwegian government because they've, they're among the lead countries which have really backed the DPI and DPG work, not just through uh, DPGA, but many other initiatives that have been going on. Uh, and somewhere, we all need to join hands uh, to ensure that we th this pilotitis that we keep talking about just doesn't exist going forward. Otherwise, the fragmentation that Vikal was talking about 
we are never going to solve that problem. Um, so that's one. Second, uh, very important aspect, as we, uh, I mean, just taking DPG as an example and a plethora of digital uh, or health digital public goods exist today globally, that's actually great. Uh, I think we've done a great job of creating a lot of options for uh, countries and organizations to adopt. Uh, what is really lacking is a local ecosystem uh, to support some of that. And I'll just take DHIS2 as an example. Um, it's phenomenal the way DHIS2 is being leveraged today across the world. And not many people may know this, but the largest implementation of DHIS2 is actually in India, in a single state, Uttar Pradesh. So that itself is the largest implementation of DHIS2. Uh, having said that, today, government of U Uttar Pradesh will struggle to run an efficient procurement process to get a vendor organization uh, that can help manage and sustain the platform because there are just two or three organizations at best who are familiar with DHIS2 in India. Uh, this is clearly an example of what needs to be done uh, because the government procurement process is more or less similar in my view across the world. You do need those uh, three to four proposals at least to come in for you to run that process efficiently. Uh, and this is uh, sort of a vendor lock-in situation that you get into if you don't invest uh, time and effort to build that local ecosystem in the country or at least at the regional level for sure. So that's the second big learning and we are now focusing on ensuring that uh, ecosystem development in the countries that we are supporting is, is a very critical part of our uh, investment scope itself. Uh, third and final thing, which is going back to what I was referring to in terms of uh, the commitment that is required, uh, it's also a significant investment, right? So um, I, I think many of the low-income countries and um, in actually many of the middle-income countries as well, uh, will not have the required level of resourcing for uh, DPIs to be deployed in their respective countries. Uh, can there be better financing options that can be made available? Uh, restructuring some of the existing mechanisms. Uh, clearly, the lending organizations have a role to play here. But beyond that, even uh, countries and and especially the, and that's why the G20 and G7 platforms are important, right? Because that's where the real financial assistance could come in. Uh, and the technical know-how. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm really glad to see how much uh, is being offered by each country, including India, uh, uh, leveraging the G20 platform, uh, but offering that technical assistance to other countries. Uh, we don't want any person to go through the same uh, set of challenges, reinvent the wheel, if there are ways for us to learn from uh, not necessarily the mistakes, but also success stories of other countries, I think it's a great opportunity. Uh, yeah, I, I think I'll summarize it over there. Thank you. It's very well summarized. I think that's where the learnings from uh, countries which possibly have gone through various uh, the journey all across how can uh, countries really maybe optimize on resources as they really scale up on DPIs. But thank you so much, Sohail, for sharing. Uh, let's kind of uh, go and we, uh, by the way, amazing discussion uh, from all of you, amazing thoughts came up. Uh, and I will not like say summarize, but then let me just carry on and let me invite the co-chairs now and uh, uh, possibly see how they would like to kind of see the, summarize the discussion or maybe possibly like to present their views. Um, let me speak, uh, let me uh, bring in uh, Mr. Nirina. He is the Chief Digital Officer, uh, Ministry of Digital Development, Digital Transformation, Post and Telecommunications from Madagascar. Uh, Mr. Nirina, if you can please summarize your views. Okay. So, okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the, the government of uh, India for the organization of this event. I think that uh, we can share to each other our best practice. 
Uh, Madagascar is not uh, only the movie, <laughs> it is also uh, an island like the Mauritius. So I would like to thank the speakers. Uh, your intervention are so inspiring. And I uh, think that uh, the data are really of value. Uh, concerning Madagascar, I know you have a project to give an unique identifier number to all Malagasy people. So, and based on this unique identifier, we want to build an interoperability between different sectors, namely the health sector. And we are at the beginning of the project. However, in this uh, sector of health, we have some projects already successful, like the digitalization of vaccination certificate. And we are starting the project of uh, telemedicine for the whole country. As part of our strategy, we focus on user needs rather than the tools. Uh, to conclude, uh, according to a proverb, a wise man learns from his mistakes. But uh, a very wise man learns from the mistakes of others. So I am here to learn from your experience, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Mirima. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, let me now invite uh, Mr. Uh, Herath, uh, Mr. Kanaka Herath, State Minister of Technology, Minister of Technology, uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, thank you, Puru, for the invitation. Uh, we are actually concluding an important session on the digital uh, public infrastructure, which is, I think, vital for uh, ease of living, right? Uh, digital health and climate change uh, in DPI solution would play a major role uh, in coming years to come uh, due to the challenges we are facing, especially in the sectors, uh, and also it will impact human as well as animal lives and also the ecosystem. So that is very important. So today, in this session, it was very important to share the experience uh, from the speakers and their challenges and their knowledge is very important to us. So uh, our coach uh, uh, mentioned, uh, mentioned about the Madagascar DPI project experience and how he's uh, willing to learn from here. And also, uh, Ms. Martini, our ambassador, Norwegian ambassador, uh, she talked about the importance of an alliance and also about the climate change and how uh, they uh, contribute to the world by uh, collecting data, especially on uh, uh, ocean data and also from the satellite uh, data that is very important. And also uh, she mentioned that it is time to invest on uh, climate change that is very important to all of us. So that is, I think, uh, the experience we get from this session. And also uh, the experience of uh, Suhail uh, Bidani uh, 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 shared the experience in uh, lessons learning, uh, lessons learned globally. And uh, that is also very important to us. And also uh, Vikal, he talked about his in, uh, innovation which uh, leverage with the Indian uh, national DPI. So, from all these speakers, I think uh, we uh, and all, this, uh, all of us will learn something uh, from the experience. So let me just go through some of the DPIs which we are trying to implement in Sri Lanka. Uh, Sri Lankan government has undertaken a journey to accelerate uh, the digitalization uh, in Sri Lanka. So digital economic uh, framework 2030 uh, will be launched this November. Uh, with the blessing of His Excellency the President. And uh, the most important project in our ministry right now uh, is the uh, unique digital ID project, Sri Lankan unique uh, digital ID project. We have recognized it as uh, mandatory for digital transformation of Sri Lanka. Uh, and Sri Lankan uh, UDI or Sri Lankan unique digital ID uh, project is uh, live example of a DPI adaptation in Sri Lanka. So the uh, MOSIP is used in the proposed ID management system. And we have started the 
primary uh, procurement processes and will go live by end of uh, 2024, that's our uh, target. And, uh, and at this junction, I would uh, like to appreciate the support extended to this project by uh, Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi and the Indian government uh, for funding this project. And now I would like to highlight the health uh, information and climate uh, change initiatives that the government of Sri Lanka has undertaken. Uh, we are working closely with uh, Bill and uh, Melinda Gates Foundation uh, on climate change uh, policies and uh, Ministry of Technology in collaboration with uh, the Ministry of Health has uh, developed a roadmap for digital health architecture blueprint. And also uh, Ministry of uh, Technology is in the process of designing and development of a health registry uh, for the health services. And, uh, and also we have developed the hospital health information management system that has been implemented in national hospitals, teaching hospitals, provincial and district hospitals, uh, and also based uh, hospitals, and some of the selected divisional hospitals throughout the country. So out of uh, 22 million of the Sri Lankan population, uh, over 8 million patients are being registered right now, and around 19 million uh, electronic me uh, medical records are maintained within the system. And uh, right now we are in the process of design and the development of a digital health atlas. That is the Sri Lankan health experience. So I wouldn't take much of a time. Finally, I would like to thank all the uh, co-chair and all the panelists and uh, 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 for these invaluable inputs. And uh, this, I think this panel discussed interesting as well as educational uh, uh, this was an educational session. So, and uh, it, it's, it has been an honor to be here at this uh, summit. And also would like to thank the government of India for inviting me and the Sri Lanka delegation uh, to this summit. And uh, thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you so much, Mr. Heather. Thank you for sharing. And, yeah, please clap for the amazing initiatives which are being undertaken in Sri Lanka. Really good, great transformation happening. Uh, okay, so the reason why we kind of still uh, finished early was to take up some questions from the audience, if you have. Um, and rather, one thing to tell, uh, Mr. Herath did not even have the lunch. You just had salads so that we start in time and finish in time. So please, uh, questions. Looks like everything is settled very well. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, okay. Yeah, great. Uh, uh, one small question for Mr. Vikalp. Uh, you talked about building UPI for uh, healthcare and uh, integrating hospitals in diagnostic lab. But if a common man goes to the diagnostic lab, every lab has their own standards of minimum and maximum per permissible uh, normal uh, test range. So is there anything going on to standardize those? Because the citizen get confused. When he go to lab A, he get a different result. Go to lab B, he get a different result. You uh, asked a very, very important question. And I think uh, I'm a, uh, j just for every, I'm a developer myself. I code. Uh, and I think uh, when you uh, look at machines, machines have to understand all of these values in a standardized way, like we use in case of financial ecosystems or anything else. And you said absolutely right, uh, at least in our country, uh, there are different standards and different way of representation. Hemoglobin, somebody would say something else. Uh, so uh, innovative startups like us, what we are doing is we are building models around all of these various representation of vital so that we can collate them and give a consolidated view uh, to the users and uh, uh, patients and users and doctors. But there are many standards that are available today globally. Uh, so one of the standards that we follow that is called SNOMED CT for all kinds of uh, diagnosis, symptoms, uh, many of these uh, medications that we do, the way uh, we prescribe health-related data. There is a strong data exchange formats as well. Uh, so one of them is, which is largely use is called fire 
and uh, most of these uh, softwares leverage that as a format to do interaction and interchange. There are many uh, codes such as ICD-10 where uh, you specifically prescribe uh, a diagnosis to a code so that all of this information can be digitally consumed. Uh, so these are all available and are evolving. Uh, but the unfortunate reality is uh, it's very hard uh, at the ground level, at the, uh, the fragmentation is so huge and uh, uh, the technology understanding is so low across all of these uh, ecosystems that, that we are far uh, from achieving that level of uh, uh, interaction capability that we see in the other industries. But uh, the good thing is these standards are there. If we start following them, uh, you go to lab one or lab two or you go to any doctor, all of this information can be collated uh, beautifully. Uh, yeah, that's, that's why I said uh, health is a pretty complex subject, uh, not necessarily. Uh, the curve will be very different uh, on the way it will be adopted. So if I may just add, uh, actually, your question is two parts in my view. One what Vikal responded to, uh, and just very specifically from a lab perspective, the lawing standards are now prescribed, and uh, with all the uh, lab information management service providers adopting it, that part of the problem should get resolved over a period of time, and hopefully soon enough. The second part of the problem is also about uh, the ranges being different is also a result of the uh, diagnostic equipment itself being different. So I think that's a slightly longer one to solve for, but the good part is that uh, it should not affect the longitudinal health records that Vikalp is referring to. Uh, we should be able to get consensus on bringing little more standardization on the equipment side as well, but that's work in progress. and. It's, it's a global challenge, not just in India. Thank you, Sohil, for adding up. There was one more question. That's it, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so um, this is very, very interesting topic, uh, you know, health and climate change. I think we discussed less on the climate change, which is a little complex. But I, I start from what we help you started asking, how many of us know about, you know, the medical history or our vitals and... Uh, the prescriptions or whatever. But I think uh, how, when we talk about health, it has to do a lot with the food, what you eat. How much we know what we eat? What is the history of the food and where from it is coming? And that's where the connecting health to the agriculture is something important, right? And that's where the DPI can play a, a major role in terms of where from the food is coming, where it is produced, what we eat, and then we, we link it to the health. Good suggestion. Anyone wants to add? So I think uh, uh, what uh, you said is right. I mean, uh, a lot of health earlier was all about uh, preventive less and uh, more about uh, solutioning, right, if, if there's something wrong. But today, if we look at uh, how things are changing, uh, most of us or many of us would be using uh, uh, watches uh, to see our heart rate. I mean, just five years ago, uh, we were not doing that. And now these watches are capable to actually tell you uh, whether uh, you are stressed or not. And same is, uh, as sir, you mentioned about food. People are logging about what kind of food they are eating. You go to any buffet, you can see there is a calorie uh, marker that talks about how many calories uh, this food item is. So health uh, eventually, I think, would uh, go a lot towards uh, preventive slash precautionary uh, side as well, and uh, all of all of these things will definitely uh, get incorporated, uh, and that's where I think yeah, as you mentioned, DPI slash states can can help a lot because uh, this this is all a lot of data and a lot of interactions uh, all across. But yeah, that's it. Any more questions? All right. Thank you so much for being such a nice audience. And thank you again, all the panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's have a round of applause for the entire panel, everybody. And may I request our moderator, Mr. Purushottam Kaushik, to please present a memento. 
and a token of our appreciation to both the co-chairs, starting with Mr. Narina, Chief Digital Officer from the Ministry of Digital Development, Digital Transformation, Posts and Telecommunications of Madagascar. I think we can do better than that. Come on, everybody, a round of applause. And another memento and token of our appreciation to Mr. Kanaka Hairath, State Minister of Technology from the Ministry of Technology in Sri Lanka. May I also request our moderator to present a token of our gratitude to Ms. Martine Botheim, Acting Ambassador, Norway to India. Thank you very much for joining us. Next, can we have Mr. Suhail Bidani, Lead Digital, BMGF. Thank you very much for gracing the occasion and sharing your expertise with us. And finally, to Mr. Vikalp Sahani, founder and CEO of Eka Care. And may I request Mr. Herath to please present a memento to our moderator, Mr. Purushottam Kaushik, for moderating that very interesting session. And may I request the panel to please step forward for a group picture before we conclude. We have a in very interesting panel discussion on uh, digital agriculture ecosystem coming up. So may we request you all to kindly be seated. We have two panel discussions remaining. We will take a tea break after the next panel discussion. And we're going to take a minute to switch over to our next set of speakers on the stage. So kindly bear with us. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for our next panel discussion on uh, digital agriculture ecosystem here at the DPI Summit. This session will delve into the advancements in technology and its impact on agriculture, including mobile applications, sensor-based technologies, precision farming, and more. We will explore how these innovations are transforming the agriculture ecosystem for enhancing productivity and sustainability. We are honored to have an esteemed panel of experts for the upcoming discussion. And leading the session as the chairperson is Ms. Damshen Zangmo, the Deputy Chief ICT Officer from GovTech Agency Bhutan. Let's welcome her with a round of applause. With the extensive knowledge and experience in the field, she brings valuable insights to the table. Furthermore, we have Mr. Rajiv Chawla, the Chief Knowledge Officer from the Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare India as the moderator. And in our exceptional lineup of speakers for this panel, panel discussion, may I invite on stage Dr. Anil Rai, the Assistant Director General ICT at the Indian Council of Agricultural Research. Dr. Rai's focus on precision agriculture and spatial modeling uh, showcases his commitment to advancing agricultural practices through innovative technologies. Our next panelist is Mr. Chengal Navin Twarakhavi, a senior digital agricultural specialist at the Asian Development Bank. 
and with his extensive expertise in supporting agricultural operations with digital technologies, he brings a wealth of knowledge to the discussion. Our next panelist is Dr. M. L. Jat, a distinguished agronomist and global research program director at ECRISAT. With his vast experience and strategic guidance, he has contributed significantly to the advancement of agricultural systems science. And last but not the least, we have the honor to have with us Ms. Hen Hatav, the Ecosystem Development Manager at uh, Growing Isle, Israel. Her dedication to leveraging technology for addressing global challenges has been instrumental in fostering growth within Israel's ag tech ecosystem. Let's have a round of applause for the entire panel on stage. And over to Mr. Chawla to lead the proceedings. Thanks a lot. So with your permission, can I start? Yes. So uh, over the last two days, we are nearly two days now, we learned some important lessons. We learned that there is a difference between a DPI and an e-governance project or an IT project that an IT project is necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition for a system to be called DPI. We understood that the DPI has very large number of essential components. And why I'm saying this is because our theme of discussion today is evolving around DPI and not around e-governance or IT projects. We learned that unlike a normal IT project, which is monolithic in nature, your DPIs have to be modular, they have to be population scale. We heard in health that the data standardization is very important, that the interoperability is very important, that it is also important that the private sector can innovate. But finally, the range of services, the innovations comes only from the private sector. We also learned in DPI that the way DPI should get developed, and which means protocols and not platforms, there should be no hurdles for private sector to participate. We should not create artificial barriers. Now, with this background, before I go to each of the panelists and we discuss some questions, I want to tell you in about three to four minutes about a very ambitious project which Government of India has taken up, and it is called AgriStack. Now, stack, of course, has become, uh, you know, it's a fashion to say, so therefore, we normally fall in line. So you have India Stack, which are, of course, sector agnostic DPIs, then you have health tech, which we heard, uh, we saw the innovations which are taking place. We also heard about the education stack, and this is agriculture stack. So in the agriculture stack, uh, the idea is that like health stack, and using the India stack, which is of course the Aadhaar and other things which we have already heard, can we have a DPI which allows private sector participation where government confines its role to data provisioning, policies, regulations, standards, and then of course things like what in agriculture sector they call as UFSI, Unified Farmers Service Interface, the way we talk UPI, Unified Payment Interface, or UHI, Unified Health Interface, which is basically a set of APIs and the standards, because any API cannot work without standards. So the Agri stack is therefore a set of data, and I will talk about data, very interesting data. Uh, the policies, the regulations, the data exchange, and I'll talk about data exchange, and then the consent layer. The consent, so before I come to the consent layer, the three foundational registries, which are to be created as a data layer, are three very important questions. Are you a farmer? 
So there are about 15 crore, 150 million farmers in the country. Those who hold land, and I'm talking in the first phase about those who are holding land. Are you a farmer? If yes, which all lands you own? And I'm talking about farming land. And mind you, a farmer has about five pieces of land. So we have 75 crore, 750 million parcels of land in this country. So do you have a land? If yes, where are those lands? And that means the coordinates of those pieces of land. And what is the crop you grow? And mind you, you grow three different crops in a year. Now this is a foundational three registries. Are you a farmer? What are the lands you own? And what are the crops you grow? And all these three registries are to be provided as a basic responsibility of the governments. That's the more difficult point is that this data is maintained by the state governments and not by the union government, because agriculture and land is a state subject. So under the agri stack, three, these three foundational registries are to be formed by the various state governments. They would be based on a, uh, on a data standard. And they, of course, would be uh, subject to any data which would be given through the agri stack to the private players for delivery of services would, of course, be based on the consent. Whose consent? The farmer's consent. You just cannot give any, any land data of a farmer to any private tech or agri tech or even government agency without the consent of the farmer. I mean, it is politically also difficult and even otherwise difficult if I disclose all the lands which are held by a farmer. It, can, it, can, it has a huge nuisance power. So therefore, the land data cannot be shared without the consent of the farmer. The final component, and then I'll go to my panel is, is what is called data exchange. And in the morning, we heard Alka Mishra, where they are making a data exchange. What is this data exchange? If you have to deliver a use case, these three foundational registries are not enough. Where is your land? What have you grown? Are you a farmer? Is not enough. I need to know the weather data. I need to know the soil data. I need to know the information like satellite data. I need to know the history of the pest and disease. I need to know the financial records of that farmer for me to give him a service. For example, if the farmer asks you, will I get a pest attack? Now, obviously, it is not enough for me to say his let long is this. I need lots of other data. Now, this data is not there with the government, so it will be with various other service providers. And if anybody has to help a farmer, all these data have to be brought together. And this can obviously be brought together by only collaborating with each other, where one service provider provides the data to other at a cost. So the agree exchange, agree data exchange, is therefore a marketplace where this data would be shared amongst various service providers, the one who handles satellite data would give satellite data, the one who has set up the weather station will give weather stations at a cost. Now, with this background of AgriStack, I now turn to my uh, four panelists, and we have about five issues to discuss, which we thought that we should discuss. And the first issue is, and I'll invite Ms. Hen and then after that, Mr. ML, how can a DPI solution, and I'm talking about DPI solution, I'm not talking about a normal e-governance solution in, in, in agriculture. How can DPI solution contribute to improving agriculture productivity, sustainability, and food security in developing countries? So Ms. Hen, Ms. Hen is from Israel, and she handles some major responsibility there. Thank you for the great question. So coming from Israel, a, land, a country that has been able to transform even desert lands into fertile lands, I'm very excited to bring our unique perspective about DPIs and agriculture. And I must say that it's such a, an amazing subject. And just being here in the last couple of days with my fellow panelists and hearing about 
all the things that are happening, it's truly excited and um, I'm really happy to be here, so thank you very much. So as you mentioned, DPI, um, unlike a regular IT system, has a lot of potential in agriculture. It's about combining data and information from both the government and the private sector, uh, such as startups and the farmers, all into one ecosystem that um, fosters innovation. So in your question, you asked about in the context of developing nations. So I think it's easier to maybe just imagine a farmer that is uh, living in a remote place, having the same access to information and the best practices as if they were surrounded by a group of experts. So DPI in its inclusivity can really make this into um, in this vision into a reality. So I think most countries by now have somewhat of agricultural extension services, but by digitalizing these kind of services, we are really able to break down the barriers of distance and language and even uh, knowledge. So a little bit about Israel's innovation system that we've managed to create a, a really um, living uh, innovation ecosystem. We have startups that are bringing all kinds of cutting edge solutions from precision ag to automation and robotics and pollination and the, the list just goes on and on. Um, to a really supportive government and also to the farmers who are usually the ones that are hardest to reach. However, the farmers in Israel have had a relatively good experience with technology ever since the invention of the drip irrigation back in the 1950s. And there are also guides that are guiding them on what are the best practices to use this kind of technologies. So data can really give both the farmers in Israel and the farmer we spoke about earlier uh, the countless possibilities to use digital tools in order to transform today's farm management. So it's all about an ecosystem that fosters innovation, that involves all the different stakeholders, and using data from different places in order to create a resilient ag, ag tech and agricultural sector uh, that can feed our nation and also answer pressing global challenges such as the world food crisis. So thank you for this very thank great you, question. Thank you, Ms. Han. Mr. Jared? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. I think when we talk about agriculture and the farmers, and that to the smallholder farmers, we are dealing with the diversity and complexity. And there are a lot of actors and sectors involved in agriculture. It's just not the production, but then the whole value chain. And that's where uh, the role of uh, DPI comes into the picture. Uh, we've been uh, dealing all the uncertainties and the risks and growing risk of the climate change, for example. And that's where the right uh, information at the right time and their delivery you know, at the right place is something important. But, uh, and there are players around, for example, ICTs and things like that, but uh, uh, we don't have a structured uh, data, uh, you know, the governance structure, the quality of the data, no standard protocols. So whatever we use, I think uh, the people are making use that different people collecting data and then there is no, I mean, you were talking about the land records and things. So when we talk about bigas, kathas or, or biswas or whatever, I mean, even the biga depends where you are. And that's why but, but it makes a very, very complex system. So I think uh, the, the DPI has a bigger role to play uh, in terms of agriculture because that connects to the multiple sectors. And I think the data standardization for that interoperability, uh, interoperability and uh, the sharing mechanism that will create an opportunity for agriculture data exchange under the DPI. So that's what for me is DPI is. So if I now ask the question that you just asked uh, uh, Rajiv about is there a solution like that? Oh, there is very one interesting, uh, one interesting solution which is the satellite data. So if you think about uh, NASA satellite data and the Sentinel open data. Uh, this data has been there since I would say 2000, 2000s. But it really started to be used when they adopted the open standards and, and they made the data available for startups to really you know, use. So today if you look at every other startup depends on that remote sensing data. So, uh, and so you know, if you, now if you Take that example and see what other such hidden data sets are out there. There is so much more remote sensing data available. 
there is so many more models of agriculture uh, you know that are available and, and you know we need to kind of unlock them and I think if we do that uh, you know we will be a lot more ahead so so I think that's when one good example uh, in the way that how it inspired uh, startups another uh, from an ADP point of view, uh, we are very much driven by the DPI philosophy. So in our current projects in Himachal Pradesh and Nepal, uh, we are uh, adopting a similar such uh, approach. Uh, our projects are inspired by farmers' needs, driven by the you know, back end, which is open source and open uh, you know, uh, standards. And uh, in the middle, we want to encourage private sector to come and play their role and scale the solution. So, so, uh, so that's uh, one thing. Now, the challenges that we see are, uh, you know, we need to uh, put more efforts in improving empathy for the for the solution, uh, sh and 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 build capacity to ensure that everybody now uh, knows that there's a new way to work, a new way of offering solutions. Right? So, I think uh, those are the challenges that stand ahead of us, and I'm pretty sure, uh, with the collaborative spirit that this summit brings forth, we can we can be there. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, in Indian Council of Agriculture Research, uh, which is under the Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers' Welfare, uh, we have initiated a program of digital ag agriculture extension. It's not DPI, because it's, it does not have all the features of DPI. As you rightly said, we are still under the process of developing a DPI in form of agri stack. So it's not actually DPI, but it started in 2021, we have started this program, which is known as Kisan Sarthi. Kisan means farmers. Uh, uh, Kisan is a Hindi word. Uh, it means farmers. And Sarthi has an acronym that is a system for system of agri-information resource auto transmission and technology hub interface. Basically, uh, this system uh, is being developed uh, by the council in collaboration with Digital India Corporation, which is a part of MIT. And uh, they developed a digital platform as per our requirement uh, for transmission of the technologies developed by 113 ICR institutions and 74 agriculture universities which are there in the country. And uh, then uh, this is being, technology is being transferred to the farmers uh, through our uh, farm science center uh, which is called Krishi Vigyan Kendras in Hindi. Uh, there are seven, 731 farm science centers are there uh, across the country. Uh, every district has at least one Krishi Vigyan Kendra. So uh, that has been transferred through them because uh, we need to transfer the technologies in their local language of the farmers and the uh, problem, localized problem, is specific problem to the agriculture. As it's already told that agriculture is very complex and it's very localized in terms of problems and uh, it has affected by many factors. And uh, so presently we have a multimedia, multilingual solution for transfer of technology and getting feedback from the farmers also uh, regarding the, their R&D requirements, what is there in the field, what are the problems where we need to take up research. This is one part of it. But uh, now we are going to connect with uh, other departments also uh, along with the our department because uh, since DPI is not there, so we are just uh, waiting for uh, getting the DPI in form of a stack. So through that, actually, we would like to connect it at least for the farmer's registry. Presently, what we are doing is we are taking the information from the farmers only about their lands, land sizes, what crop they are growing, uh, which may not be that much reliable because it is just after registering the farmers on the system. Around 8.5 million farmers are already registered across the country. It's uh, working in the, uh, different languages. Uh, it's working. So we are waiting for AgriStack to build up. So we'll connect it to the farmer registry so that we'll have accurate uh, land record system. Then the crop registry, which is there. Uh, Chawlaji already told about it. So then we'll, we'll able to know the needs of the farmer, what are the services they require, how much production we are likely to get uh, from their crops, and uh, how much credits they need. So like that, uh, we'd like to have this uh, system and that information which will be collected 
through the platform, we are doing some analysis and uh, having an early warning system kind of thing. But uh, accuracy will come only when it is connected to uh, a DPI solution, which we are building in the country. Thank you very much, sir. So what Anil says is that I can develop something, but unless I am a part of an ecosystem, and that ecosystem provides good quality of data, I cannot be very effective. So I, I could not have agreed with you more. I come to the next question. In case of agriculture, you require multiple sectors to work together. Let's take case of a UPI. You have somebody transferring the money and you need some banker. But unfortunately, agriculture is not so simple. So you need collaboration with government, the private sector, and when I say private sector, it includes startups. Uh, solutions require actually, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately because AI ML models are not so simple. They can also harm farmers. We have to be careful, but, but the value comes from only those models. How do you otherwise give advice? There is no simple mathematical formula uh, to find out whether there would be a pest attack, for example. So when you need these uh, startups, you need other stakeholders, and you need, for example, you also need the farmers. Uh, Naveen, in your view, what are the challenges? I mean, I'm sure each of these actors must be wanting to join hand together and work in this virgin sector and, of course, give value to the farmers and give value to themselves also. So may I ask you as to what is your opinion about why is this sector not picking up? Uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, thank you, Rajiji. I think uh, what makes DPA very interesting to me is that it makes all the right, all the stakeholders play to their strengths, right? So when, when individual stakeholders play to their strengths, you, you foster innovation. But then, as you said, there are challenges, right? So I think, uh, let me maybe go by, uh, stakeholder by stakeholder and see what, what, what can we kind of pull out. I think the first and foremost is uh, you know, the, the, this idea of digital identity. I think, Rajiv, you mentioned about AgriStack and the fact that we want to uh, you know, make farmer data, his plot, his crop data accessible. Uh, but then the challenges and the questions remain as to uh, how does the consent layer work within the infrastructure? In, in coordination with other uh, stacks, such as you know UPI and other other such things, so I think uh, uh, there are also privacy concerns, as you rightly mentioned. Many of the farmers are smallholders, extremely vulnerable to economic, social, societal stresses. So, how do we ensure that uh, this this consent layer works effectively? Is, is one concern. Uh, second is there is a, a lack of data, or at least a lack of open data, right? So, uh, for example, we going into the future cannot talk of agriculture and sustainability if we do not address the nexus between agriculture, climate change, and natural resources. Our resources are degrading very fast. Uh, climate change is becoming more uncertain, more extreme, and, uh, and, 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 and we need to really ensure that you know, this data is provided in the, in the right way because you know, it can very e easily erode the trust in the structure otherwise. Right? So that's the second aspect. The third uh, thing is, uh, as you rightly mentioned, uh, there is knowledge delivery, just like data delivery. There is a need for knowledge delivery. Now we have, you know, a lot of like pest control models, right? Like AI-based models, physics-based models. Similarly, when we tomorrow go into drone spraying, uh, you need to be worried about the wind speed. You know, all of these aspects to ensure that the crop is actually getting sprayed correctly, right? So there are various aspects involved there, and the question is. How do we ensure that the models being generated, whether by the research institution, whether by the government, they are actually right? They actually work, you know, because we can't expose them at scale to smallholders without validating their efficacy. You know, uh, that's the next one. The fourth one is uh, lack of startups in critical segments. You know, we have crowding of startups in specific areas where there is, you know, avenue for making money, but not so in other places. So I think we need to have, uh, you know, such things. For example, logistics. For example. In warehousing, uh, you know, we need that. The, the, again, going to startups, one other thing is we need to carefully look at how to change the barrier of competition that startups currently have. Today, the barrier of competition is data. You know, they use data as a barrier. Now we, through DPI, we need to slowly shift 
uh, as we have the nuanced conversation on what is data and who owns the data, we need to shift the barrier of competition from data holding, for a lack of another word, to quality in services and quality in products. And I think that shift needs to happen. Um, last but not the least, DPA itself needs to be funded. You know, and I think uh, yesterday's discussion about how Aadhaar and UPI for have re returned, you know, the ROA has been so good. And in terms of societal value, you know, you cannot measure it. And I think uh, inst you know, inst like, uh, banks like ADB, you know, we'll be very excited to, uh, to, to work on, on this. So, so I think these are some of the aspects on a, each stakeholder basis that I would like to put forth for uh, discussion. Thank you. I, I fully agree with you. Uh, I think we should all fund the foundational layer of agri stack, which is data and good quality of data. And I must bring to your notice that under the agri stack, for example, there is about four and a half to five thousand crore of funding from the ministry for agri stack. The ADB is funding, the World Bank, the technical assistance, OMDR is wanting to do. So I think now people have understood that, yes, it is a complicated sector. World Economic Forum, for example, is wanting to collaborate with the government. They understand that on one side, farmers would gain. On the other side, the private sector would also gain. But I think we have to play the catalytic role and create the first necessary condition for a DPI, uh, namely the good quality of data. Uh, two more things are important. One is the regulation. What if something goes wrong? The f in case of health, the physical doctors are giving advisory. But in case of land, you want advisory from AIML models. What if something goes wrong? And therefore, good regulations will have to come. We should not be a barrier for our agri, agri tech to come. But at the same time, we should de-risk farmers. And then, of course, we'll have to see that startups also mature on their model. But then we can't expect them to mature unless we give them good quality of data. I go to the next question, and I ask Ms. Hen, and then, of course, Mr. Jat, and Anil, you also, all three of you, about what do you feel is the role of data in agriculture? While you have been speaking, all of you have spoken in bits and pieces. I would like to know, is data so critical in agriculture? And if yes, why? from the point of view of farmers, number one, and from the point of view of the government who has to drive the benefits programs to the farmers, what is the role of our data? So we start from Ms. Han, we go to Mr. Jat, and then we go to Mr. Anil Rai. I think that is the main question of this panel, because the way I can share for my role as the Ag Tech Ecosystem Development Manager at the Israel Innovation Institute, then data has a crucial, a crucial role in ag tech and also in the way we promote the ecosystem. So to start with the first part of your question, when we are looking at the farmers, then farmers today are, are data-driven decision makers. So we have an ecosystem of startups that are able to provide the farmers with, with real-time data to help them make better decisions, whether it's uh, data about um, the soil health or about the condition of the crops or whether it's about, and it can be anything from, uh, and different, using all different kinds of technologies from sensors in the ground to drones in the sky to from satellite and all the technologies that were mentioned here. Um, but all of these things are really helping the farmers to make the best um, practices and also to optimize their yield. So this is all based on data. So when we're looking at the farmer data is really a crucial part of it. And for the second part of the question, um, to talk about the role of data from the policymakers' view, so I can only speak of the way that we are looking at the data at the Israel Innovation Institute. And our uh, unique position in the ecosystem allows us to really meet with all the different, uh, with the startups and the farmers, and to meet with everybody in the ecosystem and understand what are the challenges and also the opportunities that the ecosystem is facing. And by doing that, it allows us to really, um, really indicate what are the activities that we are going to do in order to promote this ecosystem. So in a way, when you look at it, 
it's a little bit like doing business development, but for the whole Israeli Arctic ecosystem. We are able to recognize what are the gaps and then do activities that answer these kind of needs. So it, these are the needs by the whole ecosystem. Um, so I can sum up and say that DPI and data, um, it's not just a mean of something that helps us when we're looking at agriculture. It's really the backbone of everything. So this is a really great question and it's rele really relevant. Thank you. Um, so as I indicated earlier, when we talk about the data, data is really a new uh, treasure or the novel currency which is being traded globally and then there are sectors which are really using data in an effective way, for example, medical sciences. But I think in agriculture, we are dealing again with the diversity and everybody is trying to fix the problem and help the farmers. There's a lot of mushrooming happening and everybody is uh, collecting data in their own way and there is no harmonized system or regulated system. Also, when we talk about the data in agriculture, I think, uh, uh, and that's why this global summit is something important. So we should not be looking things from a country perspective, but I think we should be looking from a multi-country perspective because many of the things in agriculture uh, are cross-country and transboundary. Uh, air doesn't need a passport. The insect doesn't need a passport. The disease doesn't need a passport. Uh, glaciers are uh, melting somewhere and flooding in some country. I think the, the interoperability of the within country or between country data is also something important. So uh, when we talk about agriculture and DPI in agriculture sector, which uh, essentially uh, aims to create uh, like a one verified source of truth of the farmer data, which is uh, verified by the governments. And uh, also you can create the foundational IDs or the payment systems and then use the data when we do these surveys and how we collect and what are the you know, ethics and things and uh, usability, whether they have consent of the data, everybody's uh, collecting those things. So I think uh, uh, from that respect, data is uh, something important, but I think we cannot develop things overnight. It takes time. So when we talk about DPI, we need to think about where we want to reach and then to reach there, how we reach. So we, we need to develop a phased build on approach and I think in that context, uh, if we start that, so first thing it comes to the DPI must be co-created with the broader uh, sec uh, private sector, public sector, startups are everyone. So the co-creation is something uh, very, very important. The second one is a farmer-centric approach should be adopted when we talk about uh, DPI in agriculture, which uh, the huge cases which are prioritized uh, for, uh, from the perspective of maximization of the societal benefits. Uh, the third one is on uh, DPI uh, that can be built on reusing uh, the functionality of the established DPI, you know, there are examples, so we, we should not reinvent the wheel. And finally, a sandbox for the agri DPI must be created uh, to test the policies and the technology. So that's what I feel, but I think uh, uh, when we talk about DPI in agriculture, it's a, it's a transboundary. So before I go to Anil, I must give you an example of the loan which goes to the uh, farmers. We have a scheme of Kisan credit card. It's basically a crop loan to the farmers. Uh, as per a study done by RBI, it takes 45 days for a Kisan credit card loan to be given. And the cost of credit, including all type of uh, money to be paid to various actors, non-state actors, is more than 10,000 rupees. We did a pilot with Jan Samarth. Jan Samarth, some of you may know, is Department of Financial Services, Government of India Electronic Initiative, where they provide uh, various type of loans to the citizens. The Jan Samarth is working with a state of Karnataka, which is one of the state in this country, which has all these components of agri stack, including is he a farmer, what crop he has grown, what lands he has. And Jan Samarth takes others' data. Uh, for example, how does the data look from satellite, the land? Uh, what about the Sibyl score, Aadhaar? And I must tell you, 
that the loans in Karnataka by three banks are now being given in less than three minutes. And I would encourage you to, each one of you, to check independently as to how something which used to take 45 days has become three minutes. And the answer is very simple. The answer is good quality of data, and on the top of that, a good IT system to exploit, to exploit that. So the, the, I mean, you, 12 crore farmers take crop loan every year, and if it can be cut from 45 days to two, three minutes, that would be very exciting. I would encourage you. It tells you, like on the Amazon rainforest, how the deforestation is happening, which otherwise you cannot see with the naked eye. Why wouldn't uh, the Ministry of Agriculture use this kind of satellite data at 50 meters resolution and make it happen? Thanks. Thanks, Srivasa. Uh, the first question, uh, and you are correct that long back, uh, we digitized land records. And if I look back, I think I was so foolish in the, in the way I did the work. You can't really create monolithic systems. It had no place for innovation by private sector. It, it was really, really not farmer-centric completely. I mean, it was, of course, but not so much. Uh, then, of course, because it was only used for regulatory purpose, uh, that is only for providing land records and not for developmental purpose, there was nothing like regulation. It was based on an old client-server technology. This was not a population scale. You are aware we face problems. But if you now talk about a DPI in agriculture, where we realize that the data which is being collected or the DPI which is being done is for farmers and the innovations can come only from the private sector. You will have to recreate these systems in such a way which facilitates the private sector to connect. The protocols to be in place, the data standards, the APIs only approach was not there in my mind. Maybe it was too early or maybe that was the mind limitation at that time. So I now find that I mean, if I was to be given a chance to do land records again, which of course I would never be given, and I'm perhaps mentally also sick now to handle such projects, but I'm sure if my mind was in place and if I was given, I would have done it in an entirely different way, the way you guys are talking about. Number two, when you talk about the satellite data, of course, yes, these satellite data and all other open data sets would come on the agri exchange where they can be picked up either free of cost by or on cost by the people who are providing services. But let's understand, Shivasa, that if you have to provide services, satellite data is, is a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition. For example, if I have to give a service to farmer, I need satellite data, but of which location? I need to know where his land is. I should know the coordinates of his land. Uh, you work in a progressive state like Karnataka, and therefore you think all land records are digitized and georeferenced. But if you go to many other states, the lands are not, the property records, the maps are not georeferenced. So the question is, I have a satellite data which is coming, which is free of cost, which is 500 pictures, but do I know where Rajiv Chavla's land is? Because I have to then pick up that portion of the satellite data which corresponds to Rajiv Chavla. So I'm saying, you need all these data sets together, together. And unfortunately, even if one data set is missing, you have a problem. And I think these three core registries, by way of farmer registry, the land registry, and the crop zone registry, would go reasonably long way, along with this data which is either in the open domain or in some marketplace from where it can be bought. Any other questions, please? Hmm. This uh, DPI for agriculture or agri-stack, which uh, you are developing, th this question is addressed to Rajiv Chawla ji. So uh, uh, how you plan to integrate the different stakeholders in agriculture? Like you have pesticide manufacturer, fertilizers, farm equipment manufacturers, then uh, like uh, you have uh, 
besides uh, this stakeholder, there are so many other stakeholders. So how you plan to integrate? You see, the, 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 the agree stack is an enabler. It would create these systems along with what they call as UFSI, Unified Farmer Service Interface, like UPI, which are hooks. Now, these are enabling hooks. You have to come and hook on to this if you are interested in giving solutions. So it is an enabler. It is, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is needed, it is necessary, but it is not sufficient. For example, you are a pesticide provider, but if you don't hook on to this, you don't follow the standards which are there, you will not be able to take the data and then provide services. So therefore, it is an open system. It will not bias against anybody. It will allow everybody to connect. But then we will have to profess. We will have to go and evangelize to the fertilizer section, pesticide people, startups, encourage them that, look, here is a hook. Why don't you connect to that? I mean, we'll have to make it popular. Like you saw in health mission. The health mission ABDM system has come. But there are so many doctors, hospitals who are not interested in connecting or who are indifferent. Look at the ID generation in health. You have just generated 30, 40 crore IDs. So I think that canvassing, making it popular will come, but it will happen after we have put this, this electronic system in place. So I think we are short of time. Uh, I would request you to kindly uh, give your thought process on this. OK. Namaste, everyone. So um, before I begin, I would like to, it's an honor for me to be here today to uh, source this very important session. So I'd like to uh, thank organizers for inviting me to speak and uh, for putting uh, together with very impressive speakers here. So thank you. And uh, just to sum up uh, about this uh, session, uh, what I felt was apart from digitalization in the agriculture sector, sector uh, it's very important to have harmonized data. Harmonized data, the data is crucial. Apart from that, uh, apart from the data, uh, uh, the uh, collaboration with amongst the relevant stakeholders are also crucial. So uh, this is what uh, I understood from the uh, distinguished speakers out here. So uh, before I begin, uh, I would like to uh, Again, uh, on behalf of GovTech Agency and Royal Government of Bhutan, I'd like to express my appreciation to Government of India for uh, initiating such uh, event and for inviting us. And just to uh, briefly uh, mention the floor about uh, initiatives, like digital initiatives being carried out in Bhutan, uh, I just want to highlight a few and take this opportunity and uh, inform the floor uh, what we are doing in digital initiatives. So like uh, in India, we also have national digital identity. It's uh, the status, current status is like we have collected data and it's ongoing. And we do have digital school where e-learning platforms are being provided. Then uh, we have integrated uh, citizen services, uh, it's a uh, coming to ci uh, citizen services uh, uh, system. And then we do have government initiated network where at the grassroots level, uh, it's connected through fiber connections. So these are the, some of the key uh, initiatives uh, GovTech is taking. So uh, just to fit in the session, uh, topic of the session, so I'll just highlight a few uh, agriculture initiatives we are taking. Like we have EPES surveillance system, basically to uh, report pest in the country. Then we do have triple P IMS, which means plant protection product information management system, which provides the record of uh, triple P's. We do have agriculture market information system also. Uh, basically, we have around 26 markets and with uh, 40 products information in this system. And another important uh, system we do have is e-crop advisory app, 
Basically, it's intended for the youth, younger generation, who are passionate about agriculture. So basically, it provides tutorial and uh, the lear it's a learning platform for the youth uh, who are interested in farming and all. So these are the, some of the initiatives we have. So I'll just cut short and then uh, like to uh, just uh, talk more about uh, DPI. So leveraging this uh, digital technologies and establishing uh, robust digital infrastructure, we can really uh, enhance, I mean advance the agriculture sector by uh, in, uh, enhancing productivity and ensuring food security and also to prom uh, by promoting uh, sustainable development. So I'd like to conclude here by saying that DPI in agriculture holds tremendous promise for addressing such challenges uh, we are facing currently uh, in the agriculture sector. So I would like to uh, uh, say that let us embrace the opportunities presented by DPI and strive towards a future where agriculture strives uh, uh, where agriculture thrives and then sustains livelihoods and then feeds the world. Thank you and touch the net. Thank you very much uh, for that discussion. Uh, may I request our moderator, Mr. Rajiv Chawla, to please present a memento and a token of our appreciation to our session chair, Ms. Zangmo, the Deputy Chief ICT Officer from GovTech Agency, Bhutan. Come on, everybody. Let's have a round of applause, everyone. May I request uh, Mr. Chawla to please present a memento to Dr. Anil Rai, the Assistant Director General, ICT, at the Indian Council of uh, Agricultural Research. Next, can we have uh, Mr. Thwara Kavi? Thank you very much for all the expertise you've shared during the panel discussion. We also have a memento for Mr. Dr. M. L. Jat, the distinguished uh, agronomist and global research program director at ICRISAT. And finally, Ms. Hen Hatav, the ecosystem development manager at Growing Isle, Israel. And may I invite Mr. Abhishek Singh, uh, President and CEO of NEGD and Mighty, to please come up and present a memento to Mr. Rajiv Chawla for moderating this panel discussion on digital agriculture ecosystem. Thank you so much to the panel. Can we have you all in the front for a group photograph before we conclude? Thank you very much. And for everybody in the hall, we want to make sure that you carry back lots of memories from uh, this event, this memorable G20 event. So we also have, I don't know how many of you all have heard of AI-powered photo galleries. So the Global DPI Summit brings you one such gallery where you can view your photos from the event using facial recognition technology. All right, so these are the QR codes. You need to scan that and register, and all your pictures will be shown to you, and you can then download them. Uh, the, event, uh, the pictures from the event will share, be shared with you via a WhatsApp link. So you can register now and explore for yet another fascinating experience of AI. And we will not store that data. It is secure. So you can use this for your pictures. This QR code will be on for a bit. We will take a short 10-minute tea break and come back for the last panel discussion after this break. So may I request everyone to please be back by 4.40 p.m. sharp. And on the other side of the break, we have the last panel discussion that's coming up on building the global DPI ecosystem. You do not want to miss that one. So we'll have one more panel discussion and then the closing for the Global DPI Summit.
Thank you very much. We'll see you back at 4.40 is when we start the final session, the final panel discussion. Thank you.
start with the next session and let's dive into it right away as we resume our event and move towards the final panel discussion for uh, this summit we are delighted to present for today uh, the discussion for today the building the global dpi ecosystem this session will explore digital ecosystems role as an enabler in the dpi space focusing on secure data storage identity management leveraging public services and the transformative impact of the mobile revolution. For this session, we have an esteemed lineup, and let me introduce them to all of you. Firstly, we have Mr. Walter Eduardo Morales Vega, Board Advisor, Central Bank of Uruguay, as our chairperson for this session. Let's welcome him with a round of applause. Please put your hands together for our moderator, Mr. Abhishek Singh, President and CEO, National E-Governance Division and Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. We are also privileged to have with us the following distinguished panelists. Mr. T. Koshi, Managing Director and CEO, ONDC, a founding team member of NSDL. Dr. Srivats Krishna, IAS Government of Karnataka. Mr. Robert Opp. Chief Digital Officer, UNDP, USA, and Ms. Vaijayanti T. Desai, Practice Manager, World Bank, leading global initiatives in identification and digitizing government-to-person payments. Let's have a collective round of applause for the entire panel, the final panel for today. And over to you, Mr. Singh, for the moderation. Thank you. Thank you, Chaitanya. And uh, I must say that last two days and over uh, the almost 10 sessions, we have deliberated almost every aspect related to 
digital public infrastructure, how they are impacting various services, how they are empowering people, how they are helping governments reach closer to the citizens, and whether it's health, whether it's education, whether it's agriculture, whether it's financial services, whether identities, issues regarding data sharing, judicial services, all have been deliberated, discussed in great detail. So uh, and that has brought us to the final session of this uh, two-day global DPI summit. And we have a distinguished panel of speakers today. We have uh, Robert uh, from uh, UNDP. We have Koshi from uh, ONDC. We have Srivatsa from uh, Government of Karnataka, who has done a lot of work on India's stack. And we have Ajinti from the World Bank. So almost all, and, and uh, His Excellency uh, from, the, from uh, Uruguay Central Bank. So with such a galaxy of speakers, we have a lot to here lot of sum up and try to work out a strategy like what next having discussed with regard to all the issues related to dpi the issues come in like uh, when there is so much of uh, demand what we have seen is that across countries across the world there is a lot of interest in trying to improve governance trying to improve delivery of services by using technology and there are law governments across are trying to implement digital transformation projects and uh, there are, again, the, the, whether it's the UNDP or whether it's the World Bank, the multilateral bodies, ADB, African Development Bank, all of them are wanting to support these initiatives. So one, there is demand, there's uh, support also for, uh, sub, uh, there's agencies which are supporting these implementation of these projects for governance reforms and for better delivery of services. And on the other hand, we also have a lot of projects which have been implemented in multiple countries. So whether it's Bangladesh, whether it's Estonia, whether it's India. So multiple countries have implemented multiple projects. So we have a lot of supply also of digital public infrastructure projects. So how do we kind of integrate that? How do we kind of ensure that whichever countries are wanting to use the projects which are there, how do we kind of adapt them? How do we replicate them? How do we build up internal capacities in the countries which are wanting to adopt that? How do we build such partnerships? And how do we make, build up a mechanism for ensuring that this whole journey of digital public infrastructure moves forward, not only in few countries, but across the world globally? So with this in the perspective, we will have these discussions. So I will start, kick off the discussion with my friend and colleague, Srivatsa, and uh, ask him to give his perspective, since he has worked in the, uh, not only in the state government, but also worked with the in World Bank, has been teaching in Stanford, and he has the larger global perspective of how India, has, uh, how digital public infrastructures can be can be pushed forward globally, and what it means for governance, and what it means for improving access to services for citizens. So, Shivatsa would like to hear from you. Thank you, Abhishek. It's a challenge to wake up the graveyard shift just before the the two days, the exciting days of deliberations we've had. So, as he mentioned, I've been working around the world on DPI. And there are four or five interesting things, lessons which come forward, which I'd like to share with you. First and foremost, there is a lot of curiosity. Look, India missed the agricultural revolution. We missed the industrial revolution. We made it by the skin of our teeth to the IT revolution, thanks to Y2K and the huge capabilities developed thereafter. But when it comes to the digital revolution, we are right up there. And every country in the world wants to learn from India and emulate India. The lessons which most people are curious about, the benefits of the India stack and DPI are quite well known and people pick it up quite quickly. But the three or four questions which I have found in Australia, I've been there for three weeks, in the United States, in other countries, are first and foremost, how did we achieve across the aisle, walking across of political parties of different, different complexions, coming together to create the India stack, which has been a 12-year journey for Aadhaar, six or seven-year journey for UPI, for direct benefit transfer, and Digi Locker, which Abhishek has so brilliantly uh, shepherded. How could we do this with political complexions of different kinds across India? And how did, what did this mean for public accountability, accountability of public programs, that's first. Second is who funds these? Should the, in Australia, for instance, one big question was, should the federal government be funding it, or should the state government be funding it? And there's a lot of friction there between the federal and the state governments as to who should fund it, and what are the benefits one can get. The third question which comes forth in all these things is about privacy. In India, to achieve one-to-one -one uniqueness with a population with a large digital illiter illiteracy, we had to go for biometrics and for uh, finger iris scanning. 
Now, remember, Aadhaar is the lowest attribute ID on the planet. Australia ID uses 100 attributes. The social security number in the US uses about 140 attributes. India uses six, four, uh, that is name, gender, date of birth, and address, and your iris scan, and your fingerprint. It's the lowest attribute uh, ID on the planet. So people are curious, can we do this without taking fingerprints and iris? That's the third question. And the last question is, when you look at an end-to-end -end delivery, service delivery, how do you separate the point of decision of a government service from the point of delivery of a government service? The point of decision of a government service will always be inside government, for that's a statutory function. But the point of delivery of a government service can be anywhere where one can bury a piece of silicon and a piece of fiber. How can DPI make that happen faster, cheaper, and better? That is the fourth question on everyone's minds. I'll stop here. And Thank you. Thank you, Shivasa, for putting it so succinctly. Like, what are the essential elements and in what ways it can be done, in what ways India has done it, in what ways it can be done across? So uh, this brings me to Robert and uh, you, with your work with the UNDP and having worked with multiple countries across the world. What do you think is the compelling need? Why do countries all want uh, a digital public infrastructure to be in place? What are the essential components to, for uh, making it happen? And what do you think are the key challenges or the key roadblocks while seeing this as a reality? No. Thanks. Thank you. OK. Thank you very much, uh, Evishek. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, it is, it's a good question. and We're seeing certainly a surge of demand among countries um, for digital transformation in general, but also digital public infrastructure um, once they understand what some of the experiences of other countries have been um, in particular. And I think I, I would like to start by zooming out just a little bit. And I was just uh, speaking next door in the working group, the development, uh, digital economy working group, um, about this similar issue. And if we look at where we are with the sustainable development goals, we are obviously not on track. And there's a number of reasons, uh, COVID-19, um, climate crises, uh, war in Ukraine, these have all caused a reversal in human development indicators over the last few years. And so when we s approach the SDG summit, which is marking the, the midway point of the SDGs this September, the question on people's minds is where is the acceleration in human development going to come from? And I think increasingly, if you look at examples coming out of places like India, Bangladesh, um, and many others that have really worked on their digital public infrastructure, and you're seeing the impact on GDP, on human well-being, and so on, that, that this is becoming an important question for countries about how can they adopt what they see working elsewhere and so the role of the UN and multilateral institutions, World Bank and, and many others that are out, out there, Code Develop, uh, GovStack, and so on and so forth, is you know, can we really uh, build a global movement around this? Can we find ways to help countries to not reinvent the wheel by taking advantage of what's been done and learned elsewhere, both in terms of technology, uh, but also the approaches around it, the governance of it, what, the, the hard-won lessons learned so that they can accelerate their own digital transformation and, their, and therefore also the human development indicators in their own countries, leaving no one behind, taking a people-centered approach and so on. So the, the, the challenges um, are typical ones. Um, there's uh, lots of different kinds of things that, that cause countries to struggle in this, whether it be the sort of low capacity in a local ecosystem. Sometimes there's governance challenges in countries that need to be overcome. Um, and, and sometimes there's lack of financing and so on. But you know, there, I, I really believe that in building this kind of global movement, we can really start to overcome a lot of those challenges. And we certainly see strong resonance among countries for that. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for giving, identifying the key challenges. And as you rightly mentioned, like the the three key challenges as we see is like for uh, ensuring adoption of digital public infrastructure is like one technology but technology is something which is readily available there are countries which have implemented such projects so which can be adopted and there's larger uh, willingness of most countries who have built such products to share it with other countries the other challenge which you mentioned was about of course capacity and ability for countries to have institutions and the right people to implement such projects. And that's actually a bigger challenge. We have also experienced that in India. 
And the third challenge, of course, is uh, having the right resources. So that brings me to, to Vajinti, who has been leading such projects, the ID4D and other projects that the World Bank is driving across the world and trying to work on governance reforms, trying to work on digital transformation projects. And I'm sure you must have addressed the two key challenges of ensuring capacity building, institution building, having the right people, and making resources available. Because whenever it's World Bank, we all look forward to money coming in. So how do you think the World Bank play a key role in catalyzing this movement for evangelizing digital public infrastructures? Thank you, um, Abhishek, and you know I uh, I'm honored to be here, and I I think for I'm looking around the room, and there's a lot of people who have been shaping this space for several years now, um, and so I feel like we should all sort of pinch ourselves and think like we're at a moment in time right now that the agenda of digital public infrastructure is really gaining momentum, and to to really see a chorus of voices and to see. Um, several who are, haven't been along in the journey coming along. I think we're, it, it's, it's quite remarkable. So congratulations to, to the, in, the government of India for, for hosting the G20 and really amplifying uh, digital public infrastructure. So to, to, um, to answer some of your questions, I just want to set a little bit of context into why um, many countries have, um, have really accelerated this uh, agenda. You know, one is we know even before COVID, countries really recognize the importance of um, delivering services to people, whether it's for efficiency, better targeting, um, or for inclusion, so it, bringing people into a system, um, or for innovation, so putting the rails for which, on top of which private sector can really innovate. And so there was really a momentum and, and recognition that if you had some of this shared infrastructure, foundational infrastructure, that's um, not sector specific, but that's really foundational in nature, it, you can really amplify some of the sector specific outcomes. And so development organizations like ours recognize the importance because when it was supporting a country, whether it was on delivering social assistance, how ID, payments, data sharing was, was critical, or whether it's for delivery of health, um, or whether it's for job growth and uh, economic development. So, so, you know, there was always a recognition. I think COVID really, really accelerated that. And um, what we saw is, you know, whether it's countries like in Singapore, where uh, previous to COVID, 25% of the population used SingPass and MyInfo. And, uh, within just a few years of COVID, it's 97% of the population. So the ability to transact online um, for a number of different services. Uh, or whether it's in Thailand, farmers being able to receive their um, subsidies by linking with ID um, and also linking the ID to their fast payment system, going from 1 billion transactions to 15 billion transactions in just uh, a couple of years. So. So it was there before and it's accelerated significantly since COVID. Um, and we've also done some research that shows across 85 countries that supported um, countries, the 85 countries that supported their people with social assistance during COVID, those that had some of the digital public infrastructure in place were able to uh, provide three times more coverage than those that didn't. And so, so those countries, you know, are seeing this and, and really, and we have a number of countries who are already well along their path, whether it's Bangladesh or Nigeria and Philippines, um, so many in this room, Sri Lanka. Uh, and so, so what, what's really exciting is that it, it, it's no longer a new concept. It's a concept where there's different countries along different parts of the journey, some that are more advanced uh, in the journey and some that are starting out, but there's such a, um, a, a, an opportunity of knowledge sharing between these countries. And so when you talk about capacity building, um, you know, the, the way that the bank supports countries is we have essentially a number of different instruments at our disposal. So we have our analytics and thought leadership that helps understand what are good practices, um, what are the trends across different countries, um, whether it's things like even advocacy, the gap of, a, of now 850 million people who don't have ID. So we're able to do that advocacy and knowledge through the thought leadership and analytics, but also at the country level, the technical assistance. But when we also do the technical assistance through a multi-donor platform, it also leverages 100x 
the financing for downstream. But that financing goes to countries for them to implement their own systems. And so there's inbuilt capacity building because it's not necessarily us providing, I mean, we can in the upstream technical systems bring experts, but as it's being implemented over a course of five to seven years, it's the countries implementing themselves. And so whether it's in West Africa having people, you know, the countries and the government officials actually learning from other countries. And so it's also this knowledge sharing platform. You know, we just took, for example, three different countries from West Africa to Philippines. I mean, it was magic in what they learned. Or we had probably a dozen countries come to India. And just to see the, the spark when countries learn from one another, it's really not, um, it's, it's unmatched. It's really unmatched when countries can learn from one another. So, so in terms of capacity building, I think that's, and then the third is around the global convening and platforms. And I think this is where, as Rob said, we really are at a, at a unique opportunity where it, it's not just our individual or institutions that are providing support, but that we can really be a chorus coming together and a broad coalition that are, that's really thinking about how to take this agenda forward. So um, I'm happy to answer any more questions, but it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a journey that I think we're, we're far along now, and um, I think we're looking forward to even more in the future. Thank you. In fact, what you just mentioned addresses many of the questions that we have been having in the bilaterals that we have been having with the various countries since yesterday after signing of the MOUs and trying to, to discuss like what next, like uh, once you sign the MOUs and once you share this, once you uh, share what kind of projects can be done, then we always have to like have a roadmap that what will be the next. And one key uh, request, one key requirement that always comes up is that how do we build in capacities, how do we build in that? So I'm sure with the technical assistance program, the bank and the uh, knowledge sharing platform that the bank bring, brings in and the kind of practitioners and experts that the bank has access to who have implemented such uh, transformational projects across can be a big, big uh, enabler for, uh, for uh, pushing forward the agenda of digital public infrastructure. And when we talk of practitioners and we talk of people who have been there, done that, there's no, there's hardly be anyone more accomplished than uh, our friend Koshi. Uh, T. Koshi, is, uh, as was mentioned, is the CEO of ONDC, the most vibrant and the most upcoming DPI, as I may say, which, uh, which transcends uh, government and it like kind of brings together the entire ecosystem of e-commerce, bringing it on a unified platform. But before that, he's also worked on the Aadhaar project, on the COVID vaccination project, on the tax information project. So he brings together a lot of experience of having implemented such projects. So from your perspective, Koshi, of course, you should talk about ONDC, but I would also like you to mention that when countries are looking at implementing digital public infrastructure projects, what are the key concerns they should have in what way they should move forward and ensure that they are actually able to build, build in that ecosystem in their own countries? Thank you. Uh, as Abhishek said, uh, I'm not a policymaker. I've been an implementer all through my life. So <clears throat> when, since um, I'm currently heading the Open Network for Digital Commerce, I'll briefly tell what we are trying to do, because it's the latest addition in the DPIs that we're developing in India. Um, for many in India, it may be familiar, but for the larger audience, this might be something new. In a simple sense, what are we expecting? We are thinking about democratization of commerce. It's a complete transformation of the commerce. Complete transformation of commerce in general and e-commerce in particular. What do we expect out of it is that e-commerce as it is practiced today will become irrelevant. It will take a completely new shape. What does it mean? In the long run, we are just in the beginning. What's a bold ambition we are working? In few years time, every product and every service that is relevant to a broad cross-section of consumers will make their product catalog visible in an open network using an open protocol. Once it, and this visibility will help them to be accessing the total population as one single market and not silos offered by few large enterprises or big tech firms. Once they're all there in this 
network, there'll be different buying applications which will come and help their kind, their buyers to buy what is relevant. Just like today, all of us will have a website for any company or enterprise. Any enterprise which wants to be in commerce will only make their product visible. They don't have to worry, oh, let me go and tie up with this platform, this platform, and this and this. Multiple investment, multiple costs, all these kinds of things are going to go. That's our whole ambition. And we are in just the beginning, and we are building on what the, uh, the, the, the titans who came behind us. Foundations like Aadhaar and UPI and etc. form the foundations on which we are able to build. So as Abhishek asked, let me just from a practitioner's point of view sum up the big picture. I would have loved to talk about ONDC, but that's not my calling today. <laughs> Abhishek will kick me out. So I'll just see some big picture stuff. You know, whenever we are looking at the, you know, uh, four big elements in DPI development and implementation. One, at the design time. Design has to ensure that it's inclusive, interoperable, and foster widespread innovation. And most importantly, take into practical considerations of implementation. If that is not thought through, implementation will fall into a lot of problems. And once a design sort of matures, it doesn't just automatically happen. While the open source community believe that people will just pick up and get moving. But when it comes to an inclusive agenda where we want diverse participants to come, there should be a appropriate agency responsible for orchestrating this one. Their job is orchestration, not control. Enabler. And it will also need significant amount of evangelization. Because it's something new, it needs to be adopted. And the last but not the least, there should be a set of people who will think with the industry how it is going to be transformed and help them to make a transformation agenda. I'll just take one example here. All of you are familiar with Aadhaar. When Aadhaar was set up, the idea was giving everybody a digital ID. There was a lot of ambition what it is, what Aadhaar can do, what Aadhaar can do on top of Aadhaar, what can be the things be done. But when the country took up the first practical implementation on an Aadhaar-based direct benefit transfer, which was something like the, the, the gas connections, we had so much of practical problems, almost giving a feeling that it is not workable idea in a country like us. But there was conviction and sat down and ironed out. The people worked with an idea of transformation of DBT as a whole, not just giving gas. And there are a lot of learning that got developed, became the foundation today. Practically, everything in direct benefit transfer in this country is done by it. The same is the challenge we are now working with, with, the, with the ONDC. I will not go much in detail. I'll be happy to answer any question. Let's all have a collaborative discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Koshi, for uh, giving the perspective from actually a implementer's point of view and how the, the key tenets of uh, of a true DPI, how it has to be interoperable, how it has to be based on open standards, and how it has to also ensure inclusion. So I would like to now pose a question to Shivatsa. With regard to when you look at the, you spoke about India stack and you have been evangelizing about it in your articles, in your papers, and the research that you do. So the implementation of India stack is actually truly a kind of a whole of India effort in which it's not only the government which has contributed to it, but an equal and a more important role has been played in by the industry, by the not-for-profits, and by, by voluntary organizations who have contributed to the building the India stack, that is. So how important do you think is bringing all the players in the ecosystem for, has been for India stack? And you think going ahead, when we look at DPI, adding this to the, to the UNDP, the World Bank will add further value when we are, taking, when we are trying to make it truly global. I think we are in the middle of two fundamental changes in human history. First and foremost, the cost of human intelligence is coming down dramatically. Secondly, the cost of energy is coming down dramatically. Intelligence and energy are the two inputs into anything you do. Today, the average $1,000 laptop 
runs at a speed of 10 to the power 16 cycles per second. That is the speed of the human brain, at which human brain processes stuff. By 2048, the average, same average $1,000 laptop will be equal to all the human brains on the planet. Think about it. An average $1,000 laptop will have the power of all the human brains on the planet by 2048. Cost of energy is going down. This jacket I'm wearing is made from 30 plastic bottles, saving energy. So I think the lead World Bank, IMF, IFC, ADB, UN have to take is in spreading this mantra of the stack, how the tech stack, an open, scalable architecture, not proprietary, not controlled by big tech, who give you a whole bunch of things free, but use your data as fodder and sell it to advertisers. Instead of that, here's a competing model. Thanks to the leadership of Prime Minister Narendra Modi and my batchmate Ashwini Vaishnav, and all of you doing this, I think it's a remarkable step forward. We have moved away from the big tech-centric model. We have moved away from Europe's regulation-heavy model. We have moved away from China's walled garden. And we are moving towards a model where the citizen is at the center and the government is only the consent manager. If these institutions can take forward this model in an era where the cost of intelligence and cost of energy is going down dramatically, I think we are on the throes of creating a new global architecture. Publications like The Economist don't understand this. And if you see the recent article, while they praise the DPI and India stack a lot, at the end there's something about human rights, something about democracy not connected to it at all. It's always easy to blame Narendra Modi when the cow next door doesn't give milk. But what we must realize is India has done something at population scale. This is not something which we are doing in a declining population European country. This is at the scale of 1.4 billion people, and it works. And that's the, I think, message which we need to take to the world. Thank you. Thank you for putting it so strongly. But at the same time, whenever we implement such projects at the population scale, like we have done in India, the issues of digital inclusion and digital divide always gains prominence. So, Robert, I would like to bring you to this. You, do you think that like, when we are implementing digital public infrastructure in countries which might not have as many resources, which might not have people with access to maybe devices or to connectivity, in what ways implementation of DPI should be done so that we are able to address the key challenges of digital inclusion and digital divide also? No, that's, um, that's a great question, and it does come up because uh, we are often, I would say, presented with that question. Sometimes it's a challenge. How can you think about implementing digital public infrastructure in a place where uh, very few people are actually connected to the internet? And just as a little reminder, um, about a third of the global population is not connected. But when you look at least developed countries, that is actually the reverse. So there's only 30%, 35%, 36% of the population in least developed countries actually access the internet on a regular basis. However, we have seen some very interesting examples of how this challenge can be overcome. And I feel a bit strange talking about Bangladesh because the father of Bangladesh's digital transformation is sitting in, in the room, but I'm still gonna try to represent that. Um, Bangladesh had a very uh, a dramatic digital divide issue, um, but wanted, but started to, to digitize, digitalize its public services. And so one of the um, examples or one of the, the models that they used was a digital center model where they placed uh, entrepreneur-run digital centers in rural areas that provided the access to people to those digital public services, even if they didn't have the ability to, to afford a device or connect to the internet themselves. And so it doesn't, it, I mean, we have to close the digital divide. We must uh, make available connections to everybody, at least to those who want them. But we don't have to stop work on fundamental and foundational digital public infrastructure and wait for that to be done first. It is not sequential. It's something that we can do in parallel. Bangladesh has proven that and other countries have as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for putting it in. For Bangladesh's model and India's model, for example, common service centers are very alike, and they actually ensure that uh, that there is a service delivery access point for people who can't 
uh, access, who, who don't have a device, who don't have connectivity, or who don't have the ability to navigate a website or a portal, they do have somewhere to go to and get service in assisted mode. So that's an example which has been there in several countries apart from Bangladesh and India, but yes, it works very well. The other key question that comes to, and I will put this to Vajanti, is that very often we always think of the economic implications of implementing digital transformation projects. Because we always look at, governments across look at the return on investment, like in what ways it will help us in improving our economy, in improving incomes, and uh, all World Bank projects, especially whenever you implement governance reform projects, it always have that, in what ways there will be returns that will come up over a pe period of time. So when we implement digital public infrastructure or digital transformation projects, what does it mean? Or how do we explain it to the countries that are implementing that, yes, there will be economic benefits that will accrue from such projects? So I, I touched upon it a bit in my first answer, in, but in terms of both public sector savings, public sector savings as well as private sector savings. So whether it's um, you know, EKYC for onboarding, for opening up a bank account or getting a SIM card, um, just the rapid pace. And we are actually doing time and motion studies in several of the countries that we're rolling out um, the ID system and GTP um, systems. So we'll be able to really monetize, and this is part of even the broader effort of a growing body of research that needs to be collected. So as several of the countries that we're supporting, we're also rolling out um, more of this research so that we'll have even further, further evidence. Um, and I think in terms of, uh, in addition to public sector and private sector savings, it's uh, also the economic growth and job opportunities. And so, so that's really the, the, compelling, um, the compelling use cases for it. Um, but also, you know, as I mentioned, inclusion, and I know it was in Bangladesh where um, women were more likely to open up an account because they were able to do it from the comfort of their home. And I know that BRAC has done some um, research on this, and I don't have the data points, and Anir's just slipped away, but he might, oh, there you go. <laughs> um, the, act, the exact data points on that, but uh, I, I think it was something like three full times uh, accounts that were open uh, from the comfort of, of their home. So it's an inclusion, uh, um, a savings, uh, uh, and, a, and a growth uh, a, agenda. And, and I think just to, um, to also just answer some of the, 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 the prior questions, I, I feel like there's, um, and I'll, I'll stop there and, and I'll, I'll add some more questions. No, 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 because I don't want to go on. <laughs> No, thank you, thank you, in fact, and uh, yes, Anir is here who has been leading these projects in Bangladesh and we have seen how, how such projects have been adopted far and wide in, in Bangladesh also. And uh, the economic benefits, in fact, uh, I echo what uh, Vajanti just mentioned. And in India also, there have been studies which have documented how it has led to savings, it has led to uh, elimination of leakages, to whether it was the subsidy scheme for LPGs or in the food distribution or even in the direct benefit transfers for scholarships, pension, ration cards. A lot of uh, duplicates have been eliminated and government has have billions of dollars of savings because of implementation of digital public transformation projects. And it only, every study shows that the returns with regard to improvement of governance and improvement of efficiency is far more than the amount that is invested for implementation of these projects. So with this, I would like to open it up for the audience and like to take some questions that might be coming up with such eminent speakers. So yes, Anil, would you like to add something to begin with? Can we have a microphone, please? Thank you, Abhishek. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the the COVID situation, I think, was an accelerator. So the, the women's progress that we saw, uh, actually a lot of it happened over COVID. Just to give you an example, in 2019, November, we were having a session with our garments uh, sector leaders, because that's the highest export. 84% of countries' export is garment sector. Mostly women, about 4 million women work in that sector. And we were going to build uh, digital wallets for them because we were doing uh, wage transfer to their wallets. That was the whole thing. And 40% had digital wallets. And the president of the uh, Garments Association, uh, Ruban, Dr. Rubana Hawk, so she said that we will get to 90% by the end of 2021. So that was the target. By the middle of 2020, 
we reached 100% because of COVID. Because we actually created 3 million mobile wallets and government transferred, the government industry was in, was in uh, uh, actually shocked because orders were getting canceled, billions of dollars orders were getting canceled and the government actually bailed out the industry by sending wage payments through mobile wallets to these 3 million women. Uh, 1 million actually were already getting it electronically. So this is how, I, how we saw COVID actually accelerated things uh, in a very strange way. What I wanted to point out is uh, Rob's point is the digital divide issue. It is real. It is very real. So as services, education, agriculture, health are all becoming more and more digital because we are building DPIs. We are delivering all these through the, through the various uh, DPI mechanisms. Uh, there is a hidden uh, set of people that don't have access to DPI. So we have to make sure, this is something that I also talked uh, during uh, the spring meetings in World Bank, uh, in that closed door uh, round table where Nandan uh, presented, that in the DPI discussion, we're talking about ID payments data. But I think the discussion about services and the discussion about access must really be at the heart of the DPI discussion. Uh, there is argument that, okay, the physical infrastructure is not really digital public infrastructure. It's a physical public infrastructure. But I think unless we think about the access issues of the digital public infrastructure, access by wireless, by wired, by these CSCs, in Bangladesh we call them digital centers, so whatever the access mechanism. Even during COVID, we had call centers as the biggest lifeline. We delivered emergency food. We delivered uh, cash. We delivered... Uh, uh, telemedicine through this call center, one call center, triple three. Millions of calls came in through this. So that's a new use of an old technology, call center. Right? So unless we think about all these access uh, technologies, uh, then DPI becomes, again, a tool of divide, perhaps. So just wanted to can make I, that Can point. I just add to that? I think one important part is that DPI doesn't mean that you just take an existing bad process and then di digitize it. It also means reimagining the way that you're delivering services or, or that uh, infrastructure. And, and I think that's really important to also look at you know, the human-centered design aspect of it. So whether it's qualitative research and surveys to understand what are the pain points. And so in several of the countries, whether when you're getting an ID, removing some of the barriers to obtaining that, whether it's the other relevant documents that somebody doesn't have or um, re reducing the time and the distance to a registration point. So those are all really critical parts of designing the system to think of where the pain points are when it's in the physical world before you actually create it in the digital world. Yeah. In fact, totally agree with what Anir said and what Vajanti added. Okay, like digital transformation, digital public infrastructure is not just a software code. It's much more than that. It also includes enabling infrastructure to ensure access and, as she mentioned, reimagining processes, reimagining the way we deliver services. Very often it's known as process reengineering and uh, democratizing access. And uh, who better than Koshi, who is like tackling this problem for the e-commerce space? Like, how do we reimagine e-commerce? How do we bring buyers, sellers on one platform and like reinvent uh, the way it is done? So, Koshi, would you like to add something on that? Yeah, I mean, it's a very important dimension, but all of you are, I, I, uh, pointed out. So let me just you know, look from the point of view of how we are going about doing it. We said commerce is about democratization. It says about equal opportunity to everybody. But one big thing what Abhishek just highlighted is that while it gives you equal opportunity, everybody is not equally capable. And if we do not be alive to that situation, it is not going to succeed. So the, as an orchestration body, the Open ONDC, the, 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 the agency which I sort of lead, take this as one of the very important components as much as creating the digital rails. One is to create the digital rail, everybody can use it. Openness has come. But it will become successful only when we in, help the large cross-section of the people to leverage this opportunity. So it could be as basic as giving them the digital literacy. It could be as basic as teaching them to behave 
in a enlarged market with multiple entities like the logistics providers and variety of service providers coming together to make the product access not just the familiar neighborhood but all across the country or even internationally. And as Vijayanti pointed out, this would mean a complete re-engineering of their processes. And all this has to become the organizational priority. But keep in mind that this orchestrating agency has to be minimalist. It should not try to do everything. It should do, add, it should do only where it can add value and leave it to the entrepreneurship of the larger cross-section of society to take advantage and build on it. So you become a creator of an ecosystem, not creator of a monolithic platform or a monolithic entity that eventually become a white elephant in itself, which kills the innovation. This happens in private sector, it happens in public sector. So that is the most critical component that has to be addressed while we build up the TPR. Because smart people like us can sit around and make design the system. But implementation is all groundwork on the ground and we have to provide for the last man standing and how we can take advantage of it. See, if I may build on what Koshi said, DPI is only a necessary condition. There's a sufficient condition on top of that, what Vajenti spoke about and what Rob spoke about. You need to do a whole bunch of policy changes. You need to have leadership at the right level. You need to have champions within the system. Many countries have already automated much of their uh, service delivery. What you need to do is, can you slap a bunch of APIs on top of existing computer systems and make them talk to each other? They have to be open, they have to be interoperable, and they have to be scalable. This is the exact opposite antithesis of what big tech professes. So there are many countries. US has a social security number system, which is very well already in an electronic format, but they don't talk to each other. It can be used for profiling because you can use a social security number, work backwards, and profile the person. Can you open it up, slap a bunch of APIs on top of it, make it talk to each other, and that becomes the foundational identity for a whole bunch of service deliveries. We saw the whole lot of issues that the US faced during uh, COVID. Not just misplaced checks, but a whole lot of fraud happening when it came, comes to direct benefit transfer. And I think a tech stack, which is open, searchable, indexable, shareable, and interoperable, will solve much of these. It's a necessary, but not a sufficient condition. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience before I ask uh, uh, His Excellency Walter Eduardo from Central Bank to give his remarks? Uh, yes, Anir. Sorry, I know but that. I've before spoken. you ask anyone else. Okay, so go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so, so I forget who said that equal treatment of unequals is not equality. So we put API everywhere. It's a, it's a, it's a necessary condition. But who's going to access that API? So unless we provide access in an unequal way, creating affirmative action, we did a report with uh, Dr. Selim Jahan, who used to lead uh, UNDP's Human Development Report. He's retired now, so he's been working with us for the last one year. One of the things that came up at the top is the information and power asymmetry that exists in society actually adversely affects digitization sometimes. So if, if you read uh, Amartya Sen and Richard Hicks's adverse digital incorporation, it's actually sometimes you do more harm then good if you don't design it right. So uh, Vajanti's point, Abhishek, your point of uh, doing BPR, simplifying, those are, I think, at the very heart of the DPI discussion. The DPI discussion cannot just be only ID data, ID payment data. It has to be about humans as well. So I think it's, all of you are saying the same thing. It's not the only thing. It's a, it's a necessary condition, but not sufficient. But the sufficient conditions also have to come in the yes. discussion. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you, Anil, for your remarks. So I would request, uh, Walter Eduardo to give his remarks, uh, but, uh, and after that we'll conclude, but I would request all my panelists to think of one last wish that they would have to make the DPI a reality, but that you can think over while Walter is speaking, and uh, after he speaks, I will ask you to share that one wish for that you want to have for a DPI dream becoming a reality. So Walter would be speaking in uh, his native tongue, Spanish, and uh, the translated version of his speech is placed on the table, so, Yes, over to you, Walter, for your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
My name is Walter Morales. Uh, I represent a Central Bank of Uruguay. And uh, I want to pre uh, present you a Central Bank of Uruguay, a Uruguay country, and uh, the, the relation in, in, in um, Uruguay and uh, India. Uh, as you see, my English is so basic. I prefer Spanish. Don't worry, you are, you are the English version in, in the paper. Bien. Eh, para ser, digamos, a veces a, a, hablando en, en estos lados del mundo, estamos como... El mundo y pa, con la tecnología parece muy cerca, pa, todos parecemos muy cerca, pero en realidad estamos bastante lejos. Entonces, para presentar lo que es Uruguay, Uruguay es un país ubicado en América del Sur, entre Argentina y Brasil. South America, between Argentina and Brazil. Su extensión, la extensión de, de, de Uruguay, es aproximadamente de 187.000 kilómetros cuadrados. Su población, entre la que me incluyo, somos 3,5 millones de habitantes. El producto, para, para, para que más o menos tengamos idea de... de de los números y lo que es. Su Producto Bruto Interno alcanza los 60 mil millones de dólares anuales. Como, como que nos conoce el mundo, eh, las características más importantes que, 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 digamos que, que nos hacen saber el mundo hacia Uruguay es, Uruguay es un país netamente agroexportador, produce alimentos, Alimentos. Entonces, eh, y, la, y, la, y las exportaciones de bienes y servicios anualmente están en los 13 mil millones de dólares, de los cuales un 20% aproximadamente es carne vacuna, carne bovina, después le sigue un 15% lo que es soja, le siguen más atrás en un 13% lo que es la industria de la celulosa, y el otro 50% es básicamente alimentos, también, como estos, pero más, este, más, de, más con, en menos porcentaje o en más peso, más desa, desagregado, llamémosle, lácteos, hay una cantidad, eh, otra, otra, otro tipo. Bueno, y la segunda cosa por la que nos conoce el mundo es, seguramente habrán escuchado en medios de prensa, es la entrega manifiesta de sus jugadores de fútbol, ¿sí?, cuando defienden un equipo, no importa, el que sea, pero más aún cuando, defienden, cuando se ponen la, la camiseta de la selección uruguaya, la celeste. ¿Sí? Este, bueno, esas son las características de, de nuestro país. Yo quiero hacerles una, una narratoria desde el año 2002 para acá, que el Uruguay cayó en una profunda crisis a raíz de una crisis financiera y crisis también en, o sea, en economía, la, la parte de pro, producción realmente, ¿sí? de productos reales, de alimentos, de, de la industria, una crisis muy grande. En ese momento, digamos, tanto el Banco Central como toda la, la, la economía, toda la sociedad se reestructuró. Quebraron bancos, entidades bancarias, quebraron, se, se liquidaron, cerraron, otros se fusionaron, Merger and Acquisition de Banks, o sea, se, se fusionaron, se, se, otros compraron a otros bancos. Esa es la historia nuestra. Entonces, cuando logramos establecer la, nos logramos establecer económicamente, ahí empezamos a trabajar de vuelta y, de serio, y en serio más tranquilos para adelante. Ahí por el 2008, más o menos, se, re, se reformula la Carta Orgánica del Banco Central, se revisan las potestades, los, los poderes que tiene el Banco, el banco Central, se, eh, el Parlamento aprueba una ley específica para sistema de pagos, donde regula todo el funcionamiento del sistema de pagos, los bancos ya estaban regulados, pero este aspecto en materia específica del sistema de pagos, no tanto, ahora sí, 
las instituciones emisoras de dinero electrónico, las empresas que prestan servicios financieros, todo eso queda regulado en esa ley de sistema de pagos. Seguimos para acá y por allá por el 2014, 2013, una cosa así, se promueve una ley de, que se le llama de inclusión financiera. Gracias a esa ley de inclusión financiera, el, la sociedad uruguaya, un porcentaje altísimo de la población, queda lo que nosotros le decimos bancarizada. ¿Qué es eso? Es, no de, hay muy pocas personas en Uruguay que no saben qué es una cuenta bancaria o una cuenta en un agente financiero. Porque el Estado, con, con leyes en, en el mismo sentido, lo que hizo fue obligar a las empresas a que la remuneración por sueldos, por, este, por nómina, todo fuera pagado en una cuenta bancaria. Cuando las, las empresas comerciales este, establecieran sus cuentas bancarias y recibieran pagos de la población también en sus cuentas bancarias. Naturalmente, esto además de incluir a toda la población y hacerla conocedora de los instrumentos financieros, atrás tuvo un respaldo muy grande de la, de la dirección fiscal, porque esa dirección fiscal incentivó el uso de estos instrumentos para que, o sea, también para la trazabilidad de las operaciones. Después, eh, estas cosas van surgiendo como de a una, como cosas aisladas. Hay una, una, una reforma muy importante en materia de información, en, digamos, y para lo cual también se aprueban leyes que tratan sobre la información, o sea, la información, quién usa información, los datos, de quién son los datos, quién los puede utilizar, con qué recaudos, hay que tener cuidado, hay datos personales que son este, privados de la gente. Entonces, el Estado, el Parlamento aprueba normas en ese sentido, digamos, y en, se aprueba y surgen nuevas instituciones en el Estado y también en, la, en las entidades privadas que se dedican expertas en manejo de información. Esto está todo sustentado con una política de, o sea, de transparencia, de rendición de cuentas a la ciudadanía. Eh, siempre... De, la gente que trabajamos en, en empleos públicos siempre tenemos que tener presente que nuestro jefe es el ciudadano. Entonces, tenemos que ser muy cuidadosos en lo que es la gestión de los dineros públicos y así como tenemos que ser cuidadosos, también tenemos que ser transparentes y rendir cuentas en forma continua, todo lo que se pueda. Y bueno, entonces, se instauraron medidas para que el ciudadano pueda consultar ya sea personalmente, a nivel remoto, por, este, por aplicaciones electrónicas, y todo eso ha ido funcionando. Generalmente, todas se iniciaron como proyectos individuales para satisfacer necesidades de cada una de esas instituciones o, o necesidades este, de, específicas. Con el paso del tiempo, todas esas este, aplicaciones, todas esas plataformas, empiezan a ser interoperables, porque el dato que produce una entidad es utilizado por otra. Entonces, ¿cómo viajan esos datos? ¿Qué cuidado tienen? Eso también empezó a regularse. Bueno, ¿qué es lo que esperamos ahora? Porque la, las cosas suceden como suceden. A veces se puede planear, planificar, pero las cosas suceden como suceden. Entonces. Lo que se espera ahora es que cuando haya renovación de estas tecnologías, exista una mirada más de arriba de todos los integrantes, de los, eh, como se le dicen, este, los, los stakeholders, o sea, mirado más desde encima, y hasta los gastos o las aplicaciones o, las, o los nuevos desarrollos, ya desde el momento cero se inician con esa óptica. Y de esa forma, naturalmente, que se seguirán ahorrando costos los beneficios eran mayores, 
la respuesta del ciudadano será más ágil. Eso es este, básicamente lo que se espera. Eh, una cosa que yo quería comentarles es invitarlos a que, aunque sea por curiosidad, consulten unas páginas ahí que HTTPS es Wikipedia.org, Wiki, Digital Nine, por ejemplo, que consulten eso. Y si, van a ver que Uruguay, digamos, dentro del mundo está bastante bien posicionado en lo que refiere a gobierno digital también. Aunque todos esos desarrollos hubieran surgido como este, impulsos especiales, pero se ha ido logrando interoperar todo eso y poner un norte para todo ese tipo de aplicaciones. Yo estoy acá porque represento al Banco Central, porque trabajo en el Banco Central. Entonces, y quería comentarles qué es lo que le ha faltado al Banco Central hasta ahora estos días. Y ahí van a ver después como corolario dónde aparece India en un importante, en, digamos, importante para nosotros. En materia de sistemas de pagos rápidos, por ejemplo, no existía en el banco, no existía en Uruguay hasta, el, hasta hace muy poco. El año pasado, sobre fines de año, el directorio o consejo, como se le llama en, otro, en otras partes del mundo, del Banco Central resolvió, digamos, una hoja de ruta para adelante y dentro de esas cosas dijo voy a jerarquizar el área sistema de pagos. Todo un área la hace que dependa directamente de directorio. Ahí nombra a su, a su gerente, que es este, la, señor, la señora economista Ana Claudia de los Heros, la pone al frente y le, la empodera de una cantidad de cosas para sistema de pagos. Y crea un grupo específico en el, el que yo integro con el único cometido de, para este año 2023, tienen que estar dos proyectos andando. El primero es el sistema de pagos rápidos, para junio. Y el segundo, que incluye para junio, pago por transferencia de persona a persona, P2P. El segundo, que es para la segunda parte del año, pago a comercios, P2M. Entonces, ¿cuáles son los requisitos que nos pidió el Banco Central? O sea, ¿qué, qué, con, ¿sobre qué bases debería funcionar ese sistema de pagos rápidos? Tiene que ser accesible para todo el mundo. Todo el, el ciudadano tiene que acceder a él. O sea, de vuelta volvemos a que nuestro jefe es el ciudadano, es la ciudadanía. Entonces... Primero, accesible para todo el ciudadano. Segundo, tiene que funcionar las 24 horas del día, los 7 días de la semana. Tercero, tiene que ser interoperable con cualquier otro sistema que quiera implantar un supervisado. Y cuarto, por debajo de determinado valor, por un, un, hay un umbral ahí que, que se va a ir moviendo porque esto es, va en marcha, por debajo de ese valor las, trans, las transferencias P2P no tienen costo para el usuario. Eso es lo que pidió el Banco Central. Les cuento hoy que el 6 de junio, este, hace unos días atrás, es, esta parte ya está funcionando. Ya, ya está. ¿Qué es lo que nos queda? Nos queda la parte, o sea, para seguirla puliendo, seguirla trabajando, que la ciudadanía la incorpore y después vamos con la segunda parte. ¿Dónde es que aparece? Este, bueno, este desarrollo lo está llevando adelante una empresa que se llama Urutec, que es una empresa fundada por la banca comercial de Uruguay y, tiene, o sea, y le asignaron el fin de desarrollar un sistema de pagos rápidos, que, pero ya viene con otras funciones de tiempo atrás, como por ejemplo la operación de las cámaras compensadoras. Entonces, en nuestro país, como, como en otras partes del mundo, el sistema de pagos rápidos 
lo desarrolla un ente privado, que casualmente, es, o no es casual, o sea, es como pasa en, grandes, en casi todas las partes del mundo, es el mismo que tiene la gestión, la operación de las cámaras de compensación. ¿Sí? Una, otra de las cosas que les quería comentar es, ¿cómo no, nos conocimos nosotros con India? Ustedes imagínense que el, el grupo de trabajo que yo integro, solo hay una persona del sistema de pagos que conoce el negocio. Los otros, yo tengo muchos años en el banco y estuve en todos lados dentro del banco, pero no conozco de eso. Mis compañeros, tengo de tecnología, ingenieros en, 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 como es, en sistema de, de, de información, abogados, eh, administradores, saben de sus cosas, pero no sabemos del tema. Entonces, la resolución de directorio se formalizó el 18 de enero del 2023. Y nosotros ya tenemos eso andando. Hemos tenido que trabajar y hemos tenido la suerte de que, hay, de que el mundo nos ha ayudado. Por ejemplo, no sabíamos nada de, los, de estos temas, el grupo que se integra. Sí nos teníamos fe porque, digamos, hemos trabajado juntos en otros proyectos. Y, y nos teníamos fe, pero solo nos teníamos fe, nada más. Entonces hemos tenido que estudiar montones y hemos pedido ayuda a todo, a todo el mundo. Bancos centrales, desde el Banco Bingland, Reserva Federal, Banco de México... Banco de Colombia, Banco de Bra Central de Brasil, Banco Central de la República Argentina, en NCPI de India, que nos, dio, que nos ayudó montones, el Banco Mundial, o sea, todo el mundo como que fue maravilloso, maravilloso, la verdad, maravilloso, la ayuda que nos han prestado. ¿Para qué? Para que nosotros entráramos en tema y en función de todas las experiencias que nos compartió el mundo, nosotros tratar de adecuarla o, o más que nada aprender de los errores de otro, porque digamos, eh, y, 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 digamos y, no tra y tratar de no cometerlo nosotros para implantar eh, este, este sistema. ¿sí? Hoy les cuento, para, para cerrar, que la parte del sistema de pago rápido, persona a persona, hoy ya empezó a funcionar, ya es un hecho. En pocos meses, bueno, pero es así. Les agradezco, les ruego que me disculpen que acá todo el mundo habla inglés perfecto y yo me siento un poco disminuido porque mi inglés no es bueno. Y bueno, y si nos encontramos en otro momento, espero haber mejorado mi inglés. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you for uh, sharing the initiatives of the Central Bank of Uruguay with regard to enabling uh, financial inclusion, digital payments, and your efforts to move on on the, on the payment space. And I'm sure your partnerships with the National Payment Corporation of India will yield further results and will be able to, to ensure to create an example. And there are a lot of countries which can also learn from what Uruguay has done. So thank you for sharing the insights of Uruguay and um, with us. So before we conclude this session, as I had said, I will just uh, work back. I will start with Robert. Like one wish list that you have to make the DPI dream a reality. In short. Yeah. Um, these questions are hard because I think, well, should I ask for re all the resources of the world? But I think the one thing I would say is that um, if we could get global recognition that digital public infrastructure, much like any process of digital transformation, is a fundamentally human process. It's not just about the technology. It is a fundamentally human process. It's done for the benefit of people. It's done in people environments, very imperfect environments. It has all of these dependencies on the, our understanding of incentives, governance, and so on. So if we can Uh, you know, sometimes I think that the title is a bit technical, digital public infrastructure. We've had conversations about that. But it, we need to get people to understand this is about a human process at its heart. Thank you. Vajinti. 
So I'm working off of uh, more than 24 hours of no sleep. So it, 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 I'm, it, I was struggling to, to come up with something uh, specific, but um, I'll try. So I'm, my hope is that five years from now, when we are, we're no longer sitting in these stages talking about the possibility of DPI, but we have um, political will from the highest levels across a number of different countries who are sitting up here talking about all the benefits that have been realized from DPI. Thank you. Shivata? This is more of a bucket list than a wish list. There are five billion mobile phones in this world. Can we work with every major OEM like Apple, Android, Google, Samsung, and have an open interoperable identity payment stack pre-installed on these phones so that when that five billion hits eight billion, the open DPI dream becomes universal, truly global, touching every one of the 8 billion people on the planet. Thank you. Uh, Koshi? In addition to the two critical dimensions, be the technology and process re-engineering, there are two more very fundamental requirements and success for the success of any DPI or any projects, which is collaboration and cooperation. What's my wish? That we will be able to enhance this collaboration and cooperation in making this idea of DPI a success, which makes the foundation of this larger vision of the G20. Thank you, thank you. And uh, just to conclude, I will just say what's my wish list is that next year when we assemble for the Global DPI Summit 2024, we should have some countries other than the ones we've been talking on this forum to share what they have been able to do in the, in the one year. So uh, thank you and over to you, Chaitanya. Thank you very much, sir. Even I have one wish that next year even I'm there along with the summit. So uh, hosting it for all of you. Thank you very much. Let's have a round of applause for that panel, everyone. And before we conclude, of course, I'd like to request our moderator, Mr. Abhishek Singh, to present a memento and token of our gratitude to our chairperson, Mr. Walter Eduardo, the board advisor from Central Bank of Uruguay. Gracias. Our next. Uh, I'd like to request Mr. Abhishek Singh to present a memento to Mr. T. Koshi, MD and CEO of ONDC. <laughs> to Dr. Srivats Krishna, IAS from Government of Karnataka. <laughs> to Mr. Robert Opp. Chief Digital Officer, UNDP, USA. And to Ms. Vaijanti Desai, Practice Manager, World Bank. Thank you very much for sharing your expertise. May I request our chairperson, Mr. Eduardo, Mr. Walter Eduardo, to present a memento to our moderator, Mr. Abhishek Singh. Thank you to the entire panel. May I request you all to please pose for a group photograph before we conclude this final panel discussion. But may I request everyone to kindly be seated as we have the vote of thanks coming up. And to this panel, and for all the panels that happened in the last two days, all the speakers, everyone, let's have a collective round of applause, everybody. The loudest round of applause for everyone that came up on stage to share their insights, their expertise, and knowledge with all of us. And uh, before we have the vote of thanks, I would request uh, the team to share the QR code once again. If you scan that QR code, oh. you'll get access to all the pictures that have been clicked through the two days in, uh, in this event. So you'll just have to scan your face and you'll get all your pictures with that. And I'd also like to mention that, uh, that uh, as a follow-up, we signed the three MOUs with three countries, Armenia, Sierra Leone, and Suriname yesterday. And today, we have agreed to sign an MOU with, uh, with Antigua also, which will be done a little later in the evening. Huh? Okay. Honorable Minister is here, so we can... No.
All right, may I request everyone to kindly be seated. We have the signing of the MOU in a couple of minutes. We're waiting for the arrival of the Honorable Minister. Until then, let's have the vote of thanks. And then we'll sign the MOU uh, between Antigua and India. He's on his way here. So request you all to kindly be patient and be seated. Thank you. Chetani, Chetani, you may. Okay, I got the email from your The MOU between Antigua and India is being signed by Mr. Abhishek Singh, President and CEO of Ministry of Electronics and IT and the National e Governance Division, and Mr. Melford Walter Fitzgerald Nicholas. Minister of Information, Communication, Technologies, Utilities, and Energy. We started with a few historic signing of a few of the MOUs, and we're ending with another historic signing by both the Honorable Ministers. Let's have a round of applause, everybody, as the MOU is now signed between India and Antigua. Honorable Minister from Antigua, along with Mr. Abhishek Singh, President and CEO of NEGD and Mighty India. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And as all good things come to an end, we come towards the end of the two days of the Global DPI Summit. However, before we conclude, I'd like to request Mr. Prashant Mittal, Director, National E-Governance Division, to please propose the vote of thanks. Thank you, Chetan. It is my privilege to say that more than 250 people and our guest 
attended the global DPI summit in person, and many have watched over our live YouTube channel too. The expected audience which has attended the live channel is more than 2,000. We thank Honorable Minister Anil of Electronics and IT Skill Development Entrepreneurship, Sri Rajiv Chandrasekhar Ji, Honorable Minister in Charge, Pune, Maharashtra State, Mr. C.K. Patil Ji, Secretary Mighty and Chair of G20 Digital Economy Working Group, Sri Alkesh Kumar Ji, and President and CEO NEGD, Sri Abhishek Singh Ji. And I am also thankful to Joint Secretary in Charge, Mr. Sushil Pal, who has helped us in crafting this event. We thank Honorable Minister of nine countries who came here in person, namely Suriname, Republic of Armenia, Sierra Leone, Tanzania, Antigua and Barbuda, Kenya, Sri Lanka, Malawi, and Trinidad and Tobacco. My special thanks to Suriname, Republic of Armenia, Sierra Leone, and Antigua and Barbuda for signing the MOU on digital cooperation. We are thankful to Deputy Commissioner, Divisional Commissioner, District Administration, Maharashtra Police, uh, Commissioner PCM and PCMC hotel staff for making it happen wonderfully and comfortable event. We thank 250 delegates and participants who joined the event in person and summit. Around 2,000 people joined the summit virtually. We thank them too. I thank Ankar Chaitanya for supporting the session over the last two days, Duse who he, and Ms. Varnali who was here to support him uh, at the stage. We thank one and all for making the Global DPI Summit a grand success. It has indeed provided a global platform for discussing the most important digital initiative globally. We look forward to remain connected at the India Stack Global. The URL is https www.indiastack.global. Thank you once again. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Mittal, and thank you to each one of you for being such a lovely audience. We hope you enjoyed the last two days uh, of enriching and enlightening sessions as much as we enjoyed presenting them to you. Let's have a collective round of applause for all of you all who waited back till the very end. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm your host, Chaitan Irati, signing off. Thank you, and have a great evening ahead.